11. The Strayed Sheep Hello, Dr. de Grandin, Coroner Martin greeted as we entered the private office of his luxurious funeral home. There's been a young man from Morgan's photo news agency hanging around here, waiting for you for the last hour or so. Said you wanted him to take some pictures, but couldn't say what. It might be all right. Then again, it mightn't. And he may be on a snooping expedition. You never can tell with these fellows. So I told him to wait. He's back in the recreation room with my boys now, smoking his head off and cussing you out. The quick smile with which de Gronda answered was more a mechanical facial contortion than an evidence of mirth. Quite yes, he agreed. I greatly desire that you let us take some photographs of Mademoiselle L'Inconnu, the nameless lady whose body you took in charge at the convent this morning. We must discover her identity if possible. Is all prepared according to your promise? Professional pride was evident as Mr. Martin answered, Come and see her, if you will. She lay upon a bedstead in one of the secluded slumber rooms, apartments dedicated to repose of the dead awaiting casketing and burial. A soft silk comforter draped over her, her head upon a snowy pillow, and I had to look a second time to make sure it was she. With a skill which put the best of Egypt's famed practitioners to shame, the clever-handed mortician had eradicated every trace of violent death from the frail body of the girl, had totally obliterated the nail marks from her slender hands, and erased the cruel wounds of the barbed wire from her brow. Even the deeply burnt cross-brands on her cheeks had been effaced, and on her calm, smooth countenance there was a look of peace which simulated natural sleep. The lips, ingeniously tinted, were slightly parted, as though she breathed in light, half-waking slumber, and so perfect was the illusion of life that I could have sworn I saw her bosom flutter with faint respiration. Marvellous! Parfait! Magnifique! de Grandin pronounced, gazing admiringly at the body with the approval one artist may accord another's work. If you will now permit the young man to come hither, we shall take the pictures. Then we need trouble you no more. The young news photographer set up his camera at de Grandin's orders, taking several profile views of the dead girl. Finally he raised the instrument till its lens looked directly down upon the calm still face, and snapped a final picture. Next day the photographs were broadcast to the papers with the caption, Who knows her? Mystery woman, found wandering in the streets of Harrisonville, New Jersey, was taken to the psychopathic ward of City Hospital, but managed to escape. Next morning she was found dead from exposure in a garden in the suburbs. Authorities are seeking for some clue to her identity, and anyone who recognizes her is asked to notify Sergeant J. Costello, Detective Bureau, Harrisonville Police Department. Photo by Morgan's Photo News, Incorporated. We waited several days, but no response came in. It seemed that we had drawn a blank. At last, when we had about abandoned hope, the telephone called me from the dinner table, and Costello's heavy voice advised, There's a young filly down to headquarters, sir, that says he thinks he recognizes that there now unknown girl. Says he saw a picture in the Springfield Echo. Will I take him over to the coroner's? Might as well, I answered. Ask Mr. Martin to let him look at the body. Then, if he still thinks he knows her, bring him over, and Dr. de Grandin and I will talk with him. Right, sir, Costello promised. I'll not be bothering you with any false alarms. I went back to dessert, Renoir, and Jules de Grandin. Some three-quarters of an hour later, while we sipped our post-prandial coffee and liqueurs in the drawing-room, the doorbell shrilled and Nora ushered in Costello and a serious-faced young man. "'Shake hands with Mr. Kimball, gentlemen,' the sergeant introduced. "'He knows her all right. Identified her positively. He'll be claiming the remains in the morning if you've no objections.' De Grandin shook hands cordially enough, but his welcome was restrained— you can tell whence the poor young lady came, and what her name was, perhaps, monsieur, he asked, when the visitors had been made comfortable with cognac and cigars. Young Mr. Kimball flushed beneath the little Frenchman's direct, unwinking stare. He was tall, stoop-shouldered, hatchet-faced, bespectacled. 
Such animation as he had seemed concentrated in his rather large and deep-set hazel eyes. Except for them, he was utterly commonplace, a man of neutral coloring, totally undistinguished, doomed by his very nature to the self-effacement consequent upon unconquerable diffidence. A clerk or bookkeeper, I classified him mentally possibly a junior accountant or senior routine worker of some sort. Beside the debonair de Grandin, the fiery and intense Renoir, and the brawny, competent Costello, he was like a sparrow in the company of tanagers. Now, however, whatever remnant of emotion remained in his drab, repressed personality welled up, as he replied, Yes, sir, I could tell you. Her name was Abigail Kimball. She was my sister. Hmm, de Grandin murmured thoughtfully, drawing at his cigar. Then, as the other remained silent, You can suggest, perhaps, how it came she was found in the unfortunate condition which led to her incarceration in the hospital, and later to her so deplorable demise. Beneath the shadow of his brows he watched the young man with a cat stare of unwinking vigilance. "'alert to note the slightest sign betokening "'that the visitor had greater knowledge of the case "'than the meager information in the newspaper supplied. "'Young Kimball shook his head. "'I'm afraid not,' he replied. "'I hadn't seen her for two years. "'Didn't have the slightest idea where she was.' "'He paused for a moment, fumbling nervously with his cigar. "'Then, whatever I may say will be regarded confidentially?' he asked. But certainly, de Grandin answered. The young man tossed his cigar into the fire and leaned forward, elbows on knees, fingers interlaced. She was my sister, he repeated huskily. We were born and reared in Springfield. Our father was... He paused again and hunted for a word, then... A tyrant, a good church member, and according to his lights a Christian so righteous that he couldn't be religious, so pious that he couldn't find it in him to be kind or merciful. You know the breed. We weren't allowed to play cards or dance or even go to parties. He was afraid we might play kissing games. We had family prayers each night and morning, and on Sunday weren't allowed to play. My sister's dolls and my toys were put away each Saturday and not allowed outside the closet till Monday morning. Once, when he caught me reading Moby Dick... I was a lad of fifteen, too, then. He snatched it from me and threw it in the fire. He'd tolerate no novel reading in a Christian home, he told me. I stood for it. I reckon it was in me from my Puritan ancestors. But Abigail was different. Our grandfather had married an Irish girl, worked her to death and broke her heart with pious devilishness before she was twenty-five. And Abigail took after her. Looked like her, too, they said. Father used to pray with her. Pray that she'd be able to tear the sinful image of the scarlet woman from her heart and give herself to Jesus. Then he'd beat her for her soul's salvation, praying all the time. A bitter smile lit up his somber features, and something, some deep-rooted though almost eradicated spirit of revolt, flickered in his eyes a moment. You can imagine what effect such treatment will have on a high-spirited girl, he added. When Abby was seventeen, she ran away. My father cursed her, literally, stood in the doorway of our home and raised his hands to heaven while he called God's curse upon a willful, disobedient child. Again the bitter, twisted smile flickered across his face. I think his God heard him, he concluded. But, monsieur, are we to understand you did not again behold your so unfortunate sister until— De Grandin paused with upraised brows. Oh, yes, I saw her, the young man answered caustically. She ran away, as I said, but in her case the road of the transgressor was hard. She'd been brought up to call a leg a limb and to think the doctors brought babies in their satchels. She learned the truth before a year had gone. I got a note from her one day telling me she was at a farmhouse outside town and she was expecting a baby. I was working then and making fairly good money for a youngster, keeping books in a hardware store but my father took my wages every Saturday night, and I was allowed only a dollar a week from them. I had to put that on the collection plate on Sunday. When Abby's letter came, I was almost frantic. I hadn't a nickel I could use. 
and if I went to my father, he would quote something from the Bible about the wages of sin being death, I knew. But if you're driven far enough, you can usually manage to make plans. I did. I deliberately quit my job at Herschler's, picked a fight with the head bookkeeper, and made him discharge me. Then I told my father, and though I was almost twenty-one years old, he beat me till I thought I'd drop beneath the torture, but it was all part of my plan, so I gritted my teeth and bore it. I got the promise of another job before I quit the first one, so I went to work at the new place immediately. But I fooled the old man. My new salary was twenty dollars a week, twice as much as I'd received before. But I told him I had to take a cut in pay, and that they gave me only ten. I steamed the pay envelope open and took out ten dollars, then resealed it and handed it to him with the remaining ten each Saturday. He never knew the difference. As quickly as I could, I went to see my sister, told her not to worry, and engaged a doctor. I paid him forty dollars on account and signed notes for the balance. Everything was fixed for Abigail to have the proper care. He was a pretty little fella, a baby, pretty and sweet and innocent as though he hadn't been a... He halted, gagging on the ugly word, then ended lamely, as if his mother had been married. Living was cheaper in those days, and Abby and the baby made out nicely at the farm for most two years. I'd had two raises in pay, and turned the increase over to her, and she managed to pick up some spare change at odd work, too. So everything went pretty well. He stopped again, and the knuckles of his knitted hands showed white and bony, as the fingers laced together with increased pressure. Yes, my friend, until, de Grandin prompted softly. Till she was taken sick, young Kimball finished. It was influenza. We'd been pretty hard hit up Springfield Way that spring, and Abigail was taken pretty bad. Pneumonia developed, and the doctor didn't hold out much hope to her. A conscience was troubling her for running out on the old man, and on account of the baby, too, I guess. Anyhow, she asked to see a minister. He was a young man, just out of the Methodist seminary, with a mouth full of scriptural quotations, and a nose that itched to get in other people's business. When she'd confessed her sin, he prayed with her a while, then came hotfoot to the city and spilled the story to my father, told him Erring was human but forgiveness divine, and that he had a chance to bring the lost sheep back into the fold. Typical preachers can't, you know. I was of age then, but still living home. The old man came to me and taxed me with my perfidy in helping Abby in her life of shameful sin, and what was worse, holding back some of my salary from him. Then he began to pray, likening himself to Abraham and me to Isaac, and asking God to give strength to his arm that he might purge me of all sin and tried to thrash me. I said tried, gentlemen. The hardware store I worked in had carried a line of buggy whips, but the coming of the motor car had made them a back number. We hadn't had a call for one in years, and several of the men had brought the old things home as souvenirs. I had one. My father hit me, striking me in the mouth with his clenched fist and bruising my lips till they bled. Then I let him have it. All the abuse I'd suffered from that sanctimonious old devil since my birth seemed crying out for redress right then, and by God I got it. I lashed him with that whip till it broke in my hands. Then I beat him with the stock till he cried for mercy. When I say cried, I mean just that. He howled and bellowed like a beaten boy, and the tears ran down his face as he begged me to stop flogging him. Then I left his house and never entered it again not even when they held his funeral from it. But that didn't help my sister. The old man knew where she was living, and as soon as his bruises were healed, he went out there, saw the landlady, and told her he was the baby's grandfather and had come to take it home. My sister was too sick to be consulted, so the woman let him take the boy. He took him to an orphanage, and the child died within a month. Diphtheria immunization costs money, and the folks who ran that home... It was proof of a lack of faith in Providence to vaccinate the children for diphtheria, they said. But when you heard two hundred children in a place and one of them comes down with the disease, there's bound to be some duplication. Little Arthur died, and they were going to bury him in Potter's Field. But I heard of it and claimed the body and gave it decent burial. My sister lay halfway between life and death for weeks. Finally she was well enough to ask for her son, and they told her he had gone off with his grandfather— 
She was almost wild with fear of what the old man might do to the child, but still too weak to travel, and the nervous strain she laboured under set her back still further. It was nearly midsummer when she finally went to town. She went right to the house and demanded that he give her back her child, told him she'd never asked him for a cent and never would, and every penny that he'd paid out for the little boy would be refunded to him. He'd learned his lesson from me, but my sister was a mere woman, weak from a recent illness, no need to guard his tongue while he talked with her. And so he called her every vile name imaginable, and that her hope of heaven was gone, for she was living with a parent's curse upon her. Finally he told her that her child was dead and buried in a pauper's grave. He knew that was a lie, but he couldn't forego the joy of hurting her by it. She came to me, half crazed with grief, and I did what I could to soothe her. I told her that the old man lied and knew he lied, and that little Arthur had been buried in Graceland with a tombstone set above his grave. Then, of course, she wanted to go see the place. Tears were falling from the young man's eyes as he concluded. I never shall forget that afternoon, the last time that I ever saw my little sister living. It was nearly dark when we reached the grave, and she had to kneel to make out the inscription on the stone. Then she went down like a mother bending by a crib, and whispered to the grass above a baby's face, Good night, little son. Good night and happy dreams. I'll see you early in the morning. Then realization seemed to come to her. Oh, God, she cried. There won't be any morning. Oh, my baby, my little baby boy. They took you from me and killed you, little son, they and their God. And then beside her baby's grave she rose and held her hands up to the sky and cursed the father who begot her and who had done this thing to her. She cursed his church and his religion, cursed his God and all his works, and swore allegiance to the devil. I'm not a religious man, gentlemen, I had too big an overdose of it when I was a child, and I've never been in church since I left my father's house. But that wild defiance of hers and her oath of fealty to everything we'd been taught to hate and fear fairly gave me the creeps. I never saw her from that night to this. I gave her a hundred dollars, and she took the evening train to Boston, where I understand she got mixed up with all sorts of radical movements. The last I heard of her before I saw a picture in the paper yesterday was when she wrote me from New York saying she'd met a Russian gentleman who was preaching a new religion, one she could subscribe to and accept. I didn't quite understand what it was all about, but I gathered it was some sort of new thought cult or something of the kind. Anyway, do what thou wilt, this shall be the whole of the law, was its gospel, as she wrote it to me. De Grandin leaned forward his little round blue eyes alight with interest and excitement. "'Have you by any chance a picture of your little nephew, monsieur?' he asked. "'Why, yes, I think so,' young Kimball answered. "'Here's a snapshot I took of him and Abigail out at the farm the winter before her illness. He was about eight or nine months old then.' From an inner pocket he drew a leather wallet and from it took a worn and faded photograph. "'More blue, I damn knew it.' Of course, that is the explanation, de Grandin cried as he looked at the picture. Await me, my friends, I shall return at once, he shouted, leaping from his seat and rushing from the room. In a moment he was back, another picture in his hand. Compare, he ordered sharply. Put them together and tell me what it is you see. Mystified but eager, Renoir, Costello, and young Kimball leaned over my shoulder as I laid the photographs side by side upon the coffee table. The picture to the right was the one Kimball furnished us. It showed a woman, younger than the one we knew, and with the light of happiness upon her face, but indisputably the beautiful veiled lady whose tragic death had followed her visit to us. In her arms nestled a pretty, dimpled little boy with dark curling hair clustering in tendrils around his baby ears, and eyes which fairly shone with life and merriment. The picture to the left was the one de Gronda had obtained from the Baptist home of the little Eastman boy who vanished. Though slightly younger, his resemblance to the other child was startling. Line for line and feature for feature, each was almost the perfect duplicate of the other. De Grandin tweaked his moustache as he returned the snapshot to young Kimball. "'Thank you, monsieur,' he said. "'Your story has affected us profoundly. 
Tomorrow, if you will make formal claim to your sister's body, no obstacle to its release will be offered by the coroner, I promise you. Behind the visitor's back he made violent motions to Costello, indicative to our wish to be alone. The Irishman was quick to take the hint, and in a few minutes had departed with young Mr. Kimball. Half an hour later he rejoined us, a frown of deep perplexity upon his brow. "'I'll bite, Dr. de Grandin, sir,' he confessed. "'What's it all about?' Twelve, THE TRAIL OF THE SERPENT "'But it is obvious,' the little Frenchman answered. "'Do you not see it, Renoir? Trowbridge?' He turned his bright bird-like gaze on us. "'I'm afraid not,' I replied. "'Just what connection there is between the children's resemblance and—' "'Ah, bah!' he interrupted. "'It is elementary. Consider, if you please. "'This poor Mademoiselle Abigail, she was hopelessly involved with the Satanists. "'Is it not so?' "'Yes,' I agreed. "'From what her brother told us, there's not much doubt that the sect with which she was connected "'is the same one Renoir told us about. "'But, but, be roasted on the gates of hell!' Can you think no farther back than the hinder side of your own neck, great stupid one? What did she say when she came rushing to this house at dead of night and begged us for protection? Think, remember, if you can. Why, she was raving incoherently. It's rather hard to say that anything she told us was important, but... Dit! More of your sacre butts! Attend me. She came to us immediately after the small Baptist one had been abducted, and she did declare he was the image of my dear little. Her statement split upon that word, but in the light of what we now know the rest is obvious. The little Eastman child resembled her dead baby. She could not bear to see him slaughtered, and cried out in horror at the act. When they persisted in this fiendishness, she threatened them with us, with me to be exact and ran away to tell us how they might be found. They shot at her and wounded her, but she won through to us, and though she raved in wild delirium, she told enough to put us on the trail. But certainly did she not say, Watch for the chalk signs of the devil, follow the pointed trident, but yes. He turned to Sergeant Costello and demanded, And have your men been vigilant, mon vieux? Do they keep watch for childish scrolls on house or fence or sidewalk as I bad? Costello eyed him wonderingly. Sure they are, he answered. The whole force has its orders to look out for em, though saints know what you're after wanting with em when you find em. Very good, de Grandin nodded. Attend me, I have known such things before. You too, Renoir. Only a word was needed to put me on the trail. That word was furnished by the poor young woman whom they crucified. In Europe, when the Satanists would gather for their wicked rites, they would send some secret message to their members. But never do they tell the place of the meeting. No, the message might be intercepted and the police come. What then? Upon the walls of houses, on sidewalks or on fences, they draw a crude design of Satan. A foolish, childish thing which will escape notice as scrawling of naughty little boys. But each of these drawings differs from the others, for whereas one will have the devil's pitchfork pointing one way, another will point in a different direction. The variation will not be noticed by one who does not know the significance of the scrolls, but to those who know for what they look, the pointing tridents are plain as markers on a motor highway. One need but follow the direction of the pointing tridents from picture to picture in order to be finally led right to the door of Satan's temple. Yes, of course it is so. Indubitably, Renoir accorded with a vehement nod. But what's the little Eastman boy to do with it? Costello asked. Everything, parbleu! De Grandin and Renoir replied in sober chorus. It was undoubtlessly for the Black Mass, the Mass of Saint-Sicaire, the little one was stolen. Satan is the Sage de Dieu, the impudent imitator of God, and in his service is performed a vile parody of the celebration of the Mass. The celebrant is, when possible, an unfrocked priest, but if such a one cannot be found to do the office, any follower of the devil may serve. In the latter case, a wafer, already consecrated, 
must be stolen from the monstrance of the church, or impiously borne from communion in the mouth of a mock communicant. Then, robed as a priest, the buffoon who officiates ascends the devil's altar, and mouths the words prescribed in the missal, but reverses all the ritual gestures, kneeling backward to the altar, signing himself with the cross upside down, and with his left hand reciting such prayers as he pleases backward. At the end he holds aloft the sacred host, but instead of veneration, the wretched congregation shrieks out insults, and the elements are then thrown to the ground and trampled underfoot. <laughs> but if a renegade priest can be persuaded to officiate, there is the foulest blasphemy of all, for he still has the words of power and the right to consecrate the elements. And so he says the Mass from start to finish. For greater blasphemy, the altar is the naked body of a woman and when the rubric compels the celebrant to kiss the sanctuary, his lips are pressed against the human faircloth. The holy bread is consecrated, likewise the wine, but with the wine there is mingled the life-blood of a little unbaptized baby boy. The celebrant, the deacon and subdeacon partake of this unholy drink, then share it with the congregation, and also they accept the wafer, but instead of swallowing it in reverence, they spit it forth with grimaces of disgust and every foul insult. You apprehend? The Mass of saint Secœur was duly celebrated on the night poor Mademoiselle Abigail came knocking at our door, and the little Eastman boy had been the victim. You noticed that she wore no clothing save her outdoor wraps. Was that mere eccentricity? No, parbleu, it was evidence, no less. Evidence that she quit the nest of devils as she was, and came forthwith to us with information which should lead to their undoing. She had undoubtedly served as altar cloth that night, my friends, and did not tarry for an instant when she fled, not even long enough to clothe herself. The little victim of that night so much resembled her dead babe that the frozen heart within her was softened all at once, and she became once more a woman with woman's tender pity instead of the cold instrument of evil which her pious devil of a father had made her. Certainly, the strayed sheep had come back into the fold. He tore the end from a blue packet of French cigarettes, set one of the vile-smelling things in his eight-inch amber holder, and thoughtfully ignited it. Renoir, mon vieux, he said, I have thought deeply on what you told us. I was reluctant at the first to credit what the evidence disclosed. But now I am convinced. When the small Eastman boy was stolen, I could not fit the rough joints of the puzzle to each other. Consider. He spread his fingers fanwise and checked the items off on them. Mademoiselle Alice disappears, and I find evidence that Bulalaguay was used. What are the meaning of this, I ask me? This snuff of sleep... He is much used by savage Africans. But why should he be here? It are a puzzle. Next we find proof that Mademoiselle Alice is the lineal descendant, presumably the last one, of that devil's priest of olden days whose daughter married David Hume. We also see that a spy of the Yazidis has proved her identity to his own satisfaction before she is abducted. The puzzle is more mystifying. Then we do find poor Madame Hume, all dead. The outward evidence says suicide, but I find the hidden proof of murder. Murder by the rumal of the thugs of India. Que diable! The thugs are worshippers of Kali, the black goddess who is a sort of female devil, a disreputable half-sister of the evil one, and in her honour they commit all sorts of murders. But what, I ask to know, are they doing here? Already we have Yazidis of Kurdistan, witch doctors from Central Africa, now thugs from India injected in this single case. Mon Dieu, I suffer mal de tête from thinking. But nowhere can I find one grain of logic in it. No, not anywhere, Cordieu. Anon the little Eastman baby disappears. He is a Baptist, therefore unbaptized. Time was, I know, when such as he were wanted for the mass of wickedness. But how can he be wanted by the Yazidis? They have no dealings with the mass of saint Secaire. The aping of a Christian rite is not a part of their dark ceremonies. Yet, here we have Bulalaguay again, and Bulalaguay was also used when the Yazidis, presumably, stole Mademoiselle Alice from before our very eyes. Have the Yazidis, 
whose cult is rooted in obscure antiquity and dates back far beyond the Christian era, combined the rites of medieval Satanists, I ask. It are not likely yet what is one to think. Then comes this poor young woman, and in her delirium lets fall some words which, in the light of what we know tonight, most definitely connect to the stolen baby, the baby stolen even as Mademoiselle Alice was, with the sacrifice of the Mass of saint Seker. Now I think of you and what you tell us, how you have found unfortunate young women, all branded on the breast like Mademoiselle Abigail, all of them once members of the sect of Satanists, each chapter of which unclean cult is led or inspired by one from Russia. And you tell us of this league of godlessness, which is a poisonous fungus spreading through the world from that cellar of unclean abominations we call Russia. Pains of a most dyspeptic bullfrog, I inform me. I see a little, so small, light. And by that light I read the answer to my riddle. It is this. As businessmen may take a dozen old and bankrupt enterprises, possessed of nothing but old and well-known names, and weld them into one big and modern corporation which functions under a new management, so have these foes of all religion seized on the little, so weak remnants of diabolism, and welded them together in a formidable whole. In Africa, you say, the cannibal leopard men are on the rampage. The emissaries of Moscow are working with them. Have they not brought back the secret of Bulalaguay to aid them in their work? In Kurdistan, the Yazidis, an obscure sect, scarce able to maintain itself because it is ringed round by Muslims, is suddenly revived, shows new activity. Russia, which prays the world for charity to feed its starving people, can always find capital to stimulate its machinations in other lands. The Arabian gendarmerie find European pilgrims en route to Mount Lalesh, the stronghold of the Yezidis. Such things were never known before, but... Ah, another link in this so odious chain, I tell me. In Europe and in America, the cult of Satanism, almost dead as witchcraft, is suddenly revived in all its awful detail. That it is growing rapidly is proved by the number of renegade clergymen of all faiths, a number never paralleled before in such short time. From all sides comes evidence of its activities. From London, Paris, and Berlin we hear of violated churches. Little children, always boys, are stolen in increasing numbers and are not held to ransom. They merely disappear. The connection is most obvious. Now we have proof that this vile cult is active in America, right here in Harrisonville, Pableau. My friends, upon the crumbling ruins of the ancient Yezidi religion and the time-obliterated relics of witchcraft and demonism of the Middle Ages, this union of the godless are rearing a monstrous structure designed to crush out all religion with its weight. The trail of the serpent lies across the earth. Already his folds are tightening round the world. We must annihilate him, or he will surely strangle us. Yes, certainly. But Alice, I began, what connection has she with all this? Much, all, everything, he cut in sharply. Do you not recall what the secret agents of France have said, that in the East there is talk of a white prophetess who shall raise the devil's standard and lead his followers on to victory against the crescent and the cross? That prophetess is Alice Hume, consolidated with the demonology of the West. The devil worship of the East will take new force. She has been sought. She has been found, Cordier. And anon, she will be taken to some place appointed for her marriage to the devil. Then, with the fanaticism of the Yazidis, and the fervor of the atheistic converts as a motivating force, with the promise of the devil's own begotten son to come eventually as a result of this marriage, with the gold of Soviet Russia, and the contributions of wealthy ones who revel in the freedom to do wickedness this new religion gives— they will advance in open warfare. The time to act is now. If we can rescue Mademoiselle Alice and exterminate the leaders of this movement, we may succeed in stemming the tide of hell's rebellion. Failing that... He spread his hands and raised his shoulders in a shrug of resignation. All right, I countered. How do we go about it? 
Alice has been gone two weeks, ten days to be exact, and we haven't the slightest clue to her location. She may be here in Harrisonville. She may be gone to Kurdistan, for all we know. Why aren't we looking for her? He gazed at me a moment, then... I do not lance an abscess till conditions warrant it, he answered. Neither do we vent our efforts fruitlessly in this case. Mademoiselle Alice is the focal point of all these vile activities. Where she is, there are the leaders of the Satanists, and where they are, there is she. From what Mademoiselle Abigail told us, we may assume there will be other celebrations of the mass of wickedness. When we find one of these, and raid it, our chances of finding Alice are most excellent. Costello's men are on the lookout. They will inform us when the signs are out. Until that time we jeopardize our chances of success by any move we make. I feel, I know, the enemy is concentrated here. But if we go to search for him, he will decamp. And instead of the city which we know so well, we shall have to look for him only God knows where. Alors, our best activity is inactivity. But, I persisted, what makes you think they're still in the city? Common sense would have warned them to get out before this, you'd think, and... No, you mistake, he told me bluntly. The safest hiding place is here. Here they logically should not be. Hence, this is the last place in which we should be thought to look for them. Again, temporarily at least, this is their headquarters in America. To carry out such schemes as they plan requires money, and much money can be had from converts to their cult. Wealthy men, who might fear to follow nothing but the dictates of their unconscionable consciences, will be attracted by the freedom which their creed permits, and will join them willingly, and willingly contribute to their treasury. It is in hope of further converts that they linger here, as well as to await the blowing over of the search for Alice. When the hue and cry has somewhat abated, when some later outrage claims the public interest, they can slip out all unnoticed. Until that time they are far safer in the shadows of police headquarters than if they took too hasty flight, and— Bring! The telephone's sharp warning shut him off. Costello? Yes, just a moment, I answered, passing the instrument to the sergeant. Yeah, sure. Huh? Glory be to God, Costello said, responding to the message from across the wire. To us? Come on, gentlemen. It's time to get our feet against the pavement he admonished. Two hours ago, some murdering hoodlums beat up a nursemaid wheeling a baby home from a visit with its grandmother and run off with it, and the boys have found the chalk marks on the sidewalks. It looks, non d'un chou-fleur, it looks like action, de Grandin cried exultantly. Come, friend Trowbridge, come, my Renoir, let us go at once, right away, immediately. Renoir and he hurried up the stairs while I went to the garage for the car. Two minutes later they joined us, each with a pair of pistols belted to his waist. In addition to the firearms, de Grandin wore a long curve-bladed Gurkha knife, a wicked razor-bladed weapon capable of lopping off a hand as easily as a carving knife takes off the wing of a roast fowl. Costello was fuming with impatience. Step on it, Dr. Trowbridge, sir, he ordered. The first pitcher was at 28th and Hopkins Streets, if you'll take us there, we'll be after following the trail I've telephoned to have a raiding party meet us there in fifteen minutes. But it is grand. It is immense. It is magnificent, my friends, de Grandin told Renoir as we slipped through the darkened streets. It is superb, Renoir assured de Grandin. Bedad, here's where Ireland declares war on Kurdistan, Costello told them both. 13. Inside the Lines A large, black, and very shiny limousine was parked at the curb near the intersection of 28th and Hopkins Streets, and toward it Costello led the way when we halted at the corner. The vehicle had all the earmarks of hailing from some high-class mortician's garage, and this impression was heightened by a bronze plate displayed behind the windshield with the legend Funeral Car in neat block letters. But there was nothing funereal, except perhaps potentially, about the eight passengers occupying the tonneau. 
I recognized officers Hornsby, Gilligan, and Schultz, each with a canvas web belt decorated with a service revolver and nightstick buckled outside his blouse, and with a vicious-looking submachine gun resting across his knees. Five others, similarly belted but equipped with fire axes, boat hooks, and slings of tear bombs, huddled out of sight of casual passers-by on the seats of the car. Camouflage, Costello told us with a grin, pointing to the funeral sign. Then, All set, Hornsby. Got everything. Axes, hooks, tear bombs, and— All Jake got the works, the other interrupted. Where's the party? The sergeant beckoned the patrolman, loitering at the corner. Where is it? he demanded. Right here, sir, the man returned, pointing to a childish scrawl on the cement sidewalk. We examined it by the light of the street lamp. Unless warned of its sinister connotation, no one would have given the drawing a second glance. So obviously was it the mark of mischievous, but not exceptionally talented, children. A crudely sketched figure with pot-belly, triangular head, and stiffly jointed limbs was outlined on the sidewalk, in white chalk of the sort every schoolboy pilfers from the classroom. Only a pair of parentheses sprouting from the temples and a pointed beard and moustache indicated the faintest resemblance to the popular conception of the devil, and the implement the creature held in its unskillfully drawn hand might have been anything from a fishing pole to a pitchfork. Nevertheless, there was one fact which struck us all. Instead of brandishing the weapon overhead, the figure pointed it definitely toward Twenty-Ninth Street. De Grandin's slender nostrils twitched like those of a hunting dog scenting the quarry as he bent above the drawing. "'We have the trail before us,' he whispered. "'Come, let us follow it. Allons. "'Come on, you guys. Follow us. But don't come too close unless we signal.' Costello ordered the men waiting in the limousine. Down Hopkins Street, shabby down-at-the-heel thoroughfare that it was, we walked with all the appearance of nonchalance we could master— paused at Twenty-Ninth Street and looked about. No second guiding figure met our eye. Dame, de Grandin swore. C'est singulier. Can we have... Ah, regardez-vous, mes amis. The tiny fountain pen searchlight he had swung in an ever-widening circle had picked out a second figure, scarcely four inches high, scribbled on the red brick front of a vacant house. The trident in the demon's hand directed us down Twenty-Ninth Street toward the river. A moment only we stopped to study it, and all of us were impressed at once with one outstanding fact. Crudely drawn as it was, the second picture was a duplicate in miniature of the first. The same technique, if such a word could be applied to such a scrawl, was evident in every wavering line and faulty curve of the small picture. More bleu, de Grandin murmured. He was used to making these, the one who laid this trail. This is no first attempt. Mais non. Renoir agreed. Looks that way, I acquiesced. Sure, said Costello. Let's get going. Block after block we followed the little sprawling figures of the devil scrawled on sidewalk, wall, or fence, and always the pointing tridents led us toward the poorer, unkempt sections of the city. At length, when we had left all residential buildings and entered a neighborhood of run-down factories and storehouses, de Grandin raised his hand to indicate a halt. We would better wait our reinforcements, he cautioned. There is too great an opportunity for an ambuscade in this deserted quarter, and— Ah, par la barbe d'un poisson rouge, he cried. We are in time, I think. Observe him, if you please. Fifty or a hundred yards beyond us, a figure moved furtively. He was a shadow of a man, sliding noiselessly and without undue movement— though with surprising speed, through the little patch of luminance cast by a flickering gas street lamp. Also he seemed supremely alert, perceptive and receptive with the sensitiveness of a wild animal of the jungle stalking wary prey. The slightest movement of another in the semi-darkness near him would have needed to be more shadow-silent than his own to escape him. This, remarked Renoir, will bear investigating. Let me do it, my Jules. I am accustomed to this sort of hunting. With less noise than a swimmer dropping into a darkened stream, he disappeared in the shadow of a black-walled warehouse, to emerge a moment later halfway down the block where a street lamp stained the darkness with its feeble light.
Then he melted into the shadow once again. We followed, silently as possible, lessening the distance between Renoir and ourselves as quickly as we could, but making every effort at concealment. Renoir and the Shadow Man came together at the dead end of a cross street, where the off-stained waters of the river lapped the rotting piles. Hands up, my friend, Renoir commanded, emerging from the darkness behind his quarry with the suddenness of a magic lantern view thrown on a screen. I have you under cover. If you move, your prayers had best be said. He advanced a pace, pressing the muzzle of his heavy pistol almost into the other's neck, and reached forward with his free hand to feel, with a trained policeman's skill, for hidden weapons. The result was surprising, though not especially pleasing. Like an inflated ball bounced against the floor, Renoir rose in the air, flew over the other's shoulder, and landed with a groan of suddenly expelled breath against the cobblestones, flat on his back. More, the man whose skill at jiu-jitsu accomplished his defeat, straightened like a coiled steel spring suddenly released, drew an impressively large automatic pistol and aimed it at the supine Frenchman. "'Say your prayers if you know any, you,' he began, but Costello intervened. Lithe and agile as a tiger, for all his ponderous bulk, the Irishman cleared the space between them with a single leap and swung his club in a devastating arc. The man sagged at the knees and sank face forward to the street, his pistol sliding from his unnerved hand and lying harmless in the dust beside him. That's that, remarked the sergeant. Now let's have a look at this felly. He was a big man, more lightly built, but quite as tall as the doughty Costello, and as the latter turned him over, we saw that though his hair was iron grey, his face was young and deeply tanned. A tiny dark moustache of the kind made popular by Charlie Chaplin and British subalterns during the war adorned his upper lip. His clothes were well cut and of good material, his boots neatly polished, and his hands, one of which was ungloved, well cared for. Obviously a person with substantial claims to gentility, though probably one lacking in the virtue of good citizenship, I thought. Costello bent to loose the buttons of the man's dark overcoat, but de Grandin interposed a quick objection. Mais non, mon sergent, he reproved. Our time is short. Place manacles upon his hands and give him into custody. We can attend to him at leisure. At present we have more important pots upon the fire. Right you are, sir, the Irishman agreed with a grin, locking a pair of handcuffs on the stunned man's wrists. He raised his hand in signal, and as the limousine slid noiselessly alongside— Keep an eye on this bird, Hornsby, he ordered. We'll be wanting to give him the works at headquarters, after we get through with this job, you understand. Officer Hornsby nodded assent, and we returned to our queer game of hare and hounds. It might have been a half hour later when we came to our goal. It was a mean building in a mean street. The upper floors were obviously designed for manufacturing, for half a dozen signs proclaimed that desirable lofts might be rented from as many agents. Alterations made to suit tenant for a term of years. The ground floor had once been occupied by an emporium dispensing spirituous malt and vinous liquors, and that the late management had regarded the law of the land with more optimism than respect was evident from the impressive padlock on the door— and the bold announcement that the place was closed by order of U.S. District Court. Beside the door of what had been the family entrance in days gone by was a sketch of Satan, his trident pointing upward, the first of the long series of guiding sketches to hold the spear in such position. Undoubtedly the meeting place was somewhere in the upper portion of the empty-seeming building, but when we sought an entrance— Every door was closed and firmly barred. All, indeed, were furnished with stout locks on the outside. The evidence of vacancy was plain and not to be disputed, whatever the satanic scrawl might otherwise imply. "'Looks like we're up again a blank wall, sir,' Costello told de Grandin. "'This place is empty as a bass drum. Probably ain't had a tenant since the Prohibition men got sore, cause someone cut off their protection money and slapped a padlock on the joint. De Grandin shook his head in positive negation. The more it seems deserted, 
the more I am convinced we have arrived at the right place, he answered. These locks, do they look old? Hmm, the sergeant played his searchlight on the nearest lock and scratched his head reflectively. No, sir, I can't say they do, he admitted. If they'd been here for a year, and the joint's been shut almost that long, they ought to show more weather strain. But what's that got to do with... Ah, bah, de Grandin interrupted. To be slow of perception is the policeman's prerogative, but you abuse the privilege, my friend. What better means of camouflage than this could they desire? The old locks are removed and new ones substituted. Each person who is bidden to the rendezvous is furnished with a key. He follows where the pointing spears of Satan lead, opens the lock and enters. Voilà tout. Voila me I, the Irishman objected. Who's going to lock up after him, if— A sudden scuffle in the dark, a half-uttered, half-suppressed cry, and the sound of flesh colliding violently with flesh cut him off. Here's a bird I found laying low across the street, sir, Officer Hornsby reported, emerging from the darkness which surrounded us, forcing an undersized individual before him. One of his hands was firmly twisted in the prisoner's collar. The other was clamped across his mouth preventing outcry. I left the gang in the car up by the entrance to the alley, he continued, and come gumshoeing down to see if I was needed, and this gink must have seen me buttons, for he made a pass at me and missed, then started to let out a squawk, but I choked him off. Looks like he was planted as a lookout for the gang, and— Huh? de Grandin interrupted. I think the answer to your question is here, my sergeant. To Hornsby. You say that he attempted an assault— I'll tell the cockeyed world, the officer replied. Here's what he tried to ease into me. From beneath his blouse he drew a short, curve-bladed dagger some eight inches in length, its wicked, keen-edged blade terminating in a vicious vulture's beak hook. I'd have made a handsome-looking corpse with that between me ribs, he added grimly. De Grandin gazed upon the weapon, then the captive. The dagger is from Kurdistan, he declared. This one, he turned his back contemptuously on the prisoner. I think that he is Russian, a renegade Hebrew from the Black Sea country. I know his kind, willing to sell his ancient honorable birthright and the god of his fathers for political preferment. What further did he do, if anything? Well, sir, he kind of overreached himself when he drove at me with the knife. I reckon I must have seen it coming, or felt it kinder. Anyhow, he missed me— and I cracked him on the wrist with me nightstick, and he dropped his sticker and started to yell. Not on account of the pain, sir. It weren't that sort of yell, but more as if he was trying to give the tip off to his pals. Then I claps my hand across his trap and lets him have me knuckles. He flings something, looked like a bunch of keys as near as I could make out, away, and, well, here we are, sir. What'll I do with him, sergeant? He turned inquiringly to Costello. Put the jewelry on him and slap him in the wagon with the other guy, the sergeant answered. I gotcha, Hornsby replied, saluting and twisting his hand more tightly in the prisoner's collar. Come on, bozo. He shook the captive by way of emphasis. You and me's going bye-bye. And now, my sergeant, for the strategy, de Grandin announced. Renoir, friend Trowbridge, and I shall go ahead. Too many entering at once would surely advertise our coming. The doors are locked, and that one threw away the keys. He had been well instructed. To search for them would take up too much time, and time is what we cannot well afford to waste. Therefore you will await us here, and when I blow my whistle you will raid the place. And, oh, my friend, do not delay your coming when I signal. Upon your speed may rest a little life, you understand. Perfectly, sir. Costello answered. But how are you going to crack the crib? Get in the joint, I mean. De Grandin grinned his elfish grin. Is it not beautiful? He asked, drawing something from the inside pocket of his sheepskin reefer. It was a long instrument of tempered steel, flattened at one end to a thin but exceedingly tough blade. The Irishman took it in his hand and swung it to and fro, testing its weight and balance. Bedad, Dr. de Grandin, sir, he said admiringly. What an elegant burglar was spoilt when you decided to go straight. 
De Grandam motioned to Renoir and me, and crept along the base of the house wall. Arrived at a soiled window, he inserted the thin edge of his burglar tool between the upper and lower casings, and probed and twisted it experimentally. The window had been latched, but a little play had been left between the sashes. Still, it took us but a moment to determine that the casings, though loose, were securely fastened. Allons, de Grandam murmured, and we crept to another window. This, too, defied his efforts, as did the next two which we tested. But success awaited us at our fifth trial. Persistence was rewarded, and the questing blade probed and pushed with gentle persuasion, till the rusty latch snapped back and we were able to push up the sash. Inside the storehouse all was darker than a cellar, but by the darting ray of de Grandin's flashlight we finally descried a flight of dusty stairs spiraling upward to a lightless void. We crept up these, found ourselves in a wide and totally empty loft, then, after casting about for a moment, found a second flight of stairs and proceeded to mount them. "'The trail is warm. Pardieu, it is hot,' he murmured. "'Come, my friends, forward, and for your lives, no noise.' The stairway terminated in a little walled-off space, once used as a business office by the manufactory which had occupied the loft's main space, no doubt. Now it was hung with draperies of deep red velours, realistically embroidered, with the figure of a strutting peacock some six or eight feet high. Melek Taus, the peacock spirit of evil, Satan's viceroy upon earth, de Grandin told us in a whisper as we gazed upon the image which his flashing searchlight showed. Now do you stand close beside me and have your weapons ready, if you please. We may have need of them. Across the little intervening space he tiptoed, put aside the ruddy curtains, and tapped timidly on the door thus disclosed. Silence answered his summons, but as he repeated the hail with soft insistence the door swung inward a few inches, and a hooded figure peered cautiously through the opening. "'Who comes?' the sentinel whispered. "'And why have ye not the mystic knock?' "'The knock, you say?' de Grandin answered almost soundlessly. Morbleu, Adam think that we have one. Do you care for it? Swiftly he swung the steel tool with which he had forced the window and caught the hooded porter fairly on the cranium. Assist me, if you please, he ordered in a whisper, catching the man as he toppled forward and easing him to the floor. So off with his robe while I ensure his future harmlessness. With the waist cord from the porter's costume he bound the man's hands and ankles, then rose donned the red cassock and tiptoed through the door. Sssss! His low, sharp hiss came through the dark, and we followed him into the tiny anteroom. A row of pegs was ranged around the wall, and from them hung hooded gowns of dark red cloth, similar to that worn by the sentinel. Obedient to de Grandin's signaled order, Renoir and I arrayed ourselves in gowns, pulled the hoods well forward to obscure our features, and hands clasped before us and demurely hidden in our flowing sleeves, crept silently across the vestibule, paused a moment at the swinging curtains muffling the door, then with bowed heads stepped forward into Grandin's wake. We were in the chapel of the devil-worshippers. 14. The Serpent's Lair Hangings of dark red stuff draped loosely from the ceiling of the hall, obscuring doors and windows, their folds undulating eerily, like fluttering cerements of unclean phantoms. Candles like votive lights flickered in cups of red glass at intervals round the walls, their tiny lambent flames diluting rather than dispelling the darkness which hovered like vapor in the air. Only in one spot was there light, at the farther end of the draped room was an altar, shaped in imitation of the Gothic sanctuary of a church, and round this blazed a mass of tall black candles, which splashed a luminous pool on the deep red drugget covering the floor and altar steps. Above the altar was set a crucifix, reversed, so that the thorn-crowned head was down, the nail-pierced feet above, and back of this a reredos of scarlet cloth was hung, 
the image of a strutting peacock appliqued on it in flashing sequence. On the table of the altar lay a long cushion of red velvet, tufted like a mattress. Two ranks of backless benches had been set transversely in the hall, a wide center aisle between them, smaller aisles to right and left, and on these the congregation sat in strained expectancy, each member muffled in a hooded gown, so that it was impossible to distinguish the features, or even the sex, of a given individual. A faint odor of incense permeated the close atmosphere, not sweet incense such as churches use, but something with a bitter, pungent tang to it, and, it seemed to me, more than a hint of the subtle, maddening aroma of burnt cannabis, the bang with which fanatics of the East intoxicate themselves before they run amuck. But through the odor of the incense was another smell, the heavy smell of paraffin, as though some careless person had let fall an open tank of it, soaking the thick floor covering before the error could be rectified. Somewhere unseen to us, perhaps behind the faintly fluttering draperies on the walls, an organ was playing very softly, as Renoir, de Grandin, and I stole quickly through the curtained doorway of the anteroom, and, unobserved, took places on the rearmost bench. Here and there a member of the congregation gave vent to a soft sigh of suppressed anticipation and excitement. Once or twice peaked cowls were bent together, as their wearers talked in breathless whispers. But for the most part the assemblage sat erect in stony silence, motionless, yet eager as a flock of hooded vultures waiting for the kill which is to furnish them their feast. An unseen gong chimed softly as we took our seats, its soft resonant tones penetrating the dark room like a sudden shaft of daylight let into a long-closed cellar, and the congregation rose as one, standing with hands clasped before them and heads demurely bowed. A curtain by the altar was pushed back, and through the opening three figures glided. The first was tall and gaunt, with a Slavic type of face, wild, fantastic eyes, and thick, fair hair. The second was young, still in his early twenties, with the lithe, free carriage, fiery glance, and swarthy complexion of the nomadic races of southeastern Europe or western Asia. The third was a small, frail, aged man, that is, he seemed so at first glance, a second look left doubt both of his frailty and age. His face was old, long, thin, and deeply etched with wrinkles, hard-shaven like an actor's or a priest's, and in it burned a pair of big sad eyes, eyes like Lucifer's as he broods upon the high estate from which he fell. His mouth was tight-lipped, but very red, drooping at the corners, the mouth of an ascetic turned voluptuary. His body, in odd contrast to his face, seemed curiously youthful, erect and vigorous in carriage, a strange and somehow terrifying contrast, it seemed to me. All three were robed in gowns of scarlet fashioned like monks' habits, with hooded capes pendant at the back and knotted cords of black about the waist. On the breast of each was emblazoned an inverted passion cross in black. Each had a tonsure shaven on his head. Each wore red leather sandals on his feet. A gentle rustling sounded as the trio stepped into the circle of light before the altar, a soughing of soft sighs as the audience gave vent to its pent-up emotion. The old young man moved quickly toward the altar, his two attendants at his elbows, sank to one knee before it in humble genuflection, then like soldiers at command to wheel they turned to face the congregation. The two attendants folded hands before them, bringing the loose cuffs of their sleeves together. The other advanced a pace, raised his left hand as though in benediction, and murmured, Gloria tibi lucifero! Gloria tibi lucifero! intoned the congregation in a low-voiced chant. Praise we now our lord the peacock, Melek Taus, angel peacock of our lord the prince of darkness! came the chanted invocation of the red priest. Hail and glory, laud and honor, O our Lord, great Melek Taus, responded the auditors. 
Let us not forget the serpent who aforetime in the garden undertook the master's bidding, and from bondage to the tyrant freed our parents, Eve and Adam, the red priest admonished. Hail the serpent, who aforetime in the garden men call Eden, from the bondage of the tyrant freed our parents, Eve and Adam, cried the congregation, a wave of fervor running through them like fire among the withered grass in autumn. The red priest and his acolytes wheeled sharply to the left and marched beyond the limits of the lighted semicircle made by the altar candles, and suddenly the hidden organ, which had been playing a sort of soft improvisation, changed its tune. Now it sang a slow andante strain, rising and falling with persistent pulsating quavers, like the almost tuneless airs which eastern fakirs play upon their pipes when the serpents rise to dance upon their tails. And as the tremulous melody burst forth, the curtains parted once again, and a girl ran out into the zone of candlelight. For a moment she poised on tiptoe, and a gasp of savage and incredulous delight came from the company. Very lovely she was, violet-eyed, daffodil-haired, with a body white as petals of narcissi dancing in the wind. Her costume gleamed and glittered in the flickering candlelight, encasing her slim frame from hips to armpits like a coiled green hawser. It was a fifteen-foot live boa constrictor, as she moved lithely through the figures of her slow gliding dance to the sensuous accompaniment of the organ, the great reptile loosed its hold upon her torso and waved its hideous wedge-shaped head back and forth in perfect time. Its glistening scaly head caressed her neck, its lambent forked tongue shot forth to meet her red voluptuous mouth. Gradually the wailing minor of the organ began to quicken. The girl spun round and round upon her toes, and with that odd trick which we have of noting useless trifles at such times, I saw that the nails of her feet had been varnished to a gleaming pink, like the nails of a hand, and as she danced they cast back twinkling coral-toned reflections of the candle's flames. The great snake seemed to waken. Silently, swiftly, its sleek body extended, flowing like a stream of molten green metal about the girl, slithering from her bare white breast to her bare white feet, then knotting once again about her hips and waist like a gleaming girdle of death. Round and round she whirled, like a lovely animated top, her grisly partner holding her in firm embrace. Finally, as the music slowed once more, she fell exhausted to the carpet, and the snake again entwined itself about her body, its devilish head raised above her heaving shoulders, its beady eyes and flickering tongue shooting silent challenge to the world to take her from it. The music still whined on with insistent monotone, and the girl rose slowly to her knees, bowed to the altar till her forehead touched the floor and signed herself with the cross, in reverse beginning at her breast and ending at her brow. Then, tottering wearily beneath the burden of the great snake's weight, she staggered through the opening between the swaying curtains. The organ's wailing ceased, and from the shadow-shrouded rear of the hall there came the low intoning of a chant. The music was Gregorian, but the words were indistinguishable. Then came the high, sweet chiming of a sacring bell, and all the audience fell down upon their knees— heads bowed, hands clasped, as a solemn robed procession filed up the aisle. First marched the crucifer, arrayed in scarlet cassock and white surplice, and what a crucifix he bore! The rood was in reverse, the corpus hung head downward, and at the staff head perched the image of a strutting peacock, its silver overlaid with bright enamel, simulating the natural gaudy colors of the bird. Next came two men in crimson cassocks, each with a tall black candle flickering in his hand, and then a man who bore a staff of silver bells, which chimed and tinkled musically. Two other surpliced acolytes came next, walking slowly backward and swinging censers which belched forth clouds of pungent smoke. Finally the red priest, now clothed in full canonicals, 
Chasuble, Alb, and Amis, while at his elbows walked his two attendants in the dalmatic and tunical of deacon and subdeacon. Two by two behind the men there came a column of girls garbed in a sort of conventual habit, long loose-cuffed sleeves, full skirts reaching to the ankle, high cope-like collars, all of brilliant scarlet embroidered with bright orange figures which waved like flickering flames as the garments swayed. The gowns were belted at the waist, but open at the throat, leaving chest and bust uncovered, and disclosing on each breast the same symbol we had seen on Abigail Kimball's white flesh. Upon their heads they wore tall caps of stiff red linen, shaped somewhat like a bishop's mitre, and surmounted by the silver image of a peacock. As they walked sedately in the wake of the red priest, their bare white feet showed, with startling contrast to the deep red of their habits and the dark tones of the carpet. A brazen pot of glowing charcoal was swung from a long rod borne by the first two women, while the next two carried cushions of red plush, on which there lay some instruments of gleaming metal. The final members of the column were armed with scarlet staves which they held together at the tips, forming a sort of open arbor over a slight figure swathed in veils which marched with slow and faltering steps. Mon bleu, de Grandin whispered in my ear. Une proselyte, can such things be? His surmise was correct. Before the altar the procession halted, spread out fanwise, with the veiled girl in their midst. The women set their fire-pot on the altar steps, and blew upon the embers with a bellows till they glowed with sudden life. Then into the red nest of coals they put the shining instruments and stood back, waiting, a sort of awful eagerness upon their faces. Do what thou wilt. This shall be the whole of the law, the red priest chanted. Love is the law, love free and unbound, the congregation intoned. Do what thou wilt shall be the law, the priest repeated. Therefore, be ye goodly, dress ye in all fine raiment, eat rich foods and drink sweet wines, even the wines that foam. Also take thy fill of love, when and with whom ye will. Do what thou wilt, this is the law. The women gathered round the kneeling convert, screening her from view as the red priest called. Is not this better than the death in life of slaves who serve the slave god, and go oppressed with consciousness of sin, vainly striving after tedious virtues? There is no sin. Do what thou wilt. That is the law. The red-robed women started back and left the space before the altar open. In the candle-lighted clearing, the altar lights, reflected in the jewels which glimmered in her braided hair, knelt the convert, stripped of her enshrouding veils, clad only in her own white beauty. The red priest turned, took something from the glowing fire-pot. A short, half-strangled exclamation broke from the kneeling girl as she half started to her feet, but three watchful red-robed women sprang upon her, seized her wrist and head, and held her rigid while the priest pressed the glowing branding iron tight against her breast, then with a deftness which denoted practice, took a second tool and forced it first against one cheek and then the other. The branded girl groaned and writhed within her guardian's grasp, but they held her firmly till the ordeal was finished, then raised her, half fainting to her feet, and put a crimson robe on her, a yellow sash about her waist and a crimson mitre on her head. Scarlet women of the apocalypse, behold your sister, scarlet woman, you have put behind your consciousness of right and wrong. Look on the others of your sisterhood, the red priest cried. Show them this sign, that all may know that which ye truly are. Now pride, perhaps the consciousness that all connection with religious teaching had been cut, seemed to revive the almost swooning girl. Though tears still glinted on her eyelids from the torment she had undergone, a wild, bold recklessness shone in her handsome face as she stood forth before the other wearers of the brand, and pridefully, like a queen, drew back her ruddy robe, displaying the indelible signs of evil stamped upon her flesh. 
Her chin was raised. Her eyes glowed through their tears with haughty pride as she revealed the symbols of her covenant with hell. The little silver bells burst forth into a peal of admonition. Priest and people dropped upon their knees as the curtains by the altar were drawn back and another figure stepped into the zone of candlelight. Slowly, listlessly, almost like one walking in a dream, she stepped. A long and sleeveless smock of yellow satin, thick-set with red figures of dancing demons, hung loosely from her shoulders. A sort of ureus fashioned like a peacock was set crown-like on her head. Rings set with fiery gems glowed on every toe and finger. Great ruby pendants dangled from her ears. She seemed a very queen in Babylon as she proceeded to the altar, between the ranks of groveling priests and women, and sank to her knees, then rose and signed herself with the cross, beginning at the breast and ending at the brow. A whispered ripple which became a wave ran rapidly from lip to lip. It's she, the queen, the prophetess, the bride-elect. She's graced us with her presence. De Grandin murmured something in my ear, but I did not hear him. My other senses seemed paralyzed, as my gaze held with unbelieving horror to the woman standing at the altar. The queen, the devil's bride-elect, was Alice Hume. Fifteen. The Mass of St. Sicaire Preparations for the sacrilegious sacrament had been carefully rehearsed. For a long moment Alice stood erect before the altar, head bowed, hands clasped beneath her chin. Then parting her hands and raising them palm forward to the level of her temples, she dropped as though forced downward by invincible pressure, and we heard the softly thudding impact as she flung herself prostrate and beat her brow and palms against the crimson altar carpet in utter self-abasement. Is all prepared, the red priest called, as, flanked by deacon and subdeacon, he paused before the altar steps. Not yet. We make the sanctuary ready. Two of the scarlet-robed women returned in chorus as they stepped forward, bent and raised Alice Hume between them. Quickly, like skilled, tiring women working at their trade, they lifted off her yellow robe, with its decorations of gyrating devils, drew the glinting ruby rings from her toes and fingers, unhooked the flashing pendants from the holes bored through her ears. Then they unloosed her hair, and as the cloven tide of silken tresses rippled down, took her by the hands and led her slowly up the stairway to the altar. There one of them crouched to the floor, forming herself into a living stepping-stone, while, assisted by the other, Alice trod upon her back, mounted to the altar, and laid her white form supine on the long red cushion. Then ankles crossed and hands with upturned palms laid flaccidly beside her, she closed her eyes and lay as still as any carven statue. They put the sacred vessels on her breast, the golden chalice thick inlaid with gems, the heavy hand-chased pattern with its freight of small red wafers, and the yellow plate shone brightly in the candlelight, its reflection casting halos of pale gold upon the ivory flesh. The red priest mounted quickly to the altar, genuflected with his back to it, and called out, Introibo ad altare dei. I will go up into the altar of God. Rapidly the rite proceeded. The fifty-second psalm, quid gloriaris, was said, but blasphemously garbled. God's name deleted and the devil's substituted, so that it read, Why boastest thou thyself, thou tyrant, that thou canst do mischief, whereas the evilness of Satan endureth yet daily? Then came confession, and as Oremus te Domine was intoned, the priest bowed and kissed the living altar as provided by the rubric. Again repeating, Dominus vobiscum, he pressed a burning kiss upon the shrinking flesh. The subdeacon took a massive black-bound book and bore it to the deacon, who swung the censer over it. Then, while the other held it up before him, he read aloud, In the beginning God created seven spirits as a man lighteth one lamp from another, and of these Lucifer, whose true name is forbidden to pronounce, was chiefest.
But he, offended by the way in which God treated his creations, rebelled against the tyrant, but by treachery was overthrown. Therefore was he expelled from heaven, but seized dominion of the earth and air, which he retaineth to this day. And those who worship him and do him honor will have the joys of life all multiplied to them, and at the last shall dwell with him in that eternal place which is his own, where they shall have dominion over hosts of demons pledged to do their will. Choose ye, therefore, man, Choose ye whether ye will have the things of earth added to an endless authority in hell, or whether ye will submit to the will of the tyrant of the skies, have sorrow upon earth, and everlasting slavery in the world to come. The deacon and subdeacon put the book aside, crossing themselves in reverse, and the call came mockingly. May our sins be multiplied through the words contained in this gospel. The red priest raised the paten high above the living altar, intoning, Sushipe sancte pater hanc immaculatum hostiam. De Grandin fumbled underneath his robe. Renoir, my friend, he whispered. Do you go, tell the good Costello to come quickly. These cursed curtains round the walls, I fear they will shut in my whistled sound, and we must have aid at once. Quickly, my friend, a life depends on it. Renoir slipped from his place and crept toward the door, put back the curtain with a stealthy hand, and started back dismayed. Across the doorway we had entered, a barrier was drawn, an iron guard door intended to hold back flames should the building catch a fire. What had occurred was obvious. Recovered from the blow de Grandin dealt him, the seneschal had struggled from his bonds and barred the portal. Then— could it be possible that he had gone, unseen behind the screen of curtains hanging from the walls, and warned the others of our presence? De Grandin and Renoir reached for their firearms, fumbling with the unfamiliar folds of their disguises. Before a weapon could be drawn, we were assaulted from behind, our elbows pinioned to our sides, lengths of coiling cords wound tightly around our bodies. In less than half a minute we were helpless, firmly bound and set once more in our places on the bench. Silently and swiftly as a serpent twines its coils about a luckless rabbit, our assailants did their work, and only they and we apparently knew what occurred. Certainly the hellish ritual at the altar never faltered, nor did a member of the congregation turn round to see what passed behind. Two women of the Scarlet Sisterhood had crept back of the curtains by the altar. Now they emerged, bearing between them a little struggling boy, a naked, chubby little fellow, who fought and kicked and offered such resistance as his puny strength allowed, and called out to his daddy and his mamma to save him from his captors. Down on the altar steps they flung the little boy. One woman seized his little dimpled hands. The other took his feet, extending his small body to its greatest length. The deacon and subdeacon had stepped forward. I shut my eyes and bowed my head, but my ears I could not stop, and so I heard the red priest chant. Hike stenim calix sanguins mea. This is the chalice of my blood. I smelled the perfume of the incense, strong. Acrid, sweet yet bitterly revolting, mounting to my brain like some accursed oriental drug. I heard the wail which slowly grew in volume, yet which had a curiously muffled quality about it. The wail which ended in a little strangling, suffocated bleat. I knew. Though not a Catholic, I had attended Mass with Catholic friends too often not to know. The priest had said the sacred words of intention, and in a church the deacon would pour wine, the subdeacon water in the chalice. But this was not a church. This was a temple dedicated to the devil, and mingled with the red wine was not water. A bitter memory of my childhood hurried back across the years. They'd given me a lamb when I was five years old. All summer I'd made a pet of it. I loved the gentle woolly thing. The autumn came and with it came the time for slaughter, that agonizing, strangling bleat, that blood-choked cry of utter anguish. Another sound cut in. The red priest once again was chanting, 
this time in a language which I could not understand, a ringing, sonorous tongue, yet with something wrong about it. Syllables which should have been noble in their cadences were clipped and twisted in their endings. And now another voice, an abominably guttural voice with a note of hellish chuckling laughter in it, was answering the priest, still in that unknown tongue. It rose and fell, gurgled and chuckled obscenely, and though its volume was not great, it seemed to fill the place as rumbling thunder fills the summer sky. Sweat broke out on my forehead. Luckily for me, I had been seated by my captors, otherwise I should have fallen where I stood. As surely as I knew my heart was hammering against my ribs, I knew the voice of incarnate evil was speaking in that curtained room. With my own ears, I heard the devil answering his votary. Two red-robed priestesses advanced, one from either side of the altar, each bore an ewer of heavy hammered brass, and even in the candle's changing light I saw the figures on the vessels were of revolting nastiness, beasts, men, and women, in attitudes of unspeakable obscenity. The deacon and subdeacon took the vessels from the women's hands and knelt before the priest, who dropped upon his knees with outspread hands and upturned face a moment, then rose and took the chalice from the human altar's gently heaving breast, and held it out before him as a third red nun came forward, bearing in her outstretched hands a queer teapot-like silver vessel. I say a teapot, for that is what it most resembled when I saw it first. Actually it was a pitcher made of silver, very brightly polished, shaped to represent a strutting peacock with fanned-out tail and erected crest, its neck outstretched. The bird's beak formed the spout of the strange pitcher, and a funnel-shaped opening in the back between the wings permitted liquids to be poured into it. The contents of the chalice, augmented and diluted by ruby liquors from the ewers which the women brought, were poured into the peacock pitcher. A quart or so, I estimated and the red priest flung the chalice away contemptuously and raised the new container high above his head, so that its polished sides and ruby eyes flung back the altar candle's lights in myriad darting rays. Vile, detestable wretches, miscreants, de Grandin whispered hoarsely. They mingle blood of innocence, my friends. The wine which represents le précieux son de Dieu and the lifeblood of that little baby boy whose throat they cut and drained a moment hence. Parbleu, they shall pay through the nose for this if Jules de Grandin. The red priest's deep voice boomed an invitation. Ye who do truly and earnestly repent you of all your good deeds and intend to lead a new life of wickedness, Draw nigh and take this unholy sacrament to your soul's damnation, devoutly kneeling. The congregation rose and ranged themselves upon their knees in a semicircle round the altar. From each to each the red priests strode, thrusting the peacock's hollow beak into each opened mouth, decanting mingled wine and blood. You see? De Grandin's almost soundless whisper came to me. They study to give insult to the end. They make the cross sign in reverse. The crucifix they have turned upside down. When they administer their sacrament of hell, they give the wine before the wafer, mocking both the Anglican and Latin rites. Saligo! The ceremony proceeded to Ite Missa Est, when the celebrant suddenly seized a handful of red triangular wafers from the pattern and flung them broadcast out upon the floor. Pandemonium best describes the scene that followed. Those who have seen a group of urchins scrambling for coins tossed by some prankish tourist can vision how that audience of gowned and hooded worshippers of Satan clawed and fought for fragments of the host, groveled on the floor, snatching, scratching, grasping for the smallest morsel of the wafer, which, when obtained, they popped into their mouths and chewed with noisy mastication, then spat forth with exclamations of disgust and cries of foul insult. As the guards who stood behind us joined the swinish scramble for the desecrated host, de Grandin suddenly lurched forward, hunched his shoulders, then straightened like a coiling spring released from tension. Supple as an eel, and as muscular, he needed but the opportunity to wriggle from the ligatures which lashed his elbows to his sides. Quick, my friends, the haste! 
he whispered, drawing his sharp Gurkha knife and slashing at our bonds. We must... Les gendarmes! The police! The fire door leading to the anteroom banged back as the hooded warder rushed into the hall, screaming his warnings. He turned, slammed the door behind him, then drew a heavy chain across it, snapping a padlock through its links. They come, les gendarmes, he repeated hysterically. The red priest barked a sharp command, and like sailors trained to spring to quarters when the bugles sound alarm, some half-dozen Satanists rushed to the walls upset the guttering votive lamps, then scuttled toward the altar. Their companions already had disappeared behind the curtains hanging round the shrine. Qui est? Renoir began, but de Grandin cut him short. Quickly, for your lives! he cried, seizing us by the elbows and forcing us before him. Now we understood the heavy, sickening smell of kerosene which hovered in the room. From top to hem the shrouding curtains at the walls were soaked in it, requiring but the touch of fire to burst into inextinguishable flame. Already they were blazing fiercely where the upset lamps had lighted them, and the heavy, suffocating smoke of burning oil was spreading like mephitic vapor through the room. In a moment the place would be a raging hell of fire. Beyond the heavy fire door we heard Costello's peremptory hail. Open up here. Open in the law's name, or we'll break the door. Then the thunder of nightsticks on the steel-sheathed panels, finally the trap-drum staccato of machine-gun bullets rattling on the metal barricade. Too late to look for help that way, we knew. The door was latched and bolted and barred with a locked chain, and a geyser of live flame was spurting upward round it, for the wooden walls were now ablaze, outlining the fireproof door in a frame of death. Now the oil-soaked carpet had begun to burn. Red tongues of flame and curling snakes of smoke were darting hungrily about our feet. On! cried de Grandin. It is the only way. They must have planned this method of defense in case of raid. Surely they have left a rat hole for their own escape. His guess seemed right, for only round the altar were the flames held back, though even there they were beginning to make progress. Sleeves held before our faces for such poor protection as they gave, we stumbled toward the altar through the choking smoke. A big cowled man rose out of nowhere in my path and aimed a blow at me. Scarce knowing what I did, I struck at him, felt the sharp point of my hunting knife sink into the soft flesh of his axilla, felt the warm blood spurt upon my hand as his artery was severed, and rushed on. I was no longer Samuel Trowbridge staid, middle-aged practitioner of medicine. I was not even a man. I was a snarling, elemental beast, alive to only one desire to save myself at any cost, to butcher anything that barred my path. We lurched and stumbled up the stairway leading to the altar, for there the smoke was somewhat thinner, the flames a trifle less intense. Sixe, de Grandin cried. "'The way lies here, my friends,' This is the exit from their sacré burrow. Follow on. I can already see... Que diable? He started back, his pistol flashing in the firelight. Behind the altar, looming dimly through the swirling smoke, a man's shape bulked. One glance identified him. It was the big, young, white-haired man Costello had knocked unconscious to save Renoir an hour or so before. In his arms... He held the fainting form of Alice Hume. 16. Framed Hands up! de Grandin barked. Elevate your hands, or don't be an utter ass, the other advised tartly. Can't you see my hands are full? Displaying no more respect for the Frenchman's pistol than if it had been a pointed finger, he turned on his heel then flung across his shoulder as a sort of afterthought. If you want to save your hides a scorching, you'd best be coming this way. There's a stairway here. At least, there was fifteen minutes ago. Fanon d'un corbeau, he is cool, this one, de Grandin muttered with grudging admiration, treading close upon the stranger's heels. Sandwiched between our building and the next was a narrow spiral stairway, a type of covered fire escape long since declared illegal by the city. 
Down this the stranger led us, de Grandin close behind him, his pistol ready, his flashlight playing steadily on the other's back. One full step and I fire, he warned as we descended the dark staircase. Oh, be quiet, snapped our guide. One full step and I'll break my silly neck. Don't talk so much, you make me nervous. Two paces ahead of us, he paused at the stairway's bottom, kicked a metal fire door open, then drew aside to let us pass. We found ourselves in a narrow alleyway, darker than a moonless midnight, but with a single feeble spot of light diluting the blackness at its farther end, where the weak rays of a flickering gas street lamp battled with the gloom. Now what? the little Frenchman asked. Why do we stand here like a flock of silly sheep afraid to enter through a gate? Why— our guide's sharp hiss cut him off. I think they're waiting for us out there. They— Ah, I knew it. The faintly glowing reflection of the street lamp's light was shut off momentarily as a man's form bulked in the alley exit. De Grandin tapped me on the arm. Il est nu. She has no protection from the chill, he whispered with a nod toward Alice. Will you not put your robe upon her? I shall require mine for disguise a little longer, or— All right, I answered, slipping off my scarlet cassock and draping it about the girl's nude loveliness, while the man who held her in his arms assisted me with quick, deft hands. Dimitri! France! a voice called cautiously from the alley entrance. Are you there? Have you brought the bride? For a moment we were silent, then— Yes, our companion answered thickly, as though he spoke with something in his mouth. She's here, but— His answer broke abruptly, and I felt rather than saw him shift the girl's weight to his left arm as he fumbled under his coat with his right hand. But what? The hail came sharply. Is she injured? You know the penalty if harm comes to her. Come here. Here, take her, the stranger whispered, thrusting Alice into my arms. To de Grandin, how about that pistol you've been so jolly anxious to shoot off? Got it ready? Certainement. Et puis? The Frenchman answered. All right, look lively. This way. Silently as shadows, the three of them, de Grandin, the stranger, and Renoir, crept down the alley, leaving me to follow with the fainting girl as best I could. Just inside the entrance to the passageway, the stranger spoke again. The bride is safe, but... Once more his thick speech halted, then. France is hurt. He cannot walk well, and— Then kill him and be quick, the sharp command came back. None must fall into their hands alive. Quick, shoot him and bring the bride. The car is waiting. A muffled shot sounded, followed by a groan. Then— Bring the prophetess at once, came the angry command. What are you waiting for? Only for you, old thing. With a booming shout of mingled exultation and hilarity, the strange man leaped suddenly from the shadow of the alley's mouth, seized his interrogator in his arms, and dragged him back to the shelter of the passageway's arched entrance. Hold him, Frenchy, he commanded. Don't let him get away. He's— A spurting dart of flame stabbed through the darkness, and a sharp report was followed by the vicious— Wing of a ricocheting bullet, which glanced from the vaulted roof and whined past me in the dark. I crouched to the cement pavement, involuntarily putting myself between the firing and the girl in my arms. A second report sounded, like an echo of the first, followed by a screaming cry which ended in a choking groan, then the sound of running feet. That's one who'll never slit another throat, the stranger remarked casually. I waited for a moment, then, as there seemed no further danger to my unconscious charge, rose and joined the others. What happened? I asked. Oh, as we were escaping from the fire up there, this poor fellow came to help us, and this other one shot him, the unknown man replied coolly. Rankest piece of cold-blooded murder I ever saw. Positively revolting, eh, Frenchy? But certainly. De Grandin agreed. He shot the noble fellow down à froid. Oh, yes, I saw it with my own two eyes. I, too, 
Renoir supplemented. Are you crazy? I demanded. I saw one of you grapple with this man. Then when the other shot at you, you returned his fire and— A kick which nearly broke my tibia was delivered to my shin. Ah, bah! How could you see, my friend? De Grandin asked me, almost angrily. You were back there with Mademoiselle Alice, and the night is dark. I tell you, this so estimable noble fellow would have aided us, had not this vile miscreant assassinated him. He would have killed us too, all three of us, had not Monsieur, er, uh, this gentleman, gallantly gone forth and pulled him down with his bare hands at peril of his life. Yes, of course, that is how it was. See, here is the weapon with which the wicked murder was committed. Right-o, and ain't it unfortunate that it's a German gun, the stranger added. They'll never be able to trace it by its serial number now. However, we're all eyewitnesses to the crime, and any ballistics expert will be able to match the bullet and the gun. So, but you fired that shot, I accused. I? His tone was pregnant with injured innocence. Why, I didn't have a weapon. Mais certainement, de Grandin chimed in eagerly. The sergeant took his weapon from him when they had their so unfortunate misunderstanding in the street. In a fierce whisper, he added, Learn to hold your tongue in matters not concerning you, my friend. Regarde. He turned his flashlight full upon the prisoner's face. It was the red priest. The bellowing halloo of a fire engine's siren sounded from the other street, followed by the furious clanging of a gong. Come. De Grandin ordered. The fire brigade has come to fight the flames, and we must find Costello. I hope the noble fellow came to no harm as he tried to rescue us. Glory be, Dr. de Grandin, sir! Costello cried as we rounded the corner and returned to the street from which we had entered the temple an hour or so earlier. We waited for you till we figured you'd been unable to signal, then went in to get you. But the murder and devils had barred the door and set the place afire. Big gob, I thought you'd have been cremated before this. <laughs> Not I, de Grandin answered with a chuckle. It is far from so, I do assure you. But see, we have not come back empty-handed. Here, safe in good friend Trowbridge's arms, is she whom we did seek. And here, he pointed to the red priest, who struggled futilely in the big stranger's grasp, here is one I wish you to lock up immediately. The charge is murder. Renoir and I, as well as this gentleman, will testify against him. Holy Moses! Who the devil let you out? The sergeant demanded, as he caught sight of our strange ally. I thought they put the bracelets on you, and— They did, the other interrupted with a grin. But I didn't think such jewellery was becoming to my special brand of homeliness. So I slipped him off and went to take a walk. Oh, you did, eh? Well, young felly, me lad, you can be after walking right straight back, or— But no, de Grandin cut in quickly. I shall be responsible for him, my sergeant. He is a noble fellow. It was he who guided us from the burning building, and at the great peril of his life seized this wicked one and wrenched his pistol from him when he would have killed us. Oh, yes, I can most confidently vouch for him. Come to Dr. Trowbridge's, when you have put that so wicked man all safely in the jail. He added as we made off toward my car. We shall have much to tell you. But it was the only way, mon vieux, de Grandin patiently explained as we drove homeward. Their strategy was perfect, or almost so. But for good luck and this so admirable young man, we should have lost them altogether. Consider, when they set fire to that old building, it burned like tinder. Even now the fire brigade fights in vain to save it. With it will be utterly destroyed all evidences of their vile crimes, the paraphernalia of their secret worship, even the bones of their little victims. When their leader fell into our hands, we had no single shred of evidence to hold him. He had simply to deny all we said, and the authorities must let him go, for where was proof of what he did? Nowhere, Pablo, it was burned up, of course. 
but circumstances so fell out that we killed one of his companions, voila, our chance had come. We had been wooden heads not to have grasped it. So we conspire to forswear his life. As the good Costello would express it, we have put the frame around him. It is illegal, I admit, yet it is justice. You yourself know he did slay a little baby boy. Yet you know we cannot prove he did it. For none of us beheld the little corpse, and it is now but a pile of ashes mixed with other ashes. How many more like it there may be we do not surely know, but from what poor Mademoiselle Abigail told us we know of one at least. And must they die all unavenged? Must we stand by and see that spawn of hell, that devil's priest, go free, because, as the lawyers say, the corpus delicti of his crimes cannot be established for want of the small corpses? No, Cordieu, I say it shall not be. While he may not suffer legally for the murders which he did, the law has seized him, and, pardieu, the law will punish him for a crime he did not do. It may not be the law, my friend, but it is justice. Surely you agree? I suppose so, I replied. But somehow it doesn't seem... Of course it does, he broke in smilingly, as though a simple matter had been settled. Our next great task is to revive Mademoiselle Alice, make her as comfortable as may be, then notify her grieving fiancé that she is found. Pablo, it will be like a tonic to see that young man's face when we inform him we have found her. 17. Hiji Alice was regaining consciousness as de Grandin and I carried her upstairs and laid her on the guest-room bed. More accurately, she was no longer in a state of actual swoon, for her eyes were open, but her whole being seemed submerged in a state of lethargy so profound that she was scarcely able to move her eyes and gaze incuriously about the room. Mademoiselle, de Grandin whispered soothingly, you are with friends. Nothing can harm you now. No one may order you to do that which you do not wish to do. You are safe. Safe, the girl repeated. It was not a query, not an assertion, merely a repetition, parrot-wise, of de Grandin's final word. She gazed at us with fixed, unquestioning eyes, like a newborn infant or an imbecile. Her face was blank as an unwritten sheet. The little Frenchman gave her a quick, sharp glance, half surprised, half speculative. But certainly— he answered. You know us, do you not? We are your friends, Dr. Trowbridge, Dr. de Grandin. Dr. Trowbridge, Dr. de Grandin. Again that odd phonographic repetition, incurious, disinterested, mechanical, meaningless. She lay before us on the bed, still as she had lain upon the devil's altar, only the gentle motion of her breast and the half-light in her eyes telling us she was alive at all. The Frenchman put his hand out and brushed the hair back from her cheeks, exposing her ears. Both lobes had been bored to receive the golden loops of the earrings she had worn, and the holes pierced through the flesh were large enough to accommodate moderately thick knitting needles. Yet the surrounding tissue was not inflamed, nor, save for a slight redness, was there any sign of granulation round the wounds. Electrocautery he told me softly. They are modern in their methods, those ones, at any rate. Observe here also, if you please. Following his tracing forefinger with my eyes, I saw a row of small, deep-pitted punctures in the white skin of her forearms. Good heavens! I exclaimed. Morphine? Why, there are dozens of incisions. They must have given her enough to— he raised his hand for silence, gazing intently at the girl's expressionless, immobile face. Mademoiselle, he ordered sharply, on the table yonder you will find matches. Rise, go to them, take one and light it. Then hold your finger in the flame while you count three. When that is done you may come back to bed. Allez! She turned her oddly lifeless gaze on him as he pronounced his orders. 
Somehow, it seemed to me, reflected in her eyes, his commands were like writing appearing supernaturally, a spirit message on a medium's blank slate. Recorded somehow in her intelligence, or rather perceptivity, they in no wise altered the paper blankness of her face. Docilely, mechanically and unquestioningly, like one who walks in sleep, she rose from the bed, paced slowly across the room, took up the tray of matches and struck one. Hold! de Grandin cried abruptly as she thrust her finger in the flame, but the order came a thought too late. One, she counted deliberately, as the cruel fire licked her ivory hand, then, obedient to his latest order, removed her finger, already beginning to glow angry red with exposure to the flame, blew out the match, turned slowly, and retraced her steps. Not a word or inarticulate expression, not even by involuntary wincing, did she betray rebellion at his orders or consciousness of the sharp pain she must have felt. No, my friend, he turned to me, as though answering an unspoken question. It was not morphine then, but it must be so now. Quick, prepare and give a hypodermic of three-quarters of a grain as soon as is convenient. In that way she will sleep— and not be able to respond to orders such as mine, or worse. Wonderingly, I mixed the opiate and administered it, and de Grandin prepared a soothing unguent to bandage her burned finger. It was heroic treatment, he apologized as he wound the surgical gauze deftly round her hand. But something drastic was required to substantiate my theory, otherwise I could not have rested. How do you mean? I asked curiously. "'Tell me, my friend,' he answered irrelevantly, fixing me with his level, unwinking stare. "'Have you not a feeling, have you not felt that Mademoiselle Alice, whatever might have been her provocation, was at least in some way partly guilty with those murderers who killed the little helpless babes in Satan's worship? Have not you—' "'Yes,' I interrupted. "'I did feel so.' although I hesitated to express it. You see, I've known her all her life and was very fond of her, but, well, it seemed to me that though she were in fear of death, or even torture, the calm way in which she accepted everything, even the murder of that helpless child, confound it that got under my skin. When we think how poor Abigail Kimball sacrificed her life rather than endure the sight of such a heartless crime, I can't help but compare the way Alice has taken everything, and— Précisément he broke in with a laugh. I too felt so, and so I did experiment to prove that we were wrong. Mademoiselle Abigail, the good God rest her soul, was herself in full possession of her faculties, while Mademoiselle Alice was the victim of scopolamine apomophia. Scopolamine apomophia? I repeated blankly. Mais certainement, I am sure of it. Isn't that the so-called truth serum? Précisément. But I thought that had been discredited as a medical imposture. For the purpose for which it was originally advertised, yes, he agreed. Originally it was claimed that it could lead a criminal to confess his crimes when questioned by the officers, and in that it failed, but only because of its mechanical limitations. Scopolamine apomorphia has a tendency to so throw the nervous system out of gear that it greatly lessens what we call the inhibitions, tearing down the warning signs which nature puts along the road of action. Subjected to its action, the criminal's caution, that cunning which warns him to refrain from talking lest he betray himself, is greatly lessened, for his volition is practically nullified. But that is not enough. No. Under scopolamine apomorphia, if the injection be strong enough, he will repeat what is said to him. But that is not confession as the law demands it. It is but parroting the accusation of the officers. So it has been discredited for judicial use. But for the purpose which those evil ones desired, it was perfect. With a large dose of scopolamine apomorphia injected in her veins, Mademoiselle Alice became their unresisting tool. She had no will, nor wish, nor consciousness, except as they desired. Her mind was but a waxen record on which they wrote directions, 
and as the record reproduces words when placed upon the phonograph, so she reacted blindly to their orders. Par exemple, they dose her with the serum of scopolamine apomorphia. They say to her, You will array yourself in such a way, and when the word is given, you will stand thus before the altar. You will abase yourself in this wise. You will cross yourself so. Then you will permit the women to disrobe you until you stand all nude before the people, but you will not feel embarrassed. No, you will thereon mount the altar and lay yourself upon it, as it were a bed, and stay there till we bid you rise. And as they have commanded, so she does. Did you not note the similarity of her walk and general bearing when she crossed the room a moment hence, and when she stood before the altar of the devil? Yes, I agreed. I did. Très bon, I thought as much. Therefore, when I saw those marks upon her arms, and recognized them as the trail of hypodermic needles, I said to me, Jules de Condin, it are highly probable that scopolamine apomorphia has been used on her. And I replied, It are wholly likely, Jules de Grandin. Very well, then, let us experiment. It has been some time since she was dosed with this medicine which steals her volition. Yet her look and bearing, and the senseless manner she repeats our words back at us, reminds me greatly of one whom I had seen in Paris, when the gendarmes had administered scopolamine apomorphia to him. Bien alors, I did bid her rise and hurt herself. Only a person whose instinct of self-preservation has been blocked would go and put his hand in living flame merely because another told him to, n'est-ce pas? Yet she did do it, and without protest. As calmly as though I requested that she eat a bonbon, she rose and crossed the room and thrust her so sweet finger into searing flame. La pauvre! I did hate myself to see her do it, yet I knew that unless she did I must inevitably hate her. The case is proved, good friend Trowbridge. We have no need to feel resentful toward her. The one we saw bow down before the devil's altar, the one we saw take part in their vile rites, was not our Mademoiselle Alice. No, by no means. It was but her poor image, the flesh which she is clothed in. The real girl whom we sought and whom we brought away with us was absent, for her personality, her consciousness and volition were stolen by those evil men, exactly as they stole the little boys they slew upon the altar of the devil. I nodded, much relieved. His argument was convincing, and I was eager to be convinced. Now we have sunk her in a sleep of morphine, she will rest easily, he finished. Later we shall see how she progresses, and if conditions warrant it, Tomorrow, young John Davison shall once more hold his amoureuse against his heart. Yes, that will be a happy day for me. Shall we rejoin the others? We have much to talk about. And that Renoir, how well I know him, the bottle will be empty if we do not hasten. So I hanged the blighters out of hand, the stranger was telling Renoir as de Grandin and I rejoined them in the study. Admirable. Superb, I approve, Renoir returned, then rose and bowed with jackknife formality to the stranger, de Grandin and me in turn. Jules, Dr. Trowbridge, he announced, permit that I make you acquaint with Monsieur le Baron Ingram, late of His Majesty's gendarmerie in Sierra Leone. Monsieur le Baron, Dr. Jules de Grandin, Dr. Trowbridge. I am Inspector Renoir of the Service Sûreté. Smilingly, the stranger acknowledged the introductions, adding, It ain't quite as bad as the inspector makes it out, gentlemen. My pater happened to leave me a baronetcy, with no money to support the title, but you'd hardly call me a baron, I fear. As to the gendarmerie, I was captain in the Sierra Leone Frontier Police, but— Exactly, precisely, quite so, Renoir interjected. It is as I said, Monsieur le Baron's experiences strangely parallel my own. Tell them, if you please, Monsieur le Baron. Give over, cried the other sharply. I can't have you, Monsieur le Baroning me all over the place, you know. It gives me the hump. My sponsors in baptism named me Haddingway Ingram Jameson Ingram, 
H-I-J-I, you know, and I'm known in the service as Hiji. Why not compromise on that? We're all policemen here, I take it. All but Dr. Trowbridge, who has both the courage and the wit to qualify, de Grandin answered. Now, Monsieur Hiji, you were about to tell Inspector Renoir. He paused with upraised eyebrows. The big Englishman produced a small black pipe and a tin of three nuns, slowly tamped tobacco in the briar, and eyed us quizzically. He was even bigger than I'd thought at first, and, despite his prematurely whitened hair, much younger than I'd estimated. Thirty-one or two at most, I guessed. How strong is your credulity? he asked at length. Pablo, it is marvellous, magnificent, declared de Grandin. We can believe that which we know is false if you can prove it to us. It'll take a lot of believing, Ingram answered. But it's all true, just the same. A year or so ago, about the time Inspector Renoir was beginning to investigate the missing girls, queer rumours began trickling back to Freetown from the reserved forest areas. We've always had leopard societies in the back country, gangs of cannibals who disguise themselves as leopards and go out stalking victims for their ritual feasts. Of course, but this seemed something rather new. Someone was stirring up the natives to a poro, an oath-bound resistance to government. The victims of the latest leopard outrages were men who failed to subscribe to the rebellion. Several village headmen and sub-chiefs had been popped into the pot by the leopard men, and the whole area was getting in an awful state of funk. Nobody wants to go up in the reserved forests, so they sent me. Let good old Hiji do it. Hiji's the lad for this show, they said. So I took a dozen Hausa policemen, two Lewis guns and ten pounds or so of quinine and set out. Ten days back in the brush we ran across the leopard's spoor. We'd stopped at a Mendy village, and I sent word forward for the headman to come out. He didn't come. That wasn't so good. If I waited too long for him outside the place, I'd lose face. If I went in to him after summoning him to come to me, he would have put shame on me. Finally, I compromised by going in alone. The chief lolled before his hut with his warriors and women around him, and it didn't take more than half an eye to see he'd placed no seat for me. I see you, chief, I told him, swaggering forward with the best assurance I could summon. I also saw that he was wearing a string of brummagem beads about his neck, as were most of his warriors, and wondered at it, for no license had been issued to a trader recently, and we'd had no reports of white men in the section for several years. I see you, white man, he replied, but made no move to rise or offer me a seat. Why do you thus put shame upon the King Emperor's representative? I demanded. We want no dealings with the Emperor King or any of his men, the fellow answered. The land is ours. The English have no right here. We will have no more of him. The patter rattled off his tongue as glibly as though he had been a soapbox orator preaching communism in Hyde Park. This was rank sedition, not at all the sort of thing to be countenanced, you know. So I went right for the blighter. Get up from there, you unholy rotter, I ordered, and tell your people you've spoken with a crooked tongue or— It was a lucky thing for me I'm handy with my feet. A spear came driving at me, missing me by less than half an inch, and another followed it, whistling past my head so close I felt the wind of it. Fortunately my men were hiding just outside, and Bendingo, my half-caste Arab sergeant, was a willing worker with the Enfield— he shot the foremost spearman through the head before the fellow had a chance to throw a second weapon, and the other men began to shoot before you could say knife. It was a gory business, and we'd rather killed half the poor beggars before they finally called it quits. The chief was most apologetic when the fracas ended, of course, and swore he had been misled by white men who spoke with crooked tongues. This was interesting. It seemed, from what the beggar told me, there had been several white men wandering at large through the area, distributing what would be equivalent to radical literature at home, preaching armed and violent rebellion to government and all that sort of thing. Furthermore, they'd told the natives the brummagem beads they gave them would act as medicine against the white man's bullets, and that no one need fear to raid a mission station or refuse to pay the hut tax— for England had been overthrown, and only a handful of colonial administrators remained. 
no army to come to their rescue if the natives were to rise and wipe them out. This was bad enough, but worse was coming. It appeared these playful little troublemakers were preaching miscegenation. This was something new. The natives had never regarded themselves as inferior beings, for it's strictly against regulations to say or do anything tending to do more than make them respect the whites as agents of the government. But they'd never, save in the rarest instances, attempted to take white women. Oh, yes, they killed them sometimes, often with torture, but that was simply part of the game. No chivalry, you know. But these white agitators were deliberately urging the Timni, Mendes, and Sulima to raid settlements and mission stations, and spare the women that they might be carried off as prizes. That was plenty. Right there the power of the British rule had to be shown. So I rounded up all the villagers who hadn't taken to the woods, told them they'd been misled by lying white men whom I'd hang as soon as caught, then strung the chief up to the nearest oil palm. His neck muscles were inordinately strong, and he died in circumstances of considerable elaboration and discomfort, but the object lesson was worthwhile. There'd be no more defiance of a government agent by that gang. We were balked at every turn. Most of our native informers had been killed and eaten, and the other blacks were sullen. Not a word could we get from them regarding leopard depredations, and they shut up like a lot of clams when we asked about the white troublemakers. We'd never have gotten anywhere if it hadn't been for old man Anderson. He was a Wesleyan missionary who ran a little chapel and clinic way up by the French border. His wife and daughter helped him. He might have loved his God. He certainly had a strange love for his women folk to bring him into that stinking hellhole. It was a month after our brush with the Mendy when we crashed through the jungle to Anderson's. The place was newly raided, burnt and leveled to the ground. Ashes still warm. What was left of the old man we found by the burnt chapel, all except his head, they'd taken that away for a souvenir. We found the bodies of several of his converts, too. They'd been flayed, their skins stripped off as you'd turn off a glove. His wife and daughter were nowhere to be found. They hadn't taken any special pains to cover up their tracks, and we followed at a forced march. We came upon them three days later. The blighters had eaten themselves loggy and drunk enough trade gin to float the Berengaria, so they didn't offer much resistance when we charged. I'd always thought a man who slaughtered unresisting enemies was a rotten beast, but the memory of old Anderson's dismembered body and those pink skinless corpses made me revise my notion. We came upon them unawares, opened with the Lewis guns from both sides of the village, and didn't sound cease fire until the dead lay round like logwood, corded in a lumber camp. Then, and not till then, we went in. We found old Mrs. Anderson dead, but still warm. She'd, uh, I think you can imagine what she'd been through, gentlemen. We found the daughter, too, not quite dead. In the four days since her capture she'd been abused by more than a hundred men, black and white, and was scarcely breathing when we came on her. She— White and black, monsieur, de Grandin interrupted. Right, oh. The raiding party had been led by whites, five of them. Stripped off their clothes and put on native ornaments, carried native weapons, and led the blacks in their hellish work. Indeed, I don't believe the poor black beggars would have gone out against the Jesus Papa if those white hellions hadn't set him up to it. They'd regarded Rebecca Anderson as good as dead, and made no secret of their work. The leader was a Russian, so were two of his assistants. A fourth was Polish, and the last some sort of Asiatic, a Turk, the poor child thought. They'd come up through Liberia penetrated the protectorate and set the natives up to devilment, finally organising the raid on Andersons. Now their work was done and they were on their way. She heard the leader say he was going to America, for in Harrisonville, New Jersey, the agents of his society had found a woman whom they sought, and who would lead some sort of movement against organised religion. The poor kid didn't understand it all. No more did I but she heard it and remembered. 
The white men had left the night before, striking east into French Guinea on their way to the coast, and leaving her as a plaything for the natives. Before the poor child died, she told me the Russian in command had been a man with her slender, almost boyish body, but with the wrinkled face of an old man. She'd seen him stripped for action, you know, and was struck by the strange contrast of his face and body. One other thing she told me. When they got to America, they intended holding meetings of their damned society, and the road to their rendezvous would be directed by pictures of the devil, with his pitchfork pointing the way the person seeking it should take. She didn't understand, of course, but I had all the clues I wanted. And as soon as we got back to Freetown, I got a leave of absence to hunt that foul murderer down and bring him to justice. The young man paused a moment to relight his pipe, and there was something far from pleasant in his lean and sunburned face as he continued. Rebecca Anderson went to a grave like an old Sumerian queen. I impounded every man who'd had a hand in the raid and put him to work digging a grave for her, then a big circular trench round it. Then I hanged them and dumped their carcasses into the trench to act as guard of honour for the girl they'd killed. You couldn't bribe a native to go near the place now. I was following the little pictures of the devil when Renoir set on me. I mistook him for one of them, of course, and, well, it's a lucky thing for all of us Costello bashed me when he did. De Grandin's little round blue eyes were alight with excitement and appreciation. And how did you escape, monsieur? he asked. The Englishman laughed shortly. Got a pair of handcuffs? he demanded. I have, supplied Renoir. Lock em on me. The manacles clicked round his wrists, and he turned to us with a grin. Absolutely no deception, gentlemen. Nothing concealed in the hands, nothing up the sleeves, he announced in a droning sing-song. Then, as easily as though slipping them through his shirt-sleeves, drew his hands through the iron bracelets. Just a matter of small bones and limber muscles, he added with another smile. Being double-jointed helps some, too. It was no trick at all to slip the derbies off when the constables joined Costello for the raid. I put the irons on the other person, knocked him on his ankles, so the boys would find him when they came back to the motor. But, uh, Renoir began, only to pause with the next word half uttered. From upstairs came a quavering little frightened cry, like the tremulous call of a screech owl or of a child in mortal terror. No noise, de Grandin warned, as he leaped from his seat and bounded up the stairway three steps at a time, Renoir and Ingram close behind him. We raced on tiptoe down the upper hall and paused a second by the bedroom door. Then de Grandin kicked it open. Alice crouched upon the bed, half raised upon one elbow, her other arm bent guardingly across her face. The red robe we had put upon her when we fled the devil's temple had fallen back, revealing her white throat and whiter breast. Her loosened hair fell across her shoulders. Close by the open window, like a beast about to spring, crouched a man. Despite his changed apparel, his heavy coat and tall peaked cap of astrakhan, we recognized him in a breath. Those big sad eyes fixed on the horror-stricken girl, that old and wrinkle-bitten face, could be none others than the red priest's. His slender, almost womanish hands were clenched to talons. Every muscle of his little spare frame was taut, stretched harp-string tight for the leap he poised to make. Yet there was no malignancy, hardly any interest in his old, close-wrinkled face. Rather, it seemed to me, he looked at her a gaze of brooding speculation. Parbleu, monsieur du diable, you honor us too much. This call was wholly unexpected de Grandin said as he stepped quickly forward. Quick as he was, the other man was quicker. One glance, one murderous glance, which seemed to focus all the hate and fury of a thwarted soul, he cast upon the Frenchman, then leaped back through the window. Crash! de Grandin's pistol shot seemed like a clap of thunder in the room as he fired at the retreating form, and a second shot sped through the window as the intruder landed on the snow below and staggered toward the street. Winged him, by Jove, the Englishman cried exultantly. Nice shooting, Frenchy. 
Nice be damned and roasted on the grates of hell, de Gronda answered furiously. Is he not free? They charged downstairs, leaving me to comfort Alice, and I heard their voices as they searched the yard. Ten minutes later they returned, breathing heavily from their efforts, but empty-handed. Slipped through us like an eel, the Englishman exclaimed. Must have had a motor waiting at the curb, and— Sacre nom de nom de nom, de Grandin stormed. What are they thinking of, those stupid heads? Is not he charged with murder? Yes, pardieu, yet they let him roam about at will, and— It is monstrous, it is vile, it is not to be endured. Snatching up the telephone, he called police headquarters, then— What means this, sergeant? he demanded when Costello answered. We sit here like four sacre fools and think ourselves secure, and that one, that so vile murderer, comes breaking in the house and— What? Pas possible. It is, sir. We heard Costello's answer as de Grandin held the receiver from his ear. That bird you handed me is in his cell this minute, and furthermore, he's been there every second since we locked him up. 18. Reunion Looking very charming and demure in a suit of Jules de Grandin's lavender pajamas and his violet silk dressing gown, Alice Hume lay upon the chaise lounge in the bedroom, toying with a grapefruit and poached egg. "'If you'd send for mother, please,' she told us, "'I'd feel so much better, you see.' Her voice shook slightly, and a look of horror flickered in her eyes. "'You see, there are some things I want to tell her, some advice I'd like to get, before you let John see me, and—' "'Why, what's the matter?' She put the breakfast tray upon the tabaret and looked at us in quick concern. Mother, there's nothing wrong, is there? She's not ill. Oh, my child, de Grandin answered softly. Your dear mother never will again be ill. You shall see her, certainly, but not until God's great tomorrow dawns. She is not dead. The word was formed rather than spoken by the girl's pale lips. The little Frenchman nodded slowly. When? How? The night you... you went away, ma pauvre. It was murder. Murder? Slowly, unbelievingly, she repeated. But that can't be. Who'd want to murder my poor mother? De Grandin's voice was level, almost toneless. The same unconscionable knaves who stole you from the marriage altar, he returned. They either feared she knew too much of family history, knew something of the origin of David Hume, or else they wished all earthly ties you had with home and kindred to be severed. At any rate, they killed her. They did it subtly, in such a manner that it was thought suicide, but it was murder nonetheless. Oh! The girl's faint moan was pitiful, hopeless. Then I'm all alone, all, all alone. I've no one in the world. To... You have your fiancé, the good young Monsieur Jean, the Frenchman told her softly. You also have friend Trowbridge, as good and staunch a friend as ever was. Then there is Jules de Grandin. We shall not fail you in your need, my small one. For a moment she regarded us distractedly, then suddenly put forth her hands, one to Jules de Grandin, one to me. Oh, good, kind friends, she whispered. Please help me if you can. God knows I am in need of help, if ever woman was, for I am as foul a murderess as ever suffered death. I was accessory to those little children's murders. I was... Oh, what was it that the lepers used to cry? Unclean? Oh, God, I am unclean. Unclean. Not fit to breathe the air with decent men. Not fit to marry John. How could I bring children into the world, I who've been accessory to the murder of those little innocents? She clenched her little hands to fists and beat them on her breast. Her tear-filled eyes turned upward, as though petitioning pardon for unpardonable sin. Unclean! Unclean! she wailed. Her breath came slowly, like that of a dumb animal which resents the senseless persistency of pain. What is that you say? A murderess, you, de Grandin shot back shortly. Yes, I, 
I lay there on their altar while they brought those little boys and cut their— Oh, I didn't want to do it. I didn't want them to be killed, but I lay there just the same and let them do it. I never raised a finger to prevent it. De Grandin took a deep breath. You are mistaken, mademoiselle, he answered softly. You were in a drugged condition, the victim of a vicious oriental drug. In that old helpless state one sees visions, unpleasant visions, like the figments of a naughty dream. There were no little boys. No murders were committed while you lay thus upon the devil's altar. It was a seeming, an illusion, staged for the edification of those wicked men and women who made their prayer to Satan. In the olden days, when such things were, they sacrificed small boys upon the altar of the devil. But this is now— even those who are far gone in sin would halt at such abominations. They were but waxen simulacra, mute, senseless reproductions of small boys, and though they went through all the horrid rite of murder, they let no blood, they did perform no killings. No, certainly not. Jules de Grandin, physician, soldier, and policeman, was lying like the gallant gentleman he was, and lying most convincingly. But I heard their screams. I heard them call for help. Then strangle in their blood, the girl protested. All an illusion, ma chère, the little Frenchman answered. It was a ventriloquial trick. At the conclusion of the ceremony, the good Trowbridge and I would have sworn we heard a terrible, thick voice conversing with the priest upon the altar. That also was a juggler's trick intended to impress the congregation. No, ma chère. Your conscience need not trouble you at all. You are no accessory to a murder. As to the rest, it was no fault of yours. You were their prisoner and the helpless slave of wicked drugs. What you did was done with the body, not the soul. There is no reason why you should not wed, I tell you. She looked at him with tear-dimmed eyes. Though she had mastered her first excess of emotion, her slender fingers clasped and unclasped nervously, and she returned his steady gaze with something of the vague, half-believing apprehension of a child. "'You're sure?' she asked. "'Sure?' he echoed. "'To be sure I am sure, mademoiselle. Remember, if you please, I am Jules de Gondin. I do not make mistakes. Come, calm yourself. Monsieur Jean will be here at any moment, then—' He broke off, closing his eyes and standing in complete silence. Then he put his fingers to his pursed lips, and from them plucked a kiss and tossed it upward toward the ceiling. Mon Dieu, he murmured rapturously, la passion délicieuse, is it not magnificent? Alice, Alice, beloved, young Davison's voice faltered as he rushed into the room and took the girl into his arms. When they told me that they'd found you at last, I could hardly believe. I knew they were doing everything but— Again his speech halted for very pressure of emotion. "'Oh, my dear!' Alice took his face between her palms and looked into his worshipping eyes. "'My dear, you've come to me again, but—' She turned from him, and fresh hot tears lay upon her lashes. "'No buts, mademoiselle!' de Grandin almost shouted. "'Remember what I said. Take love when he comes to you, my little friends. Oh, do not make excuses to turn him out of doors!' Hell waits for those who do so. There is no obstacle to your union. Believe me when I say so. Take my advice and have the good curé come here this very day, I beg you. Both Davison and Alice looked at him amazed, for he was fairly shaking with emotion. He waved a hand impatiently. Do not look so. Make no account of doubts or fears or feelings of unworthiness. He almost raged. Behold me, if you please, an empty shell. A soulless shadow of a man, a being with no aim in life, no home nor fireside to bid him welcome when he has returned from duty. Is that the way to live? Mille fois non, I shall say not, but I let love pass me by, my friends, and have regretted it but once, and that once all my aimless empty life. Écoutez-moi. In the springtime of our youth we met, sweet Eloise and I, beside the river Loire. I was a student at the Sorbonne, my military service yet to come. 
She, cher dear, was an angel out of paradise. Beside the silver stream we played together. We lay beneath the poplar trees. We rode upon the river. We waded barefoot in the shallows. Yes, and when we finished wading, she plucked cherries, red ripe cherries from the trees, and twined their stems about her toes, and gave me her white feet to kiss. I ate the cherries from her feet, and kissed her toes, one kiss for every cherry, one cherry for each kiss, and when we said bon nuit, mon dieu, to kiss and cling and shudder in such ecstasy once more. Alas, my several times great-grandsire, he whose honoured name I bore, had cut and hacked his way through raging Paris on the night of August 24, in 1572. How long his bones have turned to ashes in the family tomb, while her ancestors had worn the white brassard and cross, crying, Mess ou mort, à bas les Huguenots. He paused a moment and raised his shoulders in a shrug of resignation. It might not be, he ended sadly. Her father would have none of me. My family forbade the thought of marriage. I might have joined her in her faith, but I was filled with scientific nonsense which derided old beliefs. She might have left the teachings of her forebears and accepted my ideas. But twenty generations of belief weigh heavily upon the shoulders of a single fragile girl. To save my soul she forfeited all claim upon my body. If she might not have me for husband, she'd have no mortal man. So she professed religion. She joined the silent Carmelites, the Carmelites who never speak except in prayer, and the last fond word I had from her was that she would pray ceaselessly for my salvation. Alas, those little feet so much adored! How many weary steps of needless penance have they taken since that day so long ago? How fruitless life has been to me since my stubbornness closed the door on happiness! Oh, do not wait, my friends. Take the love the good God gives, and hold it tight against your hearts. It will not come a second time. Come, friend Trowbridge, he commanded me. Let us leave them in their happiness. What have we— who clasped love's hand in ours long years ago, and saw the purple shadow of his smile grow black with dull futility, to do with them. Nothing, Padia. Come, let us take a drink. We poured the ruby brandy into wide-mouthed goblets, for de Grandin liked to scent its rich bouquet before he drank. I studied him covertly as he raised his glass. Somehow the confession he had made seemed strangely pitiful. I'd known him for five years, nearly always gay, always nonchalant, boastfully self-confident, quick, brave, and reckless, ever a favorite with women, always studiously gallant, but ever holding himself aloof, though more than one fair charmer had deliberately paid court to him. Suddenly I remembered our adventures of the ancient fires. He had said something then about a love that had been lost. But now, at last I understood Jules de Grandin. Or thought I did. To you, my friend, he pledged me. To you, and friendship, and brave deeds of adventure. And last of all, to death, the last sweet friend who flings the door back from our prison for— The clamoring telephone cut short his toast. Mercy Hospital, a crisp feminine voice announced as I picked up the instrument. Will you and Dr. de Grandin come at once? Detective Sergeant Costello wants to see you just as soon as— Oh, wait a minute. They've plugged a phone through from his room. Hello, Dr. Trowbridge, sir. Costello's salutation came across the wire a moment later. They like to got me, sir. In broad daylight, too. Huh? What the deuce? I shot back. What's the trouble, Sergeant? A chopper, sir. A what? Machine gun, sir. Hornsby and me was standin' by the corner of Thirty Fourth and Tunlaw Streets, half an hour back, when a car comes past like the hammers of hell, and they let us have a dose of bullets as they passed. Poor Hornsby got his first off, went down full of lead as a Christmas puddin' is a plum, sir. But I'm just messed up a little, nothing but a bad arm and a punctured back. Praise the Lord. Good heavens! 
I exclaimed. Have you any idea who— I have that, sir. I seen him, plain as I see you. As I would be seeing you if you was here, I mean, sir, and— Yes, I urged as he paused a moment, and a swallow sounded audibly across the wire. Yes, sir, I seen him, and there's no mistake about it. It were the filly you and Dr. de Grandin turned over to me to hold for murder last night. I seen him, plain as day. There's no mistake in that there map of his'n. Good Lord, then he did escape. No, sir, he didn't. He's locked up tight in his cell at headquarters this minute, waiting arraignment for murder. 19. The Lightning Bolts of Justice That evening Alice suffered from severe headaches, and shortly afterward with sharp abdominal pains. Though a careful examination disclosed neither enlarged tonsils nor any evidence of mechanical stoppage, the sensation of a ball rising in her throat plagued her almost ceaselessly. When she attempted to cross the room, her knees buckled under her as though they had been the boneless joints of a rag doll. Jules de Grandin pursed his lips, shook his head, and tweaked the needle ends of his moustache disconsolately. L'hysterie, he murmured. It might have been foreseen. The emotional and moral shock the poor one has been through is enough to shatter any nerves. Alas, I fear the wedding may not be so soon, friend Trowbridge. The experience of marriage is a trying one to any woman. The readjustment of her mode of life, the blending of her personality with another's, it is a strain. No, she is in no condition to essay it. Amazingly, he brightened, his small eyes gleaming as with sudden inspiration. Pablo, I have it, he exclaimed. She, Monsieur Jean, and you, mon vieux, shall take a trip. I would suggest the Riviera, were it not that I desire isolation for you all until... No matter. Your practice is not so pressing that it cannot be assumed by your estimable colleague, Dr. Phillips. And Mademoiselle Alice will most certainly improve more quickly if you accompany her as personal physician. You will go? Say that you will, my friend. A very great much depends on it. Reluctantly, I consented, and for six weeks Alice, John Davison, and I toured the Caribbean, saw devastated Martinique, the birthplace of the Empress Josephine, drank Haitian coffee fresh from the plantation, investigated the sights and sounds, and most especially the smells of Panama and Cologne, finally passed some time at the Jockey Club and Sloppy Joe's in Havana. It was a well and sun-tanned Alice who debarked with us and caught the noon train out of Hoboken. Arrangements for the wedding were perfected while we cruised beneath the Southern Cross. The old Hume house would be done over and serve the bride and groom for home, and in view of Alice's bereavement the formal ceremony had been cancelled, a simple service in the chapel of St. Chrysostom's being substituted. Pending the nuptials, Alice took up residence at the Hotel Carteret, "'declaring that she could not think of lodging at my house, "'warm as was my invitation. "'All has been finished,' de Grandin told me jubilantly "'as he, Renoir, and Ingram accompanied me from the station. "'The justice of New Jersey, of which you speak so proudly, "'she has more than justified herself, oh, yes.' "'Huh?' I demanded. "'Renoir and Ingram chuckled. "'They gave it to him,' the Englishman explained. "'In the throat, the neck, I should remark,' Renoir supplied, wrestling bravely with the idiom. "'The party will be held tomorrow night,' de Grandin finished. "'Who? What? Whatever are you fellows saying?' I queried. "'What party do you mean, and—' "'Grigor Bazarov,' de Grandin answered with another laugh. "'The youthful-bodied one with the aged evil face, the wicked one who celebrated the Black Mass, he is to die tomorrow night.' Yes, parbleu, he dies for murder. But, patience, mon vieux, and I shall tell you all. You do recall how we, Monsieur Higi, Renoir, and I, did apprehend him on the night we rescued Mademoiselle Alice? Of course, very well. You know how we conspired that he should be tried for a murder which he did not perpetrate, because we could not charge him with his many other crimes. Very good, so it was. When we had packed you off with Monsieur Jean and his so charming fiancée, your testimony could not serve to save him. No, we had the game all to ourselves, 
and how nobly we did swear his life away. More dear, when they heard how artistically we committed perjury, I damn think Ananias and Sapphira hung their heads and curled up like two anchovies for very jealousy. The jury almost wept when we described his shameful crime. It took them only twenty minutes to decide his fate. And so tomorrow night he gives his life in expiation for those little boys he sacrificed upon the devil's altar and for the dreadful death he brought upon poor Abigail. Me? I am clever, my friend. I have drawn upon the wires of political influence, and we shall all have seats within the death house when he goes to meet the lightning bolt of Jersey justice. Yes, certainly, of course. You mean, we're to witness the execution? Me we, oui, if we. Oui. Did I not swear he should pay through the nose when he slew that little helpless lad upon the devil's altar? But certainly. And now by damn. He shall learn that Jules de Grandin does not swear untruly, unless he wishes to, unquestionably. Deftly, like men accustomed to their task, the state policemen patted all our pockets. The pistols my companions wore were passed unquestioned, for only cameras were taboo within the execution chamber. All right, you can go in the sergeant told us when the troopers had completed their examination, and we filed down a dimly lighted corridor behind the prison guard. The death room was as bright as any clinic's surgery, immaculate white tile reflecting brilliant incandescent bulbs hard rays. Behind a barricade of white enameled wood on benches, which reminded me of pews, sat several young men, whose journalistic calling was engraved indelibly upon their faces and despite their efforts to appear at ease, it took no second glance to see their nerves were taut to the snapping point, for even seasoned journalists react to death. And here was death, stark and grim as anything to be found in the dissecting rooms. The chair, a heavy piece of oaken furniture, stood near the farther wall, raised one low step above the tiled floor of the chamber. A brilliant light suspended from the ceiling just above it, casting its pitiless spotlight upon the center of the tragic stage. The warden and a doctor, stethoscope swung round his neck as though it were a badge of office, stood near the chair, conversing in low tones. The lank, cadaverous electrician, whose duty was to send the lethal current through the condemned man's body, stood in a tiny alcove like a doorless telephone booth, slightly behind and to the left of the chair. A screen obscured a doorway leading from the room, but as we took our seats in front, I caught a fleeting glimpse of a white enameled wheeled beer, a white sheet lying neatly folded on it. Beyond, I knew, the surgeon and the autopsy table were in readiness when the prison doctor had announced his verdict. The big young Englishman went pale beneath his tropic tan as he surveyed the place. Renoir's square jaw set suddenly beneath his bristling square-cut beard. De Grandin's small bright eyes roved quickly around the room, taking stock of the few articles of furniture. Then, involuntarily, his hand flew upward to tease the tightly waxed hairs of his moustache to a sharper point. These three, veterans of police routine, all more than once participants in executions, were fidgeting beneath the strain of waiting. As for me, if I came through without the aid of smelling salts, I felt I should be lucky. A light tap sounded on the varnished door communicating with the death cells, a soft, half-timid sort of tap it was, such as that a person unaccustomed to commercial life might give before attempting to enter an office. The tap was not repeated. Silently, on well-oiled hinges, the door swung back and a quartet halted on the threshold. To right and left were prison guards. Between them stood the red priest arrayed in open shirt and loose black trousers, list slippers on his feet. As he came to a halt, I saw that the right leg of the trousers had been slit up to the knee and flapped grotesquely round his ankle. The guards beside him held his elbows lightly, and another guard brought up the rear. Pale, calm, erect, the condemned man betrayed no agitation, save by a sudden violent quivering of the eyelids, this perhaps being due to the sudden flood of light in which he found himself. His great sad eyes roved quickly round the room, not timorously but curiously, finally coming to rest upon de Grandin. 
Then, for an instant, a flash showed in them, a lambent flash which died as quickly as it came. Quickly the short march to the chair began. Abreast of us, the prisoner wrenched from his escorts, cleared the space between de Gronda and himself in one long leap, bent forward and spat into the little Frenchman's face. Without a word or cry of protest, the prison guards leaped on him, pinioned his elbows to his sides, and rushed him at a staggering run across the short space to the chair. De Grandin drew a linen kerchief from his cuff and calmly wiped the spittle from his cheek. Eh bien, he murmured. It seems the snake can spit, though justice has withdrawn his fangs, n'est-ce pas? The prison warders knew their work. Straps were buckled round the prisoner's wrists, his ankles, waist. A leather helmet like a football player's was clamped upon his head, almost totally obscuring his pale, deep-wrinkled face. There was no clergyman attending. Grigor Bazarov was faithful to his compact with the devil, even unto death. His pale lips moved. God is tyranny and misery. God is evil. To me then, Lucifer, he murmured in a sing-song chant. The prison doctor stood before the chair, notebook in hand, pencil poised. The prisoner was breathing quickly, his shoulders fluttering with forced respiration. A deep inhaling gulp, a quick exhaling gasp. The shoulders slanted forward. So did the doctor's pencil, as though he wrote. The thin-faced executioner, his quiet eyes upon the doctor's hands, reached upward. There was a crunching of levers, a sudden whir, a whine, and the criminal's body started forward, lurching upward as though he sought to rise and burst from the restraining straps. As much as we could see of his pale face grew crimson, like the face of one who holds his breath too long. The bony, claw-like hands were taut upon the chair arms, like those of a patient in the dentist's chair when the drill bites deeply. A long, eternal moment of this posture. Then the sound of grating metal as the switches were withdrawn, and the straining body in the chair sank limply back, as though in muscular reaction to fatigue. Once more the doctor's pencil tilted forward, again the whirring whine. Again the body started up, tense, strained, all but bursting through the broad, strong straps which bound it to the chair. The right hand writhed and turned, thumb and forefinger meeting tip to tip as though to take a pinch of snuff. Then absolute flaccidity as the current was shut off. The prison doctor put his book aside and stepped up to the chair. For something like a minute the main tube of his questing stethoscope explored the reddened chest exposed as he put back the prisoner's open shirt. Then, I pronounce this man dead. Mon Dieu! exclaimed Renoir. For God's sake, Ingram muttered thickly. I remained silent as the white-garbed orderlies took the limp form from the chair, wrapped it quickly in a sheet and trundled it away on the wheeled beer to the waiting autopsy table. I say, suggested Ingram shakily, suppose he ain't quite dead. It didn't seem to me. Tiens, he will be thoroughly defunct when the surgeon's work is done. De Grandin told him calmly. It was most interesting, was it not? His small eyes hardened as he saw the sick look on our faces. Ah, bah! You have the sympathy for him? He asked almost accusingly. For why? Were they not more merciful to him than he was to those helpless little boys he killed? Those little boys whose throats he slit? Or that poor woman whom he crucified? I damn think yes. 20. The Wolf Master Tia, my friends, I damn think there is devilment afoot, de Grandin told us, as we were indulging in a final cup of coffee in the breakfast room some mornings later. But no, Renoir expostulated. But yes, his confrere insisted. Read it, my friend, he commanded, passing a folded copy of the journal across the table to me. To Ingram and Renoir he ordered, Listen, listen and become astonished. Magnate's menagerie on rampage, beasts on Carmony estate break cages and pursue intruder, animals' disappearance a mystery, I read aloud at his request. 
Early this morning, the private zoo maintained by Winthrop Carmony, well-known retired Wall Street operator, at his palatial estate near Raritan, were aroused by a disturbance among the animals. Carmony is said to have the finest, as well as what is probably the largest collection of Siberian white wolves in captivity, and it was among these beasts the disturbance occurred. John Knowles, forty-five, and Edgar Black, thirty, caretakers on the Carmony estate, hastily left their quarters to ascertain the cause of the noise which they heard coming from the wolves' dens about 3.30 a.m. Running through the dark to the dens, they were in time to see what they took to be a man enveloped in a long, dark cloak, running at great speed toward the brick wall surrounding the animal's enclosure. They also noticed several wolves in hot pursuit of the intruder. Both declare that though the wolves had been howling and baying noisily a few minutes before, they ran without so much as a growl as they pursued the mysterious visitor. Arriving at the den, the men were amazed to find the cage doors swinging open, their heavy locks evidently forced with a crowbar, and all but three of the savage animals at large. The strange intruder, with the wolves in close pursuit, was seen by Knowles and Black to vault the surrounding wall but all had disappeared in the darkness when the keepers reached the barrier. Citizens in the vicinity of the Carmony estate are warned to be on the lookout for the beasts, for though they had been in confinement several years, and consequently have lost much of their native savagery, it is feared that unless they are speedily recaptured, or voluntarily find their way back to their dens, they may revert to their original ferocity when they become hungry. Livestock may suffer from their depredations, and if they keep together and hunt in a pack, even human beings are in danger, for all the beasts are unusually large, and would make dangerous antagonists. This morning at daylight a posse of farmers, headed by members of the state constabulary, was combing the woods and fields in search of the missing animals, but though every spot where wolves might be likely to congregate was visited, no trace of them was found. No one can be found who admits seeing any sign of the runaway wolves, nor have any losses of domestic animals been reported to the authorities. The manner in which the wolf pack seems to have vanished completely, as well as the identity of the man in black seen by the two keepers, and the reason which may have actuated him in visiting the Carmony menagerie, are puzzling both the keepers and authorities. It has been intimated that the breaking of the cages may have been the vagary of a disordered mind. Certain insane persons have an almost uncontrollable aversion to the sight of caged animals, and it is suggested an escaped lunatic may have blundered into the Carmony Zoo as he fled from confinement. If this is so, it is quite possible that, seeing the confined beasts, he was suddenly seized with an insane desire to liberate them, and consequently forced the locks of their cages. The released animals seem to have been ungrateful, however— for both Knowles and Black declare the mysterious man was obviously running for his life, while the wolves pursued him in silent and ferocious determination. However, since no trace of the body has been found, nor any report of a man badly mauled by wolves made in the locality, it is supposed the unidentified man managed to escape. Meanwhile, the whereabouts of the wolf pack is causing much concern about the countryside. Carmony is at present occupying his southern place at Winter Haven, Florida, and all attempts to reach him have been unsuccessful at the time this issue goes to press. Hmm. It's possible, I murmured as I put the paper down. Absolutely, Ingram agreed. Of course, certainly, de Grandin nodded, then abruptly. What is? Why, uh, a lunatic might have done it, I returned. "'Cases of zoophilia "'And of zoophidlesticks,' the little Frenchman interrupted. "'This was no insanatics vagary, my friends. "'This business was well planned beforehand, "'though why it should be so we cannot say. "'Still, I don't care if he is at breakfast. "'I've got to see him.' "'A hysterically shrill voice came stridently from the hallway, "'and John Davison strode into the breakfast room, "'pushing the protesting Nora McGuinness from his path. Dr. de Granda, Dr. Trowbridge, she's gone, he sobbed as he half fell across the threshold. Mon Dieu, so soon, de Granda cried. How was it, mon pauvre? Davison stared glassy-eyed from one of us to the other, his face working spasmodically, 
his hands clenched till it seemed the bones must surely crush. He stole her, he and his damned wolves. Wolves, I say, barked Ingram. Grand Dieu, wolves, Renoir exclaimed. Ah, wolves? I begin to see the outlines of the scheme, de Grandin answered calmly. I might have feared as much. Begin at the beginning, if you please, monsieur, and tell us everything that happened. Do not leave out an incident, however trivial it may seem. In cases such as this there are no trifles. Begin, commence, we listen. Young Davison exhaled a deep, half-sobbing breath and turned his pale face from de Grandin to Renoir, then back again. We, Alice and I, went riding this morning as we always do, he answered. The horses were brought round at half-past six, and we rode out the Albemarle Pike toward Boonsburg. We must have gone about ten miles when we turned off the highway into a dirt road. It's easier on the horses, and the riders, too, you know. We'd ridden on a mile or so, through quite a grove of pines, when it began to snow, and the wind rose so sharply it cut through our jackets as if they'd been summer weight. I'd just turned round to lead the way to town, when I heard Alice scream— She'd ridden fifty feet or so ahead of me, so she was that much behind when we turned. I wheeled my horse around, and there, converging on her from both sides of the road, were half a dozen great white wolves. I couldn't believe my eyes at first. The brutes were larger than any I'd ever seen, and though they didn't growl or make the slightest sound, I could see their awful purpose in their gleaming eyes and flashing fangs. They hemmed my poor girl in on every side— and as I turned to ride to her, they gathered closer, crouching till their bellies almost touched the ground, and seemed to stop, waiting for some signal from the leader of the pack. I drove the spurs into my mare and laid the whip on her with all my might, but she balked and shied and reared, and all my urging couldn't force her on a foot. Then, apparently from nowhere, two more white beasts came charging through the woods and leaped at my mount's head. The poor brute gave a screaming whinny and bolted, I tugged at the bridle and sawed at her mouth, but I might have been a baby for all effect my efforts had. Twice I tried to roll out of the saddle, but she was fairly flying, and try as I would I didn't seem able to disengage myself. We'd reached the pike and traveled half a mile or so toward town before I finally brought her to a halt. Then I turned back, but at the entrance to the lane she balked again, and nothing I could do would make her leave the highway. I dismounted and hurried down the lane on foot, but it was snowing pretty hard by then, and I couldn't even be sure when I'd reached the place where Alice was attacked. At any rate, I couldn't find a trace of her, or of her horse. He paused a moment, breathlessly, and de Grandin prompted softly. And this he to whom you referred when you first came in, monsieur? Grigor Bazarov, the young man answered, and his features quivered in a nervous tick. I recognized him instantly. As I rushed down that lane at breakneck speed on my ungovernable horse, I saw, distinctly, gentlemen, a human figure standing back among the pines. It was Grigor Bazarov, and he stood between the trees, waving his hands like a conductor leading an orchestra. Without a spoken syllable, he was directing that pack of wolves. He set them after Alice and ordered them to stop when they'd surrounded her. He set them on me and made them leap at my horse's head, without actually fleshing their teeth in her, and without attempting to drag me from the saddle, which they could easily have done. Then, when he'd worked his plan and made my mare bolt, he called them back into the woods. It was Alice he was after, and he took her as easily as a shepherd cuts a weather from the flock with trained sheepdogs. How is this? de Grandin questioned sharply. You say it was Grigor Bazarov. How could you tell you never saw him? No, but I've heard you tell of him, and Alice had described him, too. I recognized those great sad eyes of his, and his mummy-wrinkled face. I tell you— But Bazarov is dead, I interrupted. We saw him die last week, all of us. They electrocuted him in the penitentiary at Trenton, and— And while he was all safely lodged in jail, he broke into this house and all but made away with Mademoiselle Alice, de Grandin cut in sharply. You saw him with your own two eyes, my Trowbridge. So did Renoir and Monsieur Higi. Again, while still in jail, he murdered the poor Hornsby, and all but killed the good Costello. The evidence is undisputed, and— I know, but he's dead now, I insisted. 
There is a way to tell, de Grandin answered. Come, let us go. Go where? To the cemetery, of course. I would look in the grave of this one who can be in jail and in your house at the same time, and kill a gendarme in the street while safely under lock and key. Come, we waste our time, my friends. We drove to the county courthouse, and de Grandin was closeted with the recorder Glassford in his chambers a few minutes. Très bon, he told us as he reappeared. I have the order for the exhumation. Let us make haste. The early morning snow had stopped, but a thin veneer of leaden clouds obscured the sky, and the winter sun shone through them with a pale, half-hearted glow as we wheeled along the highway toward the graveyard. Only people of the poorer class buried their dead in Willow Hills. Only funeral directors of the less exclusive sort sold lots or grave space there. Bazarov's unmarked grave was in the least expensive section of the poverty-stricken burying ground, one short step higher than the potter's field. The superintendent and two overalled workmen waited at the graveside, for de Granda had telephoned the cemetery office as soon as he obtained the order for the exhumation. Glancing perfunctorily at the little Frenchman's papers, the superintendent nodded to the Polish laborers. Get going, he commanded tersely, and make it snappy. It was dismal work watching them heave lumps of frosty clay from the grave. The earth was frozen almost stony hard, and the picks struck on it with a hard metallic sound. At length, however, the dull reverberant thud of steel on wood warned us that the task was drawing to a close. A pair of strong web straps were lowered, made fast to the rough box enclosing the casket, and at a word from the superintendent the men strained at the thongs, dragging their weird burden to the surface. A pair of pick-handles were laid across the open grave, and the rough box rested on them. Callously, as one who does such duties every day, the superintendent wrenched the box lid off, and the laborers laid it by the grave. Inside lay the casket, a cheap affair of chestnut covered with shoddy broadcloth, the tinny imitation silver nameplate on its lid already showing a dull brown-blue discoloration. Snap! The fastenings which secured the casket lid were thrown back. The superintendent lifted the panel and tossed it to the frozen ground. Head resting on the sateen rayon pillow, hands folded on his breast, Grigor Bazarov lay before us, and gave us stare for stare. The mortuarian who attended him had lacked the skill or inclination to do a thorough job, and despite the intense cold of the weather, putrefaction had made progress. The dead man's mouth was slightly open, a quarter inch or so of purple blood-gorged tongue protruding from his lips, as though in low derision. The lids were partly raised from his great eyes and though these had the sightless gaze of death, it seemed to me some subtle mockery lay in them. I shuddered at the sight despite myself, but I could not forbear the jibe. Well, is he dead? I asked de Grandin. Come en mouton, he answered, in no wise disconcerted. Restore him to his bed, if you will be so good, monsieur, he added to the superintendent. And should you care to smoke? A flash of green showed momentarily as a treasury note changed hands, and the cemetery overseer grinned. Thanks, he acknowledged. Next time you want to look at one of them, don't forget, we're always willing to oblige. Yes, he is dead, the Frenchman murmured thoughtfully as we walked slowly toward the cemetery gate. Dead like a herring, yet dead or not, John Davison broke in, and his words were syncopated by the chattering of his teeth. Dead or not, sir, the man we just saw in that coffin was the man I saw beside the lane this morning. No one could fail to recognize that face. 21. White Horror Here's a special delivery letter for Mr. Davison. Comes to while you was out, sir. Nora McGuinness announced as we entered the house. Will you be after having the turkey or the roast for dinner tonight? And shall I make the salad with tomatoes or asparagus? Turkey, by all means. He is a noble bird, de Grandin answered for me. And tomatoes with the salad, if you please, ma petite. 
The big Irish woman favored him with an affectionate smile as she retired kitchenward, and young Davison slit the envelope of the missive she had handed him. For a moment he perused it with wide-set, unbelieving eyes, then handed it to me, his features quivering once again with nervous tick. John, darling, when you get this I shall be on my way to fulfill the destiny prepared for me from the beginning of the world. Do not seek to follow me, nor think of me, save as you might think kindly of one who died, for I am dead to you. I have forever given up all thought of marriage to you, or any man, and I release you from your engagement. Your ring will be delivered to you, and that you may some day put it on the finger of a girl who can return the love you give is the hope of Alice. I can't. I won't believe she means it, the young man cried. Why, Alice and I have known each other since we were little kids. We've been in love since she first put her hair up and— Tia, my friend, de Grandin interrupted as he gazed at the message. Have you by chance spent some time out in the country? Huh? answered Davison, amazed at the irrelevant question. Your hearing is quite excellent, I think. Will you not answer me? Why, uh, yes, of course I've been in the country. Spent practically all my summers on a farm when I was a lad, but— Très bon, the little Frenchman laughed. Consider, did not you see the wicked Bazarov urge on his wolves to take possession of your sweetheart? But certainly. And did he not forbear to harm you, being satisfied to drive you from the scene while he kidnapped Mademoiselle Alice? Of course. And could he not easily have had his wolf pack drag you from your horse and slay you? You have said as much yourself. Very well, then. Recall your rural recollections, if you will. You have observed the farmer as he takes his cattle to the butcher. Does he take the trouble to place his cow in leading strings? By no means. He puts the little so weak calf, all destined to be veal upon the table in a little while, into a wagon and drives away to market. And she, the poor distracted mother beast, she trots along behind, asking nothing but to keep her little baby calf in sight. Lead her, parbleu, ropes of iron could not drag her from behind the tumbrel in which her offspring rides to execution. Is it not likely so in this case also? I damn think yes. This never-to-be-sufficiently anathematized stealer of women holds poor Mademoiselle Alice in his clutch. He spares her fiancé. Perhaps he spares him only as the cruel, playful pussycat forbears to kill the mouse outright. At any rate, he spares him. For why? Pardieu, because by leaving Monsieur Jean free, he still allows poor Mademoiselle Alice one little tiny ray of hope. With such vile subtlety as only his base wickedness can plan, he holds her back from black despair and suicide, that he may force her to his will by threats against the man she loves. Sacre nom d'un artichaut, I shall say yes, certainly, of course. You mean... He'll make her go with him, leave me, by threats against my life, young Davison faltered. Précisément, mon vieux, he has no need to drug her now with scopolamine apomophia. He holds her in a stronger thrall. Yes, it is entirely likely. He folded the girl's note between his slim white hands, regarding it idly for a moment. Then, excitedly, Tell me, Monsieur Jean, did Mademoiselle Alice by any chance know something of telegraphy? Eh? Why, yes. When we were kids, we had a craze for it. Had wires strung between our houses with senders and receivers at each end, and used to rouse each other at all sorts of hours to tap a message. Hurrah! The evil one is circumvented. Regardez-vous. Holding the letter to the study desk lamp, he tapped its bottom margin with his finger. Invisible, except against the light, a series of light scratches as though from a pinpoint or dry pen showed on the paper. "'You can read him?' he asked anxiously. "'Me, I understand the international, but this is in American Morse, and—' "'Of course I can,' young Davison broke in. "'Jones Mill,' it says. "'Good Lord, why didn't I think of that? "'Huh? And this mill of Monsieur Jones is an old ruin, several miles from Boonsburg. "'No one's occupied it since I can remember.' but it can't be more than three miles from the place where we met the wolves, and— Eh bien, if that be so, why do we sit here like five sculptured figures on the Arc de Triomphe? Come, let us go at once, my friends. 
Trowbridge, Renoir, friend T.G., and you, friend Jean. Prepare yourselves for service in the cold. Me, I shall telephone the good Costello for the necessary implements. Wida, Monsieur le Loup, I think that we shall give you the party of surprise. We shall feed you that which will make your bellies ache most villainously. It was something like a half hour later when the police car halted at the door. It's kind of irregular, sir, Sergeant Costello announced as he lugged several heavy satchels up the steps with the aid of two patrolmen. But I got permission for the loan. Seems like you got a good standing down to headquarters. The valises open, he drew forth three submachine guns, each with an extra drum of cartridges, and two riot guns, weapons similar to the automatic shotgun, but heavier in construction and firing shells loaded with much heavier shot. You and friend Jean will use the shotguns, friend Trowbridge, de Grandin told me. Renoir, Ingram, and I will handle the quick firers. Come, prepare yourselves at once. Heavy clothing, but no long coats. We shall need legroom before the evening ends. I fished a set of ancient hunting togs out of my wardrobe. Thick trousers of stout corduroy, a pair of high lace boots, a heavy sweater and suede jerkin, finally a leather cap with folds that buckled underneath the chin. A few minutes' search unearthed another set for Davison, and we joined the others in the hallway. De Grandin was resplendent in a leather aviation suit. Renoir had slipped three sweaters on above his waistcoat and bound the bottoms of his trousers tight about his ankles with stout linen twine. Ingram was arrayed in a suit of corduroys which had seen much better days, though not recently. "'Are we prepared?' de Grandin asked. "'Très bon, let us go.' The bitter cold of the afternoon had given way to slightly warmer weather— but before we had traversed half a mile the big full yellow moon was totally obscured by clouds, and shortly afterward the air was filled with flying snowflakes and tiny cutting grains of hail which rattled on the windshield and stung like whips when they blew into our faces. About three-quarters of a mile from the old mill I had to stop my motor, for the road was heavy with new-fallen snow, and several ancient trees had blown across the trail, making further progress impossible. Eh bien, it must be on foot from now on, it seems, de Grandin murmured as he clambered from the car. Very well, one consents, one one must. Let us go. There is no time to lose. The road wound on, growing narrower and more uneven with each step. Thick ranks of waving black-bowed pines marched right to the border of the trail on either side, and through their swaying limbs the storm wind soughed eerily while the very air seemed colder with a sharper, harder chill, and the wan and ghastly light which sometimes shines on moonless, snow-filled winter nights seemed filled with creeping, shifting phantom shapes which stalked us as a wolf-pack stalks a stag. Morble, I so not like this place, me, Renoir declared. It has an evil smell. I think so too, mon vieux, de Grandin answered. Three times already I have all but fired at nothing. My nerves are not so steady as I thought. Oh, keep your tails up, Ingram comforted. It's creepy as a Scottish funeral here, but I don't see anything. <laughs> do you say it? Then look yonder, if you will, and tell me what it is you do not see, my friend, de Grandin interrupted. Loping silently across the snow themselves a mere shade darker than the fleecy covering of the ground, came a pack of great white wolves, green-yellow eyes aglint with savagery, red tongues lolling from their mouths as they drew nearer through the pines, then suddenly deployed like soldiers at command, and their cordon formed, sank to the snow and sat there motionless. "'Cher Dieu,' Renoir said softly, it is the pack of beasts which made away with Mademoiselle Alice, and— A movement stirred within the pack. A brute rose from its haunches, took a tentative step forward, then sank down again, belly to the snow, and lay there panting, its glaring eyes fixed hungrily upon us. And as the leader moved, so moved the pack. A score of wolves were three feet nearer us, for every member of the deadly circle had advanced in concert with the leader. I stole a quick glance at de Grandin, 
His little round blue eyes were glaring fiercely as those of any of the wolves. Beneath his little blonde mustache his lips were drawn back savagely, showing his small white even teeth in a snarl of hate and fury. Another rippling movement in the wolf pack, and now the silence crashed, and from the circle there went up such pandemonium of hellish howls as I had never heard, not even in the worst of nightmares. I had a momentary vision of red mouths and gleaming teeth and shaggy gray-white fur advancing toward me in a whirlwind rush. Then, "'Give fire!' de Grandin shouted. And now the wolf pack's savage battle cry was drowned out by another roar, as de Grandin, Ingram, and Renoir, back touching back, turned loose the venom of their submachine guns. Young Davison and I too opened fire with our shotguns, not taking aim but pumping the mechanisms frenziedly and firing point-blank into the faces of the charging wolves. How long the battle lasted I have no idea, but I remember that at last I felt de Grandin's hand upon my arm and heard him shouting in my ear, "'Cease firing, friend Trowbridge! There is no longer anything to shoot! Parbleu! If wolves have souls, I damn think hell is full with them tonight.' Twenty two. The Crimson Clue. He turned abruptly to Renoir. Allez au feu, mon brave, he cried. Pour la partie. We charged across the intervening patch of snow filled clearing, and more than once de Grandin, or Renoir, or Ingram paused in his stride to spray the windows of the tumble down old house with a stream of lead. But not a shot replied nor was there any sign of life as we approached the doorless doorway. "'Easy on,' Ingram counseled. "'There may be lion doggo waiting for a chance. "'But no,' de Grandin interrupted. "'Had that been so, they surely would not have missed the chance to shoot us to death a moment ago. "'We were a perfectly defined target against the snow, and they had the advantage of cover. "'Still, a milligram of caution is worth a double quintal of remorse.' So let us step warily. Renoir and I will take the lead. Friend Trowbridge, you and friend Jean walk behind us and flash your searchlights forward, and well above our heads. That way, if we are ambushed, they will shoot high and give us opportunity to return their fire. Friend Hiji, do you bring up the rear and keep your eyes upon the ground which we have traversed? Should you see aught which looks suspicious, shoot first and make investigation afterward. I do not wish that we should die tonight. Accordingly, in this close formation, we searched the old house from its musty cellar to its drafty attic, but nowhere was there any hint of life or recent occupancy, until, as we forced back the sagging door which barred the entrance to the old grain bins, we noted the faint, half-tangible aroma of Narcisse Noir. Alice! John Davison exclaimed. She's been here. I recognize the scent. Mm, de Grandin murmured thoughtfully. Advance your light a trifle nearer, if you please, friend Trowbridge. I played the flashlight on the age-bleached casing of the door. There, fresh against the wood's flat surface, were three small pits arranged triangularly. A second group of holes, similarly spaced, were in the hand-hewn planking of the door, exactly opposite those which scarred the jam. Screw holes, de Grandin commented, and on the outer side. You are correct, friend Jean. Your nose and heart spoke truly. This place has been the prison of your love. Here are the marks where they made fast the lock and hasp to hold her prisoner. But alas, the bird is flown, the cage deserted. Painstakingly, as a paleographer might scan a palimpsest, he searched the little wood-walled cubicle flashing his searchlight's darting ray on each square inch of aged planking. Ah, uh, huh? he asked of no one in particular as the flashlight struck into a corner, revealing several tiny smears of scarlet on the floor. Mobleu, blood, Renoir exclaimed. Can it be that... De Grandin threw himself full length upon the floor, his little round blue eyes a scant three inches from the row of crimson stains. Blood? No, he answered as he finished his examination. It is the mark of pomade pour les lèvres, and unless I do mistake— You mean lipstick? I interrupted. What in the world? Zut! 
he cut me short. You speak too much, my friend. To Davison? See here, friend Jean, is not some system of design in this, is it not? Of course it is, the young man answered sharply. It's another telegraphic message, like the one she sent us in the letter. Can't you see? Dash, dash, dot, dash, dot, 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 dash, dash, dot. He read through the code quickly. De Grandin looked at him with upraised brows. Exactement, he nodded. And that means? M-A-C-A-N-D-R-E-W-S-S-I-E. Davison spelled the message out, then paused, shook his head in puzzlement, and once again essayed the task. I can't get any sense from it, he finally confessed. That's what it spells, no doubt of it, but what the devil— I say, old chap, go over it once more, asked Ingram. I may be blotto, but— Crash! The thunderous detonation shook the floor beneath us, and a heavy beam came hurtling from the ceiling— "'followed by a cataract of splintered planks and rubble. "'Crash! "'A second fulmination smashed the wooded wall upon our right, "'and a mass of shattered brick and timber poured into the room. "'Bombe d'air!' Renoir cried wildly. "'Down! "'Down, my friends! "'It is the only way to—' "'His warning ended in a choking grunt "'as a third explosion ripped the cover off our hiding place "'and a blinding pom-pom of live flame flashed in our eyes. I felt myself hurled bodily against the farther wall, felt the crushing impact as I struck the mortised planks, and then I felt no more. Trowbridge, my friend, my good brave comrade, do you survive? Have you been killed to death? More do you say that you live, my old one? I heard de Grandin's voice calling from immeasurable distance, and slowly realized he held my head upon his shoulder, while with frantic hands he rubbed snow on my brow. Oh, I'm all right, I guess, I answered weakly, then sank again in comforting oblivion. When next I struggled back to consciousness, I found myself on my own surgery table, de Grandin busy with a phial of smelling salts, a glass of aromatic spirit on the table and a half-filled tumbler of cognac next to it. "'Thanks be to God you are yourself once more,' he exclaimed fervently, handed me the water and ammonia, and drained the brandy-glass himself. "'Pardieu, my friend, I thought that we should surely lose you,' he continued as he helped me to a chair. "'You had a close squeak, no doubt of it,' Ingram agreed. "'What happened?' I demanded weakly. De Grandin fairly ground his teeth in rage. They made a foolishness of us, he told me. While we were busy with their sacre wolves, they must have been escaping, and the thunder of our guns drowned out the whirring of their motors. Then, when we were all safe and helpless in the house, they circled back and dropped the hand grenades upon us. Luckily for us, they had no aerial torpedoes, or we should now be practicing upon the harp. As it is... He raised his shoulders in a shrug. B -b "'But you mean they had a plane?' I asked, amazed. Ha, "'I shall say as much,' he answered. "'Nor did they stop to say a by your leave when they obtained it. "'This very night, an hour or so before we journeyed to that thirty thousand times accursed mill of Monsieur Jones, two men descended suddenly upon the hangars at New Bristol. "'A splendid new amphibian lay in the bay,' all ready to be drawn into a shed. The people at the airport are much surprised to see her suddenly take flight, but aviators are all crazy, else they would remain on land, and who shall say what form their latest madness takes. It was some little time before the truth was learned. Then it was too late. Stretched cold upon the runway of the hangar, they found the pilot and his mechanician. Both were shot dead. Yet not a shot was heard. The miscreants had used silencers upon their guns, no doubt. Tiens, at any rate, they had not stopped at murder, and they had made off with the plane, had landed it upon the frozen mill-pond, then sailed away. Almost, but not quite, thank God, leaving us as dead as we had left their guardian wolves. Alas, and we shall never overtake them, Renoir said mournfully. It is too obvious— 
They chose the amphibian plane that they might put to sea and be picked up by some ship which waited. And where they may be gone, we cannot say. There is no way of telling, for... Hold hard, old thing. I think perhaps there is. The Englishman broke in. When Trowbridge toppled over, it knocked the thought out of my head. But I've an idea we may trace them. I'll pop off to the cable office and send a little tracer out. We ought to get some solid information by tomorrow. We were still at breakfast the next morning when the young man from the cable office came. Is Mr. Ingraham here? he asked. Don't say it like that, young fellow, my lad. It's Ingram. In as in inside, and Gram as in biscuit, you know. Returned the Englishman with a grin as he held out his hand for the message. Hastily he read it to himself, then aloud to us. No strangers seeking access to the bush through here, but French report a hundred turned back from Conakry, stop. Unprecedented number of arrivals at Monrovia, stop. Investigation underway. Sims, superintendent. Très bon, de Grandin nodded. Now, if you will have the goodness to translate. He paused with brows raised interrogatively. Nothing simpler, old thing, the Englishman responded. You see, it was like this. Way up in the back country of Sierra Leone, so near the boundary line of French Guinea that the French think it's British territory, and the British think it's French, an old goop named MacAndrews got permission to go digging some twenty years ago. He was a dure old Scotsman, mad as a dingo dog, they say, but a first-rate archaeologist. There were some old Roman ruins near the border, and this Johnny had the idea he'd turn up something never in the books if he kept at it long enough. So he built a pucker camp and settled down to clear the jungle off. But fever beat his schedule, and they planted the old cove in one of his own trenches. That ended old Max digging, but his camp's still there. I passed it less than five years ago, and stopped there overnight. The natives say the old man's ghost hangs around the place, and shun it like the plague. Haven't even stolen anything. Ah? Huh? de Grandin murmured. And? Oh, quiet, old dear. A big and. That's what got the massive intellect working, don't you know? There's a big natural clearing near MacAndrews and a pretty fair-sized river. The place is so far inland, nobody ever goes there unless he has to. And news, white man's news, I mean, is blessed slow getting to the coast. Could anything be sweeter for our Russian friend's jamboree? Iraq is under British rule today, and any nonsense in that neighbourhood would bring the police sniffing around. The Frenchmen in Arabia don't stand much foolishness, so any convocation of the devil worshippers is vetoed in advance, so far as that locality is concerned. But what about MacAndrews? They could plant and harvest the finest crop of merry young hell you ever saw out there, and no one be the wiser. But they've got to get there. That's the blighted difficulty, my lad. Look here. He drew a pencil and notebook from his pocket and blocked out a rough map. Here's Sierra Leone. Here's French Guinea. Here's Liberia. Get it? Our people in Freetown have to be convinced there's some good reason why, before they'll pass a stranger to the bush country. So do the French. But Liberia, any man, black, white, yellow or mixed, who lands there with real money in his hand, can get unlimited concessions to go hunting in the back country, and no questions asked. There you are, old bean. When Davison decoded that message on the floor last night, it hit me like a brick. The gal has told us where she was in the letter. Now she takes a chance we'll go to Jones Mill and starts to write a message on the floor. They've talked before her, and she takes her lipstick and starts to write her destination down. MacAndrews, Sierra Leone. But only gets MacAndrews and the first three letters of Sierra down when they come for her and she has to stop. That's the way I figured it. It's great to have a brain like mine. Now, if they've really picked MacAndrew's old camp for their party, there will be a gathering of the clans out there, and the visitors will have to come overland or enter through Freetown, one of the French ports, or Liberia. That's reason in old top. So I cabled Freetown to see if anyone's been trying to bootleg himself through the lines, or if there'd been much sudden immigration through the French ports. You have the answer. All these coves will have to do is strike cross-country through the bush and... And we shall apprehend them, Renoir exclaimed delightedly. Right-o, dear sir, and fellow policeman. 
the Englishman returned. I'm booking passage for West Africa this morning, and book two, Renoir cut in. This excavation of Monsieur MacAndrews, it is near the border. Me? I shall be present, with a company of Senegalese gendarmes, and— And with me, pardieu, am I to have no pleasure? broke in Jules de Grandin. Me too, John Davison asserted. If they've got Alice, I must be there too. You might as well book passage for five, I finished. I've been with you so far, and I'd like to see the finish of this business. Besides, I owe them something for that bomb they dropped on me last night. 23. Pursuit There was no scarcity of offered labor when we debarked at Monrovia. A shouting, sweating, jostling throng of black boys crowded round us, each member of the crowd urging his own peculiar excellence as a baggage carrier in no uncertain terms. Foremost, and most vocal, was a young man in long and much soiled nightgown, red slippers, and very greasy tarbouche. "'Carry luggage, sir. Carry him good. Not trust dam bush nigger. he asseverated worming with serpentine agility through the pressing crowd of volunteers and plucking Ingram's sleeve solicitously. "'Right, carry on, young fella,' the Englishman returned, kicking his kit toward the candidate for partnership. "'Hey, ah, this way, grab master's duffel,' the favoured one called out, and from the crowd some half-dozen nondescript individuals sprang forward, shouldered our gear, and, led by the man Ingram had engaged, preceded us at a shuffling jog-trot up the winding street toward the apology for a hotel. Evidently Ingram was familiar with conventions, for when we had arrived at our hotel he made no effort to distribute largesse among the porters, but beckoned to the headman to remain in our room, while the remainder of the gang dispersed themselves in such shade as offered in the street outside, awaiting the emergence of their leader. The moment the door closed, a startling transformation came over our chief porter. The stooping, careless bearing which marked his every moment fell from him like a cloak. His shoulders straightened back, his chin went up, and heels clicked together. He stood erectly at attention before Ingram. "'Sergeant Bendigo reporting, sir,' he announced. "'At ease,' commanded Ingram. "'Then, did you go out there?' "'Yes, Ohiji, even as you ordered, so I did.' Up to the place where all of the great waters break in little streams I went, and there at the old camp where ghosts and jinn and devils haunt the night, I found the tribesmen making poro. Also, O oh Hiji, I think the little leopards are at large again, for in the night I heard their drums, and once I saw them dancing round a fire, while something, wah, an unclean thing, I think, stood within their pots. Also I heard the leopards scream, but when I looked I saw no beast, only three black feller walking through a jungle path. Hm? Any white men there? demanded Ingram. Plenty lot, sir. No jolly end. Plenty much white feller. Also other feller with dark skin, not white like Englishman or French, not black like bush boy or brown like Leone, but funny looking feller. Some yellow, some brown, some white but dark and big-nosed, like Jewish trading man. Some, I think, are Hindus, like I see sometime in Freetown. They come trekking long time through the jungle from Monrovia, ten, twenty, maybe thirty at once, with Liberian bush boys for guide, and— All right, get on with it, Ingram prompted sharply. Then make killing palava, Hiji, the young man told him earnestly. Those bush boys come as guides. But they not return. They start for home, but something happen. I saw one speared from ambush. I think those white men put bad thoughts in bushmen's heads. Very, very bad palaver, sir. What's doing up at MacAndrews? Whew! Bush nigger from all parts of the forest work like slaves. Old time they dig and chop. Clear off the jungle. Dig up old stones where ghosts are buried. I think there will be trouble there. No doubt of it, the Englishman concurred. Then, tell me, O oh sergeant man, was there among these strangers some one woman of uncommon beauty whom they guarded carefully, as though a prisoner, 
yet with reverence as though a queen. Allah! exclaimed the sergeant, rolling up his eyes ecstatically. Never mind the religious exercises. Did you see the woman? Wah, a woman, truly, Hiji, but a woman surely such as never was before. Her face is like the moon that evening, her walk like that of the gazelle, and from her lips drips almond honey. Her voice is like the dripping of the rain in thirsty places, and her eyes, bismillah, when she weeps, the tears are sapphires. She has the first bloom of the lotus on her cheek, and... Give over, you've been reading Hafiz or Eleanor Glynn, young fella. Who's the leader of this mob? Voila! Sergeant Bendigo passed his fingers vertically across his lips and spat upon the floor. He is called Bazari Hiji, and verily he is the twin of Satan, the stoned and the rejected. A face which the old and wrinkled monkey might well be ashamed is his, with great sad eyes that never change their look, whatever they behold. Wah, in Allah's glorious name I take refuge from the rejected one. All right, all right, take refuge all you please, but get on with your report. Ingram cut in testily. You say he has the natives organized? Like the blades of grass that come forth in the early rains, Ohiji. Their spears are numerous as the great trees of the forest, and everywhere they range the woods lest strangers come upon them. They killed two members of the Mendi who came upon them unawares, and I was forced to sleep in trees like any of the monkey people, for to be caught near Macandrews is to enter into paradise and the cooking pot. Eh? The devil, they're practicing cannibalism? Thou sayest. Who? The white man of the evil wrinkled face, he whom they call Bazari. He has appointed it. Also he gives them much trade gin. I think there will be shooting before long. Spears will fly as thick as gnats about the carcass, high, and bullets too. The little guns which stutter will laugh the laugh of death, and the bayonets will go boom as we drive them home to make those damn bushfellers know our lord the emperor king is master still. Right you are, the Englishman returned and there was something far from pleasant at the corners of his mouth as he smiled at Sergeant Bendigo. Gentlemen, he turned to us, this is my sergeant and my right-hand man. We can accept all that he tells us as the truth. Sergeant, these men come from far away to help us hunt this evil man of whom you tell me. The sergeant drew himself erect again and tendered us a grave salute. His slightly flaring nostrils and smooth brown skin announced his negroid heritage, but the thin-lipped mouth, the straight sleek hair, and finely modelled hands and feet were pure Arab, while the gleaming piercing eyes and quick cruel smile were equally pure devil. De Grandin knew him for a kindred spirit instantly. Tiens, mon brave, it is a fine thing you have done, this discovering of their devil's nest he complimented, as he raised his hand in answer to the sergeant's military courtesy. You think we yet shall come to grips with them? Bendigo's eyes shone with anticipation and delight. His white teeth flashed between his back-drawn lips. May Allah spare me till that day, he answered. It was a born killer speaking, a man who took as aptly to the deadly risks of police work as ever duckling took to water. Very well, Sergeant, Ingram ordered. Take the squad and hook it for Freetown as fast as you can. We'll be along in a few days. Bendigo saluted again, executed a perfect about-face, and marched to the door. Once in the hotel corridor, he dropped his military bearing and slouched into the sunshine where his confrères waited. Stout fellow, that, Ingram remarked. I sent him a wire to go native and pop up to MacAndrews and nose round then follow the trail overland to Monrovia, picking up what information he could en route. It's a holy certainty nothing happened on the way he didn't see, too. But isn't there a chance some of that gang he called to help him with our luggage may give the show away? I asked. They didn't seem any too choice a crowd to me. Ingram smiled a trifle bleakly. I hardly think so, he replied. You see, they're all members of Bendigo's platoon. He brought him here to help him carry on. De Grandin and Renoir went on to Dakar, 
while Ingram, John Davison, and I took a packet north to Freetown. Our expedition quickly formed. A hundred frontier policemen with guns and bayonets, five Lewis guns in charge of expert operators, with Ingram and Bendigo in command, set out in a small wood-burning steamer toward Falaba. We halted overnight at the old fortress town, camping underneath the loopholed walls, then struck out overland toward the French border. The rains had not commenced, nor would they for a month or so, and the Narmatan, the ceaseless northwest wind blowing up from the Sahara, swept across the land like a steady draft from a boiler room. The heat was bad, the humidity worse. It was like walking through a superheated hothouse as we beat our way along the jungle trails, now marching through comparatively clear forest, now hacking at the trailing undergrowth, or pausing at the mud bank of some sluggish stream to force a passage, while our native porters beat the turbid water with sticks to keep the crocodiles at a respectful distance. We're almost there, Ingram announced one evening as we sat before his tent, imbibing whiskey mixed with tepid water. And I don't like the look of things a bit. How's that? I asked. It seems extremely quiet to me. We've scarcely seen... That's it! We haven't seen a blooming thing, or heard one either. Normally these woods are crawling with natives, Timni or Sulima, even if the beastly Mendy don't show up. This trip we've scarcely seen a one. Not only that, they should be gossiping on the locale, the jungle telegraph drum, you know, telling the neighbours miles away that we're heading north by east, but damn it, I don't like it. Oh, you're getting nerves, Davison told him with a laugh. I'm going to turn in. Good night. Ingram watched him moodily as he walked across the little clearing to his tent beneath an oil palm tree. Silly ass, he muttered. If he knew this country as I do, he'd be singing a different sort of chanty. Nerves, good lord. He reached inside his open tunic for tobacco pouch and pipe, but stiffened suddenly, like a pointer coming on a covey of quail. Next instant he was on his feet, the browning flashing from the holster strapped against his leg, and a savage spurt of flame stabbed through the darkness. Like a prolongation of the pistol's roar, there came a high-pitched screaming cry, and something big and black and bulky crashed through the palm tree's fronds, hurtling to the earth right in Davison's path. We raced across the clearing, and Ingram stooped and struck a match. Nerves, eh? he asked sarcastically, as the little spot of orange flame disclosed a giant native, smeared with oil and naked save for a narrow belt of leopard hide bound round his waist, and another band of spotted fur wound round his temples. On each hand he wore a glove of leopard skin, and fixed to every finger was a long hooked claw of sharpened iron. One blow from those spiked gloves and anyone sustaining it would have had the flesh ripped from his bones. Nerves, eh? the Englishman repeated. Jolly good thing for you I had em, young fellow, my lad, and that I saw this beggar crouching in the tree. The devil, you would, eh? The inert native, bleeding from a bullet in his thigh, had regained the breath the tumble from the tree had knocked from him, raised on his elbow and struck a slashing blow at Ingram's legs. The Englishman swung his pistol barrel with crushing force upon the native's head. Then, as Bendigo and half a dozen houses hurried up, O oh, sergeant man, prepare a harness for this beast, and keep him safely till his spirit has returned. The sergeant saluted, and in a moment the prisoner was securely trussed with cords. Some twenty minutes later Bendigo stood at Ingram's tent, a light of pleased anticipation shining in his eyes. Prisoner's spirit has come back, O oh, Hiji, he reported. Good. Bring him here. I see you, leopard man. He opened the examination when they brought the fettered captive to us. The prisoner eyed him sullenly, but volunteered no answer. Who sent you through the woods to do this evil thing? Ingram pursued. The leopard hates and kills. He does not talk, the man replied. Oko, the Englishman returned grimly. I think this leopard will talk, and be jolly glad to. Sergeant, build a fire. 
Sergeant Bendigo had evidently anticipated this, for dry sticks and kindling were produced with a celerity nothing short of marvellous. I hate to do this, Trowbridge, Ingram told me, but I've got to get the truth out of this blighter and get it in a hurry. Go to your tent if you think you can't stand it. The captive howled and beat his head against the earth and writhed as though he were an eel upon the barbs when they thrust his bare soles into the glowing embers. But not until the stench of burning flesh rose sickeningly upon the still night air did he shake his head from side to side in token of surrender. Now then, who sent you? Ingram demanded when the prisoner's blistered feet were thrust into a canvas bucket full of water. Speak up and speak the truth, or— He nodded toward the fire, which smoldered menacingly, as a house a policeman fed it little bits of broken sticks to keep it ready for fresh service. You are Hiji, said the prisoner, as though announcing that the sun had ceased to shine and the rivers ceased to flow. You are he who comes when no man thinks him near. They told us you were gone away across the mighty water. Who told you this great lie, O oh fool? Bazari. He came with other white men through the woods and told us you were fled and that the soldiers of the Emperor King would trouble us no more. They said the leopard men should rule the land again and no one bid us stop. What were you doing here, son of a fish? Last moon, Bazari sent us forth in search of slaves. Much help is needed for this digging which he makes, for he prepares a mighty pit where... In a night and a night, they celebrate the marriage of a mortal woman to the king of all the devils. My brethren took the prisoners back, but I, and as many others as a man has eyes, remained behind to... to stage a little private cannibalism, eh? They told us that the soldiers would not come this way again, the prisoner answered in excuse. Ingram smiled, but not pleasantly. That's the explanation, eh? he murmured to himself. No wonder we haven't seen or heard anything of the villagers. These damned slavers have taken most of them up to MacAndrews, and those they didn't kill or capture are hiding in the bush. To the prisoner, Is this Bizarre a white man with the body of a youth and the wrinkled face of an old monkey? Lord, who can say how you should know this thing? Does he know that I'm coming with my soldiers to send him to the land of ghosts? Lord, he does not know. He thinks that you have gone across the great water. If he knew you were here, he would have gone against you with his guns, and with the leopard men to kill you while you slept. The Emperor King's men never sleep, retorted Ingram. To Bendigo, a firing party for this one, Sergeant. The palaver is over. We must break camp at once he added as eight tarbushed policemen marched smartly past, their rifles at slant arms. You heard what he said. They're all set to celebrate that girl's marriage to the devil in two more nights. We can just make it to MacAndrews by a forced march. Can't you spare this poor fellow's life? I pleaded. You've gotten what you want from him, and no chance, he told me shortly. The penalty for membership in these leopard societies is death— so is the punishment for slaving and cannibalism. If it ever got about that we'd caught one of the little leopards red-handed and let him off, government authority would get an awful black eye. He buttoned his blouse, put on his helmet, and marched across the clearing. Detail, halt! Front rank! Kneel! Ready! Take aim! Fire! His orders rang in sharp staccato, and the prisoner toppled over, eight rifle bullets in his breast. Calmly as though it were a bit of everyday routine, Sergeant Bendigo advanced, drew his pistol, and fired a bullet in the prone man's ear. The head, still bound in its fillet of leopard skin, bounced upward with the impact of the shot, then fell back flaccidly. The job was done. Dig a grave and pile some rocks on it, then cover it with ashes from the fire, Ingram ordered. To me, he added, can't afford to have hyenas unearthen him or vultures wheeling round, you know. It would give the show away. If any of his little playmates found him and saw the bullet marks, they might make tracks for MacAndrews, and we want to get there first. We broke camp in half an hour, 
pushed onward through the night and marched until our legs were merely so much aching muscles the next day. Six hours rest, then again the endless, hurrying march. Twice we saw evidence of the leopards' visits, deserted villages where blackened rings marked the site of burned huts, red stains upon the earth. "'vultures disputing over ghastly scraps of flesh and bone. "'As we passed through the second village, "'the scouts brought back a woman, "'a slender, frightened girl of fifteen or so, "'with a face which might have been a gorgon's, "'and a figure fit to make a Broadway entrepreneur "'discharge his entire chorus in disgust. "'Thou art my father and my mother,' "'she greeted Ingram conventionally. "'Where are thy people?' he demanded. In the land of ghosts, Lord, she replied. A day and a day ago, there came to us the servants of Bazari, men of the little leopards, with iron claws upon their hands and white men's guns. They said to us, The Emperor King is overthrown. No longer shall his soldiers bring the law to you. Come with us and serve Bazari, who is the servant of the great king of all devils, and we shall make you rich. This is bad palaver, and when Hiji comes he will hang you to a tree, my father told them. Hiji is gone across the great water, and will never come here more, they told my father. Then they killed many of my people, and some they took as slaves to serve Bazari, where the king of devils makes a marriage with a mortal woman. Lord, hadst thou been here three days ago, my father had not died. Maiden? Ingram answered. Go tell thy people to come again into their village and build the huts the evil men burnt down. Behold, I and my soldiers travel swiftly to give punishment to these evil men. Some I shall hang, and some my men will shoot, but surely I shall slay them all. Those who defy the Emperor King's commands have not long lives. The sudden tropic dark had long since fallen and it was almost midnight by the hands on Ingram's luminous watch-dial when we reached the edge of a large clearing with a sharply rising hill upon its farther side. From behind this elevation shone a ruddy light, as though a dozen wooden houses burned at once. Quiet! Thirty lashes for the one who makes a sound, said Ingram as we halted at the forest edge. Get those Lewis guns ready. Fix bayonets. Sergeant, take two men and go forward. If anyone accosts you, shoot him down immediately. We'll charge the moment we hear a shot. Twenty minutes, half an hour, three quarters, passed. Still no warning shot, no sign of Sergeant Bendigo or his associates. By the Lord Harry, I'm half a mind to chance it, Ingram muttered. They may have done Bendigo in, and— No, sir, Bendigo is here. A whisper answered him, and a form rose suddenly before us. Bendigo has drunk the broth of serpent's flesh, and he can move through the dark and not be seen. I'll say he can, the Englishman agreed. What's doing? No end, damn swanky palaver over there, returned the sergeant. Many people sit around like elders at the council and watch while others make some show before them. I think we'd better go there pretty soon. So do I returned his officer. Attention! Charge bayonets! No shooting till I give the word. Quick step! March! We passed across the intervening clearing, mounted the steep slope of grassy bank, and halted at the ridge. Before us, like a stage, was such a sight as I had never dreamed of, even in my wildest flights of fancy. 24. The Devil's Bride "'Great guns!' Ingram exclaimed as we threw ourselves upon our stomachs and wriggled to the crown of the hill. "'Old MacAndrews knew a thing or two, dotty as he was. Look at that masonry! Perfect as it was when Augustus Caesar ruled the world. The old Scotsman would have had the laugh on all of them, if he'd only lived. What I had thought a long, steep-sided natural hill was really the nearer of two parallel earthen ramparts, and between these, roughly oval in form, a deep excavation had been made, disclosing tier on tier of ancient stone benches rising terrace-like about an amphitheatre. Behind these were retaining walls of mortised stone, obviously the well-preserved remains of a Roman circus. 
The area between the curving ranks of benches was paved with shining sand, washed and rewashed until it shone with almost dazzling whiteness, and the whole enclosure was aglow with ruddy light, for stretching in an oval round the sanded floor was set a line of oil palms, each blazing furiously, throwing tongues of orange flame high in the air, and making every object in the excavation visible as though illumined by the midday sun. The leaping, crackling flames disclosed the tenants of the benches, row after row of red-robed figures, hoods drawn well forward on their faces, hands hidden in the loose sleeves of their gown, but every one intent upon the spectacle below, heads bent, each line of their voluminously robed bodies instinct with eagerness and gloating, half-restrained anticipation. The circus proper was some hundred yards in length by half as many wide. Almost beneath us crouched a group of black musicians, who, even as we looked, began a thumping monody on their double-headed drums, beating a sort of slow adagio with one hand, a fierce staccato syncopation with the other. The double-timed insistence of it mounted to my head like some accursed drug, Despite myself, I felt my hands and feet twitching to the rhythm of those drums, a sort of tingling racing up my spine. The red-robed figures on the benches were responding, too, heads swaying, hands no longer hidden in their sleeves, but striking together softly, as if in acclamation of the drummer's skill. At the arena's farther end, where the double line of benches broke, was hung a long red curtain blazoned with the silver image of the strutting peacock, and from behind the folds of the thick drapery we saw that some activity was toward, for the carmine cloth would swing in rippling folds from time to time, as though invisible hands were clutching it. Now I wonder what the deuce, Ingram began, but stopped abruptly as the curtain slowly parted, and into the firelight marched a figure. From neck to heels he was enveloped in a robe of shimmering scarlet silk, Thick sewn with glistening gems worked in the image of a peacock. Upon his head he wore a beehive-shaped turban of red silk set off with a great medallion of emeralds. One look identified him. Though we had seen him suffer death in the electric chair, and later looked upon him lying in his casket, there was no doubt in either of our minds. The oriental potentate who paced the shining sands before us was Grigor Bazarov the red priest who officiated at the mass of St. Sequaire. Beside him, to his right and left, and slightly to the rear, marched the men who acted as deacon and subdeacon when he served the altar of the devil. But now they were arrayed in costumes almost as gorgeous as their chiefs, turbans of mixed red and black upon their heads, brooches of red stones adorning them, curved swords flashing in jeweled scabbards at their waists. Attended by his satellites, the red priest made the circuit of the Colosseum, and as he passed, the red-robed figures on the benches arose and did him reverence. Now he and his attendants took station before the squatting drummers, and as he raised his hand in signal, the curtains at the arena's farther end were parted once again, and from them came a woman, tall, fair-haired, purple-eyed, enveloped in a loose-draped cloak of gleaming cloth of gold. A moment she paused breathlessly upon the margin of the shining sand, and as she waited, two tall black women, stark naked save for gold bands about their wrists and ankles, stepped quickly forward from the curtain's shrouding folds, grasped the golden cloak which clothed her and lifted it away, so that she stood revealed nude as her two serving-maids, her white and lissom body gleaming in sharp contrast to their black forms, as an ivory figurine might shine beside two statuettes of ebony. A single quick glance told us she was crazed with aphrodisiacs and the never-pausing rhythm of the drums. With a wild, abandoned gesture, she threw back her mop of yellow hair, tossed her arms above her head, and, bending nearly double, raced across the sands until she paused a moment by the drummers. Her body stretched as though upon a rack as she rose on tiptoe and reached her hands up to the moonless sky. Then the dance. As thin as nearly fleshless bones could make her, her figure still was slight rather than emaciated, and as she bent and twisted, 
writhed and whirled, then stood stock still and rolled her narrow hips and straight flat abdomen. I felt the hot blood mounting in my cheeks, and the pulses beating in my temples in time with the insistent throbbing of the drums. Pose after pose, instinct with lecherous promise, melted into still more lustful postures, as patterns change their forms upon the lens of a kaleidoscope. Now a vocal chorus seconded the music of the tom-toms. Ho, ho, hola, ho, ho, hola, tu bonia berbe, azid. The red priest and the congregation repeated the lines endlessly, striking their hands together at the ending of each stanza. Good God, Ingram muttered in my ear. Do you get it, Trowbridge? No, I whispered back. What is it? To bone your bear bear means thou hast become a lamb of the devil. It's the invocation which precedes a human sacrifice. B but, I faltered, only to have the words die upon my tongue, for the red priest stepped forward, unsheathing the scimitar from the jeweled scabbard at his waist. He tendered it to her, blade foremost, and I winced involuntarily as I saw her take the steel in her bare hand, and saw the blood spurt like a ruby dye between her fingers as the razor edge bit through the soft flesh to the bone. But in her wild delirium she was insensible to pain. The curved sword whirled like darting lightning round her head, circling and flashing in the burning palm tree's light till it made a silver halo for her golden hair. Then— it all occurred so quickly that I scarcely knew what happened till the act was done. The wildly whirling blade reversed its course, struck inward suddenly, and passed across her slender throat, its superfine edge propelled so fiercely by her maddened hand that she was virtually decapitated. The rhythm of the drums increased, the flying fingers of the drummers increased, the flying fingers of the drummers beating a continuous roar which filled the sultry night like thunder, and the red-robed congregation rose like one individual bellowing wild approval at the suicide. The dancer tripped and stumbled in her corybantic measure, a spate of ruby lifeblood cataracting down her snowy bosom, wheeled round upon her toes a turn or two, then toppled to the sand. Her hands and feet and body twitching with a tremor like the jerking of a victim of St. Vitus' dance. She raised herself upon her elbows and tried to call aloud, but the gushing blood drowned out her voice. Then she fell forward on her face and lay prostrate in the sand, her dying heart still pumping spurts of blood from her severed veins and arteries. The sharp involuntary twitching of the victim ceased and with it stopped the gleeful rumble of the drums. The red priest raised his hand as if in invocation. That the bride of Lucifer may tread across warm blood, he told the congregation in a booming voice, then pointed to the crimson pool which dyed the snowy sand before the trailing scarlet curtain. The two black women who had taken off her cloak approached the quivering body of the self-slain girl lifted it, one by the shoulders, the other by the feet, and bore it back behind the scarlet curtain, their progress followed by a trail of ruddy drops which trickled from the dead girl's severed throat at every step they took. Majestically the red priest drew his scarlet mantle round him, waved to the drummers to precede him, then, followed by his acolytes, passed through the long red curtains in the wake of the victim and the bearers of the dead. A whispering buzz a sort of estrus of anticipation, ran through the red-robed congregation as the archpriest vanished, but the clanging brazen booming of a bell cut the sibilation short. Clang! A file of naked blacks marched out in the arena, each carrying a sort of tray slung from a strap about his shoulders, odd gourd-like pendants hanging from the board. Each held a short stave with a leather-padded head in either hand, and with a start of horror I recognized the things. Trust a physician of forty years' experience to know a human thigh-bone when he sees it. Clang! The black men squatted on the glittering firelit sand, and without a signal of any sort that we could see, began to hammer on the little tables resting on their knees. The things were crude marimbas, primitive xylophones with hollow gourds hung under them for resonators, and, incredible as it seemed, 
produced a music strangely like the reading of an organ. A long resounding chord, so cleverly sustained that it simulated the great swelling of a bank of pipes. Then, slowly, majestically, there boomed forth within that ancient Roman amphitheater the bridal chorus from Lohengrin. Clang! Unseen hands put back the scarlet curtain which had screened the red priest's exit. There, reared against the amphitheater's granite wall, was a cathedral altar, ablaze with glittering candles. Arranged behind the altar like a reredos was a giant figure, an archangelic figure with great outspread wings, but with the lone bearded face of a leering demon, goat's horns protruding from its brow. The crucifix upon the altar was reversed, and beneath its downturned head stretched the scarlet mattress which I knew would later hold a human altar cloth. To right and left were small side altars, like sanctuaries raised to saints in Christian churches. That to the right bore the hideous figure of a man in ancient costume with the head of a rhinoceros. I had seen its counterpart in a museum. It was the figure of the evil one of olden Egypt, Set the slayer of Osiris. Upon the left was raised an altar to an obscene idol carved of some black stone, a female figure, gnarled and knotted and articulated in a manner suggesting horrible deformity. From the shoulder sockets three arms sprang out to right and left, a sort of pointed cap adorned the head, and about the pendulous breasts serpents twined and writhed, while a girdle of gleaming skulls carved of white bone encircled the waist. Otherwise it was nude, with a nakedness which seemed obscene even to me, a medical practitioner for whom the human body held no secrets. Kali, the six-armed one of horrid form, goddess of the murderous thags of India, I knew the thing to be. Clang! The bell beat out its twelfth and final stroke, and from an opening in the wall directly under us a slow procession came. First walked the crucifer, the corpus of his cross head downward, a peacock's effigy perched atop the rood. Then, two by two, ten acolytes with swinging censers, the fumes of which swirled slowly through the air in writhing clouds of heady, maddening perfume. Next marched a robed and surpliced man who swung a tinkling, sacring bell, and then beneath a canopy of scarlet silk embossed with gold the red priest came, arrayed in full ecclesiastical regalia. Close in his footsteps marched his servers, vested as deacon and subdeacon, and after them a double file of women votaries arrayed in red long veils of crimson net upon their heads, hands crossed demurely on their bosoms. Slowly the procession passed between the rows of blazing palm trees, deployed before the altar and formed in crescent shape, the red priest and his acolytes in the center. A moment's pause in the marimba music. Then the red priest raised his hand, palm forward as if in salutation, and chanted solemnly, To the gods of Egypt who are devils, to the gods of Babylon in nether darkness, to all the gods of all forgotten people, who rest not, but lust eternally. Hail! Turning to the rhinoceros-headed monster on the right, he bowed respectfully and called, Hail thee who are doubly evil, who comest forth from Ati, who proceedest from the lake of Nefer, who comest from the courts of Sechet. Hail! To the left he turned and invoked the female horror. Hail, Kali, daughter of Himavat! Hail, thou about whose waist hang human skulls! Hail, Devi of horrid form, malign image of destructiveness, eater up of all that it is good, disseminator of all which is wicked! Hail! Finally, looking straight before him, he raised both hands above his head and fairly screamed, And thou, great Baran Sathanas, Azid, Beelzebub, Lucifer, Asmodium, or whatever name thou wishest to be known by, Lucifer, mighty lord of earth, prince of the powers of the air, we give thee praise and adoration, now and ever, mighty master. Hail, all hail, great Lucifer. Hail, all hail. 
All hail, responded the red congregation. Slowly the red priest mounted to the sanctuary. A red nun tore away her habit, rending scarlet silk and cloth as though in very ecstasy of haste, and, nude and gleaming white, climbed quickly up and laid herself upon the scarlet cushion. They set the chalice and the paten on her branded breast, and the red priest genuflected low before the living altar, then turned and, kneeling with his back presented to the sanctuary, crossed himself in reverse with his left hand, and, rising once again, his left hand raised, bestowed a mimic blessing on the congregation. A long and death-still silence followed, a silence so intense that we could hear the hissing of the resin as the palm trees burned. And when a soldier moved uneasily beside me in the grass, the rasping of his tunic buttons on the earth came shrilly to my ears. Now what the deuce? Ingram began, but checked himself and craned his neck to catch a glimpse of what was toward in the arena under us. For as one man, the red-robed congregation had turned to face the tunnel entrance leading to the amphitheater opposite the altar, and a sigh that sounded like the rustling of the autumn wind among the leaves made the circuit of the benches. I could not see the entrance, for the steep sides of the excavation hid it from my view. But in a moment I descried a double row of iridescent peacocks strutting forward, their shining tails erected, their glistening wings lowered, till the quills cut little furrows in the sand. Slowly, pridefully, as though they were aware of their magnificence, the jeweled birds marched across the hippodrome, and in their wake— "'For God's sake!' exclaimed Ingram. "'Good heavens!' I ejaculated. "'Alice!' John Davison's low cry was freighted with stark horror and despairing recognition. It was Alice. Unquestionably it was she. But how completely metamorphosed. A diadem of beaten gold, thick-set with flashing jewels, was clasped about her head. Above the circlet, where dark hair and white skin met at the temples, there grew a pair of horns. They grew. There was no doubt of it for even at that distance I could see the skin fold forward round the bony base of the protuberances. No skillful makeup artist could have glued them to her flesh in such a way. Incredible. Impossible. As I knew it was, it could not be denied. A pair of curving goat horns grew from the girl's head, and reared upward exactly like the horns on carved or painted figures of the devil a collar of gold workmanship, so wide its outer edges rested on her shoulders, was round her neck, and below the gleaming gorget her white flesh shone like ivory. For back, abdomen, and bosom were unclothed, and the nipples of her high-set virgin breasts were stained a brilliant red with henna. About her waist was locked the silver marriage girdle of the Yazidis, the girdle she had worn so laughingly that winter evening long ago, when we assembled at St. Chrysostom's to rehearse her wedding to John Davison. Below the girdle, possibly supported by it, hung a skirt of iridescent sequins, so long that it barely cleared her ankles, so tight that it gave her only four or five scant inches for each pace, so that she walked with slow, painstaking care, lest the fetter of the garment's hem should trip her as she stepped. The skirt trailed backward in a point a foot or so behind her, leaving a little track in the soft sand, as though a serpent had crawled there, and, curiously, giving an oddly serpentine appearance from the rear. Bizarre and sinister as her costume was, the transformation of her face was more so. The slow, half-scornful, half-mocking smile upon her painted mouth, the beckoning, alluring glance which looked out from between her coal-stained eyelids. The whole provocative expression of her countenance was strange to Alice Hume. This was no woman we had ever known, this horned, barbaric figure from the painted walls of Asser. It was some wanton, cruel she-devil who held possession of the body we had known as hers. And so she trod across the shining sand on naked, milk-white feet, the serpent track left by her trailing gown winding behind her like an accusation. And as she walked, she waved her jewel-encrusted hands before her, weaving fantastic arabesques in empty air, as eastern fakirs do when they would lay a charm on the beholder. Hail! 
bride of night, hail, horned bride of mighty Lucifer, hail, thou who comest from the depths of far Abaddon, hail and thrice hail to her who passes over blood and fire, that she may greet her bridegroom, hail, all hail, cried the red priest, and as he finished speaking, from each side the altar rushed a line of red-veiled women, each bearing in her hands a pair of wooden pincers, between the prongs of which there glowed and smouldered a small square of superheated stone. That the rocks were red-hot could not be denied, for we could see the curling smoke and even little licking tongues of flame as the wooden tongs took fire from them. The women laid their fiery burdens down upon the sand, making an incandescent path of glowing stepping-stones some ten feet long, leading directly to the altar's lowest step. And now the strange, barbaric figure with its horn-crowned head had reached the ruddy stain upon the sand, where the dancing suicide had bled her life away, and now her snowy feet were stained a horrid scarlet. But never did she pause in her slithering step. Now she reached the path of burning stones, and now her tender feet were pressed against them. But she neither hastened or retreated in her march. To blood and fire alike she seemed indifferent. Now she reached the altar's bottom step and paused a moment, not in doubt or fear, but rather seeming to debate the easiest way to mount the step's low lift, and yet not trip against the binding hobble of her skirt's tight hem. At length, when one or two false trials had been made, she managed to get up the step by turning sidewise and raising her nearer foot with slow care, transferring her weight to it, then mounting with a sudden hopping jump. Three steps she had negotiated in this slow, awkward fashion when— "'For God's sake, aren't you going to do anything?' John Davison hissed in Ingram's ear. "'She's almost up. Are you going to let him go through with—' "'Sergeant?' Ingram turned to Bendigo, ignoring John completely. "'Are the guns in place?' "'Yes, sir. Everything damn top hole,' the sergeant answered with a grin. "'Very well, then. A hundred yards will be about the proper range.' Ready? The order died upon his lips, and he and I and all of us sat forward, staring in hang-jawed amazement. From the tunnel leading to the ancient dungeons at the back of the arena, a slender figure came, paused a moment at the altar steps, then mounted them in three quick strides. It was Jules de Grandin. He was in spotless khaki, immaculate from linen-covered sun-hat to freshly polished boots. His canvas jacket and abbreviated cotton shorts might just have left the laundress's hands. And from the way he bore his slender silver-headed cane beneath his left elbow, one might have thought that he was ready for a promenade instead of risking almost sure and dreadful death. Pardonnez-moi, messieurs, mesdames. He bowed politely to the company of priests and women at the altar. But this wedding— he cannot go on. No, he must be stopped right away at once. The look upon the red priest's face was almost comical. His big sad eyes were opened till it seemed that they were lidless, and a corpse-gray pallor overspread his wrinkled countenance. Who dares forbid the bans? he asked, recovering his aplomb with difficulty. Parbleu, the little Frenchman answered with a smile. The British Empire and the French Republic for two formidable objectors, and at last, although by no means least, monsieur, no lesser one than Jules de Grandin. Audacious fool, the red priest almost howled. But certainly, de Grandin bowed, as though acknowledging a compliment. L'audace, encore de l'audace, toujours de l'audace, it is I. The devil's bride had reached the topmost step while this colloquy was toward. Absorbed in working herself up to the altar, she had not realized the visitor's identity. Now, standing at the altar, she recognized de Grandin, and her pose of evil provocation dropped from her as if it were a cast-off garment. Doctor! Doctor de Grandin! she gasped unbelievingly, and with a futile, piteous gesture, she clasped her hands across her naked bosom as though to draw a cloak around herself. Précisément, ma pauvre, and I am here to take you home, the little Frenchman answered, and though he looked at her and smiled, 
His little sharp blue eyes were alert to note the smallest movement of the men about the altar. The red priest's voice broke in on them. Wretched Midler, do you imagine that your god can save you now? he asked. He has been known to work much greater miracles, de Grandin answered mildly. Meantime, if you will kindly stand aside, the red priest interrupted in a low-pitched, deadly voice. Before tomorrow's sun has risen, we'll crucify you on that altar, as, as you did crucify the poor young woman in America, de Grandin broke in coldly. I do not think you will, my friend. No? Dimitri, Casimir, seize this cursed dog! The deacon and subdeacon, who had been edging closer all the while, leaped forward at their master's bidding, but the deacon halted suddenly, as though colliding with an unseen barrier, and the savage snarl upon his gypsy features gave way to a puzzled look, a look of almost comic pained surprise. Then we saw spreading on his face a widening smear of red, red blood which ran into his eyes and dripped down on his parted lips before he tumbled headlong to the crimson carpet spread before the altar. The other man had raised his hands, intent on bringing them down on de Grandin's shoulders with a crushing blow. Now suddenly the raised hands shook and quivered in the air, then clutched spasmodically at nothing, while a look of agony spread across his face. He hiccupped once and toppled forward, a spate of ruby blood pouring from his mouth and drowning out his death cry. And still you would deny me one poor miracle, monsieur? de Grandin asked the red priest in a level, almost toneless voice. Indeed, it seemed miraculous. Two men had died from gunshot wounds by all appearances, yet we had heard no shot. But, nice work, Frenchy, Ingram whispered approvingly. They have some sharpshooters with silencers on their guns up there, he told me. I saw the flashes when those two coves got it in the neck. Slick work, eh, what? You'll have those fellows groggy in a minute, and... The red priest launched himself directly at de Grandin with a roar of bestial fury. The little Frenchman sidestepped neatly, grasped the silver handle of his cane where it projected from his left elbow, and drew the gleaming sword blade from the stick. Ah? Uh -huh. He chuckled. Ha, 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 Monsieur Diablotin, you did not bargain for this, eh? Huh? He swung the needle-like rapier before him in a flashing circle, then, swiftly as a cobra strikes, thrust forward. That one for the poor girl whom you crucified, he cried, and the red priest staggered back a step, his hand raised to his face. The Frenchman's blade had pierced his left eyeball. And take this for the poor one whom you blinded, de Grandin told him as he thrust a second time, driving the rapier point full in the other eye. The red priest tottered drunkenly, his hands before his blinded eyes, but de Grandin knew no mercy. And may you have this for the honest gendarme whom you shot, he added, lashing the blind man's wrinkled cheeks with the flat of his blade. And last of all, take this for those so helpless little lads who died upon your cursed altar. He sank backward on one foot, then straightened suddenly forward, stiffening his sword arm and plunging his point directly in the red priest's opened mouth. A scream of agonizing pain rang out with almost deafening shrillness, and the blind man partly turned, as though upon an unseen pivot, clawed with horrid impotence at the wire-fine blade of the little Frenchman's rapier, then sank slowly to the altar. His death scream stifled to a sickening gurgle as his throat filled up with blood. Fini! de Grandin cried. Then, if you are ready, mademoiselle, we shall depart, he bowed to Alice, and, Olé, la corde! he cried abruptly, raising his hand in signal to someone overhead. Like a great serpent, a thick hemp hawser twisted down against the amphitheater's wall and in the fading light shed from the burning trees we saw the gleam of blue coats and red fezes where the native gendarmes stood above the excavation, their rifles at the ready. De Grandin flung an arm around Alice, took a quick turn of the rope around his other arm, and nodded vigorously. Like the flying fairies in a pantomime they rose up in the air, past the high altar, past the horned and pinioned image of the devil, past the stone wall of the Colosseum upward to the excavation's lip, 
where ready hands stretched out to drag them back to safety. Now the red congregation was in tumult. While de Grandin parleyed with the red priest, even while he slew him with his sword, they had sat fixed in stupor. But as they saw the Frenchman and the girl hold up to safety a howl like the war cry of the gathered demons of the pit rose from their throats, a cry of burning rage and thwarted lust and bitter, mordant disappointment. Kill him! After him! Crucify him! Burn him! came the shouted admonition, and more than one cowled member of the mob drew out a pistol and fired it at the light patch, which de Grandin's spotless costume made against the shadow. Fire! roared Ingram to his soldiers, and the crashing detonation of a rifle volley echoed through the night, and after it came the deadly clack-clack clatter of the Lewis guns. And from the farther side of the arena the French troops opened fire, their rifles blazing death, their maxims spraying steady streams of bullets at the massed forms on the benches. Suddenly there came a fearful detonation, accompanied by a blinding flare of flame. From somewhere on the French side, a bombe de main, a hand grenade, was thrown, and like a bolt of lightning it burst against the stone wall shoring up the terraced seats about the Colosseum. The result was cataclysmic. The Roman architects who designed the place had built for permanency, but close upon two thousand years had passed since they had laid those stones, and centuries of pressing earth and trickling subsoil waters had crumbled the cement. When the Satanists turned back the earth, they had not stopped to reinforce the masonry or shore up the raw edges of their cutting. Accordingly, the fierce explosion of the bursting bomb precipitated broken stone and sand and rubble into the ancient hippodrome, and instantly a landslide followed. Like sand that trickles in an open pit, the broken stone and earth rushed down, engulfing the arena. "'Back! Go back!' Ingram cried, and we raced to safety with the earth falling from beneath our very feet. It was over in a moment, only a thin expiring wisp of smoke emerging through a cleft in the slowly settling earth told where the palm trees had been blazing furiously a few minutes before. Beneath a hundred thousand tons of sand and crumbling clay and broken stone was buried once again the ancient Roman ruin, and with it every one of those who travelled round the world to see a mortal woman wedded to the devil. By gosh, I think that little frog was right when he said fini, Ingram exclaimed as he lined his houses up. Hamdullah, trouble comes, Ohiji, Sergeant Bendigo announced. Leopard fellas heard our shooting and come to see about it. Allah curse their noseless fathers. By Jove, you're right, Ingram cried. Form square, machine guns to the front. At two hundred yards, fire. The volley blazed and crackled from the line of leveled rifles, and the shrewish chatter of the Lewis guns mingled with the wild, inhuman screams of the attackers. On they came, their naked ebon bodies one shade darker than the moonless tropic night, their belts and caps of leopard skin showing golden in the gloom. Man after man went down before the hail of lead. But on they came, closer, closer, closer. Now something whistled through the air with a wicked whirring sound, and the man beside me stumbled back, a five-foot killing spear protruding from his breast. All things are with Allah, the merciful, the compassionate, he choked, and the blood from his punctured lung made a horrid gurgling noise, like water running down a partly occluded drain. Now they were upon us, and we could see the camwood stains upon their faces, and the markings on their wicker shields, and the gleaming strings of human toe and finger bones which hung around their necks. We were outnumbered ten to one, and though the houses held their line with perfect discipline, we knew that it was but a matter of a quarter hour at most before the last of us went down, beneath the avalanche of pressing bodies and stabbing spears. Bassonnet au canon, chargé! The order rang out sharply on our left, followed by the shrilling of a whistle from the right, and a half a hundred blue-clothed Senegalese gendarmes hurled themselves upon the left flank of our enemies, while as many more crashed upon the foemen from the right, bayonets flashing in the gunfire, black faces mad with killing lust and shining with the sweat of fierce exertion. Now there was a different timbre in the human leopard's cries. 
turned from hunters into quarry, like their bestial prototypes they stood at bay. But the lean, implacable Senegalese were at their backs, their eighteen-inch bayonets stabbing mercilessly, and Ingram's houses barred their path in front. At last a leopard man threw down his spear, and in a moment all were empty-handed. Verholt, Renoir commanded, jamming his pistol back into its holster and shouldering his way between the ranks of cringing captives. Monsieur le capitaine, he saluted Ingram with due formality. I greatly deprecate the circumstances which have forced us to invade your territory, and herewith tender our apologies, but— Apologies accepted, sweet old soul, the Englishman cut in, clapping an arm about the Frenchman's shoulders and shaking him affectionately. But I'd like to have your counsel in an important matter. Mais certainement, Renoir returned politely. The matter for discussion is— He paused expectantly. Do we hang or shoot these blighters? Ingram rejoined, nodding toward the group of prisoners. Twenty-five. The Summing Up Renoir and Ingram stayed behind to gather up loose ends, the loose ends being such members of the leopard men as had escaped the wholesale execution, for they were determined to exterminate the frightful cult. De Grondin and I, accompanied by a dozen Senegalese gendarmes, took Alice overland to Dakar, and Renoir dispatched a messenger before us to advise the hospital that we would need a private room for several days. Since the night de Grondin rescued her, the girl had lain in a half-stupor, and when she showed signs of returning consciousness, the little Frenchman promptly gave her opiates. It is better that she wake when all is finished, and regard the whole occurrence as a naughty dream he told me. But how the deuce did they graft those devilish horns on her? I wondered. There is no doubt about it. The things are growing, but all in good time, he soothed. When we arrive at Dakar, we shall see, my friend. We did. The morning after our arrival, we took her to the operating room, and while she lay in anesthesia, de Grondin deftly laid the temporal skin aside, making a perfect star-shaped incision. Name of a little blue man. Behold, my friend, he ordered, bending across the operating table and pointing at the open wound with his scalpel tip. They were clever, those ones, Nispa. The lower ends of the small horns had been skillfully riveted to thin discs of gold, and these had been inserted underneath the skin, which had then been sewn in place, so that the golden discs, held firmly between skin and tissue, had acted as anchors for the horns, which thus appeared to grow upon the young girl's head. Clever, I echoed. It's diabolical. Eh bien, they are frequently the same, my friend. He sewed the slit skin daintily with an invisible subcutaneous stitch, matching the cut edges so perfectly that only the thinnest hairline of red showed where he worked. Voila, he announced. This fellow, Jules de Grandin, puzzles me, my friend. When he acts the physician, I am sure he is a better doctor than policeman, but when he is pursuing evildoers, I think he is better gendarme than physician. The devil take the fellow. I shall never make him out. The little freighter wallowed in the rising swells, her twin propellers churning the blue water into buttermilk. Far astern the coast of Africa lay like the faintest wisp of smoke against the sky. Ahead lay France. De Grondin lit another cigarette and turned his quick, bird-like look from Renoir to me, then to the deck chairs where Davison and Alice lay side by side, their fingers clasped, the light that never was on land or sea within their eyes. No, my friends, he told us. It is most simple when you understand it. How could the evil fellow leave his cell at the Poste de Police, invade friend Trowbridge's house, and all but murder Mademoiselle? How could he be lodged all safely in his cell, yet be abroad to kill poor Hornsby and all but kill the good Costello? How could he die in the electric chair and lie all dead within his coffin, yet send his wolves to kidnap Mademoiselle Alice? You ask me? Ah, the answer is he did not. What do you think from that, eh? Oh, for heaven's sake, stop talking rot and tell us how it was, if you really know— I shot back crossly. He grinned delightedly. 
Perfectly, my friend. Écoutez-moi, s'il vous plaît. When these so trying questions first began to puzzle me, I drew my bow at venture. If La Sûreté cannot tell me of him, I am shipwrecked. No, how do you call him? Sunk? I tell me. But I have great faith. A man so wicked as Bazarov, and an European as well, has surely run afoul of the law in France, I think. And if he has done so, the Sûreté most certainly has his dossier. And so I get his photograph and fingerprints from the governor of the prison and forward them to Paris. My answer waited for me at police headquarters at Dakar. It is this. Some five and forty years ago there lived in Mohilev a family named Bazarov. They had twin sons, Grigor and Vladimir. They were Roman Catholics. To be a Roman Catholic in Imperial Russia was much like being a Negro in the least enlightened of your southern states today, my friends. Their political disabilities were burdensome, even in that land of dreadful despotism, and they walked in daily fear of molestation by the police as well, since by the very act of their adherence to the Church of Rome they were more than suspected of sympathy with Poland's aspirations for independence. The Poles, you will recall, are predominantly Roman Catholic in religion. Very well. The brothers Bazarov grew up, and in accordance with their parents' fondest wish, were sent to Italy to study for the church. In time they came back to their native land, duly ordained as fathers in the Roman church, and sent to minister their co-religionists in Russia. The good God knows there was a need of fathers in that land of orphans. Now in Russia they had a law, which made the person having knowledge even indirect, of conspiracy to change the form of government, with or without violence, punishable by penal sentence for six years if he failed to transmit information to the police. A harmless literary club was formed in Mohilev, and the brothers Bazarov attended several meetings, as a number of the members were of the Roman faith. When the police learnt of this club, they pounced upon the members— and though there was not evidence enough to convict a weasel of chicken-killing, the poor wretches were found guilty just the same and sentenced to Siberia. The two young priests were caught in the police net, too, and charged with treasonably withholding information, because it was assumed they must have heard some treasonable news when they sat to hear confessions. Enfin, they were confined within the fortress prison of St. Peter and St. Paul. They were immured in dungeons far below the level of the river, dungeons into which the water poured in time of inundation, so that the rats crawled on their shoulders to save themselves from drowning. What horrid tortures they were subject to within that earthly hell we cannot surely say, but this we know. When they emerged from four years' suffering inside those prison walls, they came forth old and wrinkled men, Moreover, they who had received the rites of holy ordination were atheists, haters of God and all his works, and sworn to sow the seed of atheism wherever they might go. We find them then as members of a group of anarchists in Paris, and there they were arrested, and much of their sad story written in the archives of the Sûreté. Another thing, as not infrequently happens among Russians, these brethren were possessed of an uncanny power over animals. Wild savage dogs would fawn on them, the very lions and tigers in the zoo would follow them as far as the limits of their cages would permit, and seemed to greet them with all signs of friendship. You comprehend? Why, uh, you mean that while Grigor was under arrest, his brother Vladimir impersonated him and broke into my house, then went out gunning for Costello? I began, but he interrupted with a laugh. Oh, Trowbridge! Great philosopher! How readily you see the light when someone sets the lamp aglow! he cried. Yes, you're right. It was no supernatural ability which enabled him to leave his prison cell at will, even to make a mock of death's imprisonment. Grigor was locked in prison, executed, but Vladimir, his twin and double, remained at large to carry on their work. But now he too is dead. I killed him when we rescued Mademoiselle Alice. One other thing, my Jules, Renoir demanded. When they prepared to wed Mademoiselle to Satan, they made her walk all barefoot upon those burning stones. Was not that magic of a sort? De Grandin tweaked the needle points of his moustache. A juggler's trick, he answered. 
that fire-walking he is widely practised in some places, and always most successfully. The stones they use are porous as a sponge. They heat to incandescence quickly, but just as quickly they give off their heat. When they were laid upon the moistened sand, these stones were cool enough to hold within your ungloved hand in thirty seconds. Some time was spent in mummery before they bade Mademoiselle to walk on them. By the time she stepped upon them, they were cold as any moneylender's heart. The ship's bell beat out eight quick strokes. De Grandin dropped down from his seat upon the rail and tweaked the waxed tips of his moustache until they stood out like twin needles from each side of his small and thin-lipped mouth. "'Come, if you please,' he ordered us. "'Where?' asked Alice. "'To the chart room of course. The land has disappeared.' He waved his hand toward the horizon where rolling blue water met a calm blue sea. "'And we are now upon the high sea.' "'Well?' demanded John. "'Well? Name of a little green pig with most deplorably bad manners. I shall say it is well. Do not you know that masters of ships on the high seas are empowered by the law to solemnize the right of marriage?' Something of the old Alice we had known in other days looked from the tired and careworn face above the collar of her travelling coat, as she replied, "'I'm game.' Then eyes dropped demurely, and a slight flush in her cheeks, she added softly, "'If John still wants me.' "'Dearly beloved, we are gathered together here in the sight of God and in the face of this company to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony,' read the captain from the Book of Common Prayer. "'If any man can show just cause why they may not lawfully be joined together, let him now speak, or else forever after hold his peace.' Yes, pardieu, let him speak, and meet his death at Jules de Grandin's hands, the little Frenchman murmured, thrusting one hand beneath his jacket, where his automatic pistol rested in its shoulder holster. And now, with due solemnity, let us consign this sacre thing unto the ocean, and may the sea never give up its dead, de Grandin announced, when John and Alice Davison, Renoir and I, came from the captain's sanctum the tang of champagne still upon our lips. He raised his hand, and a silvery object glittered in the last rays of the setting sun, flashed briefly through the air, then sank without a trace beneath the blue sea-water. It was the marriage girdle of the Yazidis. Oh! Alice cried. You've thrown away the luck of the Humes. Precisely so, chérie, he answered with a smile. There are no longer any Humes. Only Davison's. Le bon Dieu grant there may be many of them. We have just returned from the christening of Alice's twin boys, Renoir de Grandin and Trowbridge Ingram Davison. The little villains howled right lustily when Dr. Bentley put the water on their heads and... Grand Dieu des Porcs! The evil one dies hard in those small sinners, said Jules de Grandin. Ingram, engrossed with ministerial duties in West Africa, was unable to be present, but the silver mugs he sent the youngsters are big enough to hold their milk for years to come. As I write this, Renoir, de Grandin, and Costello are very drunk in my consulting room. I can hear Costello and Renoir laugh with that high-pitched cachination which only those far gone in liquor use at some droll anecdote which Jules de Grandin tells. I think that I shall join them. Surely there is one more drink left in the bottle. The Dark Angel 1. Tiens, my friend. Jules de Grandin selected an Oyo de Monterey from the humidor and set it alight with gusto. Say what you will. There is no combination more satisfying to the soul and body than that of the processes of digestion and slow poisoning by nicotine. No. He regarded the gleaming tip of his diminutive patent leather evening pump with marked satisfaction and wafted a smoke wreath slowly toward the ceiling. To make our happiness complete, he added, needs only the presence of— Detective Sergeant Costello, if you please, sir interrupted Nora McGuinness, my household factotum, appearing at the drawing-room door with the unexpected suddenness of a spectre taking shape from nothingness. Eh, do you say so, petite? 
the little Frenchman answered with a chuckle. Bid him enter by all means. The big red-headed plain-clothes man advanced in Nora's wake, a smile of real affection for the Frenchman on his face. Behind him marched an equally big man, ruddy-faced, white-haired, with that look of handsome distinction so many commonplace Irishmen acquire at middle life. "'Shake hands with me friend, Chief O'Toole of the Norfolk Downs Force, gentlemen,' Costello bade with a nod toward his companion. "'To me, this is Dr. de Grandin I've been telling you about, and Dr. Trowbridge. "'Pleased to meet you, gentlemen,' Chief O'Toole acknowledged with a smile and bone-crushing grip for each of us. "'Jerry's been telling me you might be willing to give me a lift with the damnedest beg pardon, "'the most puzzling case I've ever had the evil luck to run again.' De Grandin transferred his cigar to his left hand and tweaked the needle points of his tightly waxed blond moustache with his right. If the good Sergeant Costello vouches for the case, mon chef, I make no doubt that it will intrigue me, he answered. Tell us of it, if you please. Well, sir, Chief O'Toole lowered himself ponderously into a chair and regarded the grey uniform cap he had removed with a stare which seemed to indicate he sought inspiration from its silk-lined depths. Well, sir, is this way? Over in Norfolk Downs we've been having one hell of a, one most distressful time at it, and none of us seems able to say what it's all about. He paused twisting the cap between his large white hands and examining its peaked visor as though he'd never seen the thing before. Um, de Grandin shot a quick glance at the visitor. This is of interest, but not instructive. If you will amplify your statement— Beg pardon, sir, maybe I could help, Costello interrupted. Timmy, a chief of tool, and me's been friends for twenty year and more. We was harness bulls together and got our detectives' badges at the same time. When they started that swell real estate development over to Norfolk Downs, they put in a paid police force and offered the job of chief to Timmy. He's a good officer, sir, as none knows better than I. But keeping burglars in their place and nabbing speeders is more in his line than handling this sort of trouble. There's been some mighty queer doings at Norfolk Downs of late, and the whole community is terrified. Not only that... They're saying Timmy's not competent, and one more killing like they've had, and he'll be warm in some employment office bench. He was over to my house this evening to talk things over, and the minute I heard about it, I says to myself, here's a case for Dr. de Grandin, or I'm a Dutchman. So here we are, sir. O'Toole took up the explanation. If you're asking me about it, I'll say the devil's in it, sir, he told de Grandin solemnly. The devil? De Grandin eyed him narrowly. You mean that Satan has a hand in it, or do you use an idiom? No, sir, I mean exactly what I said, the chief replied. Twas a matter of three months or so ago, the night after Christmas, when Mike Scarshy got his'n. Everybody in the Downs knew Mike, and no one knew much good of him. Some said he was a bootlegger and some a runner for a joint down Windsor way the kind of place where you get what you pay for and no questions asked, and if you feel the want of womanly sympathy, there's a young and pretty hostess to give you what you crave. However that might be, sir, we used to see Mike sliding round the place, whispering to the respectable folks who might not be so good when they thought no one was looking, and I'd a run him out of town, only I didn't dust offend his customers. So I was content to keep an eye on him, just until he pulled off something I could rightly pinch him for. Well, that night we heard him drive up the Edgemere Road in that big expensive roadster of his, and seen him turn the corner, like he was headed for one of the big houses on the hill. I didn't see it myself, sir, but one of my men, named Gibbons, was nearby when it happened. He seen the car go round the bend and disappear behind some rhododendron bushes, and all of a sudden he heard somebody give a yell, as if the devil's self was on him and then two shots come close together. Next moment was a flash of fire so bright it blinded him, and that was all. But when he came a-run into the place where Scarshy's car was stalled, he found Mike with his gun still in his hand, and the front mashed out of his head. Leastwise most of it was gone, but enough of it remained to show the footprint of a monster goat stamped on him, sir. Furthermore, 
There was the smell of brimstone in the air. De Grandin raised the narrow black brows which showed such marked contrast to his wheat-blonde hair. Eh bien, mon chef, he murmured. This devil of yours would seem to be a most discriminating demon, at least in Monsieur Scarchi's case. Am I to understand that you give credence to the story? A tinge of red showed in O'Toole's broad face. Yar, sir, he returned. I was brought up amongst goats, sir. I know their tracks when I seen em, even if me eyes were tight shut, and I recognized the print on Scarsh's forehead. Besides, he paused a moment, swallowing uneasily, and a dogged, stubborn look came in his eyes. Besides, I seen the thing myself, sir. O'Toole breathed quickly, pantingly, as one who shifts a burden from his chest. We all thought it mighty queer how Mike got killed. He went on. But the coroner said he must have run into a tree or something, though the saints knows there was no tree there, so we had to let it pass. But within another week, sir, old man Withers was found, lying dead for an instant the gate of his house, and he died the same way Mike did, with a top mashed out of his head and the mark of the beast on his brow. There weren't no possibility of his running into no tree, not even a tree as wasn't there, sir for there he was, spread-eagled on the sidewalk, with his mouth wide open, and his eyes a starin' at the sky, and there was blood and brains oozing from a hole in his head big enough to put your fist into. There was plenty said the old man was a bad lot. It certainly never let a nickel get away once he got his hands on it, and many a one as borrowed money from him lived to regret it. But that's not here nor there. The fact is he was dead, and the jury had to bring it in a homicide though, of course, they couldn't blame no one specifically. Then last of all was Mr. Roscoe, a harmless, inoffensive sort of cuss he was, sir, quiet-spoken and gentlemanlike as any that you'd meet. He had some money and didn't need to work, but he was a sort of nut on atheism, and ran some kind of paper poking fun at the churches for his own amusement. It was about midnight ten days ago when the thing got him. I'd finished up my work at the Borough Hall and was hidden for home, when I passed the bus station. Mr. Roscoe gets off on the last bus from Bloomfield, and we walks along together. As we was walking past St. Michael's Church, we seen the light which burns before the altar, and, Oh, tool, says Mr. Roscoe, "'Tis a shame that they should waste the price of oil to keep that thing a-going when there's so much misery and suffering in the world. If I could have me way, says he, I'd raise the devil with and then it was upon us, sir. Taller than me by a good foot it was, and all covered with scales like a serpent. Two horns was growing from its head, and its eyes was flashing fire. I couldn't rightly say it had a tail, for there was small chance to look at it. But may I never stir from this here chair if it didn't have a pair of big black wings. And it flew right at us. Mr. Roscoe gave a funny sort of cry and put his cane up to defend himself. I was yanking at me gun, but my fingers was all stiff with cold, and the holster wouldn't seem to come on snapped. The next I knew, something gave an awful screaming laugh, and then there was a flash of fire right in my face, and I'm a coughing and a choking with the fumes of sulphur in my nose, and when I get so I can see again, there's no one there at all but Mr. Roscoe, and he stretched out beside me on the sidewalk, with his skull mashed in and the devil's mark upon his brow. Dead he were, so dead as yesterday's newspaper. I'd made shift to snatch me gun out whilst the fire was still blinding me, and had fired and where I thought this thing must be, but all I ever found to show that I'd hit something was this thing. From his blouse pocket he withdrew an envelope, and from it took a small dark object. De Grandin took it from him, examined it a moment, then passed it on to me. It was a portion of a quill, clipped across the shaft some three or four inches from the tip, the barbs a brilliant black which shone with iridescent luster in the lamplight. Somewhat heavier than any feather I had ever felt, it was, and harder, too, for when I ran my thumb across its edge, it rasped my skin almost like the teeth of a fine saw. Indeed, the thing was more like the scale from some gigantic reptile, cut in foliations to simulate a quill, than any feather I had ever seen. 
I never saw a quill like this before, I told O'Toole, and here's hoping that you never do again, sir, he responded earnestly. For as sure as you're a-sittin' on that chair, that there's a feather from a devil's angel's wing. Begging your pardon, sir, Nora McGuinness once more appeared abruptly at the door. There's a young man with a special delivery letter for Dr. de Gronda. Will you be after looking at it now, sir, or will it wait? Bring it in at once, if you will be so good, the Frenchman answered. All special letters merit quick attention. Bowing mute apology to us, he slit the envelope and glanced quickly through the brief typewritten missive. Parbleu, it is very strange, he exclaimed as he finished reading. You came to me regarding these so strange events, mon chef, and on your heels comes this. Attend me, if you please. My dear Dr. de Grondin, I have heard of your ability to arrive at explanations of cases which apparently possess a supernatural aspect, and am writing you to ask if you will take the borough of Norfolk Downs as client in a case which will undoubtedly command the limit of your talents. Our police force admit their helplessness. Special investigators hired from the best detective agencies have failed to give us any satisfaction. Our people are terrified, and the entire community lives in a feeling of constant insecurity. In view of this, I am authorized to offer you a retainer of one thousand dollars immediately upon your acceptance of the case, and an additional fee of fifty dollars a day, plus reasonable expenses, provided you arrive at a solution of the mystery, which is not only causing our citizens much anxiety, but has already reached the newspapers in a garbled form, and is causing much unfavorable publicity for Norfolk Downs as a residential center. Your promptness in replying will be appreciated by, yours faithfully, Roland Wilcox, Mayor of Norfolk Downs. And will you take the case, sir? O'Toole asked eagerly. Sure, Dr. de Grandin, sir. You'll be doing me a favor, and Timmy too, if you'll say yes, Costello added. Assuredly, de Grandin answered with a vigorous nod. "'Tomorrow afternoon the good Dr. Trowbridge and I shall wait upon Monsieur Le Maire and say to him, "'Voila, Monsieur, here we are. Where is the thousand dollars? "'And where the mystery that you would have us solve? "'But yes, certainly.' Two. "'The wealthy realtors and expensive architects who mapped out Norfolk Downs "'had done their work artistically. "'Houses of approved English architecture,' Elizabethan, Tudor, Jacobean, with here and there an example of the Georgian or Regency periods, set well back in tastefully planted grounds along wide, tree-bordered roads, which trailed gracefully in curves and avoided every hint of the perpendicularity of city streets. Commercial buildings were restricted to such few shops as were essential to the convenience of the community. A grocery, drugstore, delicatessen, and motor service station and these were confined to a circumscribed zone, and effectually disguised as private dwellings, their show-windows fashioned as orioles, neatly sodded yards, set with flower-beds and planted with evergreens before them. Mayor Wilcox occupied a villa in Edgemere Road, a great rambling house of the half-timbered English style with romantic chimneys, stuccoed walls, and many low, broad windows. A snug, well-kept formal garden, fenced in by neatly trimmed hedges of box and privet, was in front. At the side was a pergola and rose garden where marble statues, fountains, and a lily pond stood in incongruous contrast to the Elizabethan house and Victorian front garden. "'I understand you've had some of the details of the case already from O'Toole, Dr. de Grandin,' Mayor Wilcox said, when we had been escorted to his study at the rear of the villa's wide entrance hall. The Frenchman inclined his head. Quite so, he answered. I was most solemnly assured you were suffering from diabolic visitation, Monsieur le Maire. Wilcox laughed shortly, mirthlessly. I'm not so sure he's wrong, he answered. Eh? You have some reason to believe? De Grandin started, then broke off questioningly. The mayor looked from one of us to the other with a sort of shame-faced expression. "'It's really very odd,' he returned at length. "'For Loylet rather inclines to the diabolical theory, too, but he's so medieval-minded anyway that—' 
And this Monsieur Folleux, this Monsieur with the funny name, who is he, if you please? Our rector, the priest in charge of St. Michael's and all angels. Queer sort of chap, modern and all that, you know, but believes in all sorts of supernatural nonsense, and— One little moment, if you please, de Grandin interrupted. Let us hear the reasons for the good man's assumptions, if you will. Me, I know the byways of ghostland as I know my own pocket, and I solemnly assure you there is no such thing as the supernatural. There is undoubtedly the superphysical. There is also that class of natural phenomena which we do not understand. But the supernatural? No, it is not so. Mayor Wilcox, who was bald to the ears and affected a pointed beard and curling moustache which gave him a Shakespearean appearance, glanced sharply at the Frenchman, as though in doubt of his sincerity. Then, as he met the earnest gaze of the small blue eyes, responded with a shrug. It was the Michael which started him. Our church, you know, is largely constructed from bits of ruined abbeys brought from England. The font is sixteenth century, the altar even earlier, and some of the carvings date back to pre-Tudor times. The name saint, the archangel Michael, is represented by a particularly fine bit of work showing the champion of heaven overcoming the fiend and binding him in chains. It was in first-rate shape, despite its age, when we received it, and every precaution was taken when we set it over the church porch. But just before the first of these mysterious killings took place, the stone fetter which bound the devil became broken in some way. Philoylot was the first to notice it, and directed my attention to the missing links. He seemed in a dreadful state of funk when he told us the bits of missing stone were nowhere to be found. "'Well, we'll have a stone cutter over and have new ones carved,' I told him. But it seemed that wouldn't do at all. Unless the identical links which were missing could be found and reset right away, something terrible would descend on the community,' he assured me. I'd have laughed at him, but he was so earnest about it anyone could see he was sincere. "'I tell you, Wilcox,' he said, "'those links are symbolical. The archfiend is unchained upon the earth, and dreadful things will come to us unless we can confine him in those sacred fetters right away. You have to know, Philoylet, to understand the impressive way he said it. Why, I almost believed it myself he was so serious about it all. Well, the upshot of it all was we searched the churchyard.' and all the ground around, but couldn't find a single trace of those stone links. Next night, the boot, the Scarshi man, was killed in the way O'Toole told you, and since that time we've had two other inexplicable murders. No one can offer us any explanation, and the detectives we hired were as much at sea as any of us. What do you think of it, sir? Hmm... De Grandin took his narrow chin between a thoughtful thumb and finger and pinched it till the dimple in its tip deepened to a cleft. I think we should do well to see the statue of St. Michael and also the so estimable clergyman with the unpronounceable name. Can this be done at once? Wilcox consulted his watch. Yes, he answered. Philoylet says even song about this time every day, rain, shine, or measles, We'll be in time to see him if we step over to the church right away. Winter was dying hard. The late afternoon was bitter for so late in March. A leaden sky, piled high with asphalt-colored clouds, held a menace of snow, and along the walks curled yellow leaves from the wayside trees, scuttered, and paused, and scuttered on again, as though they fled in hobbled fear from the wind that came hallooing from the north. Chimes were playing softly in the square bell tower of the church as we approached, their vibrant notes scarce audible against the wind's wild shouting. Abide with me, fast falls the even tide, the darkness deepens, Lord with me abide. A look of almost ineffable sadness swept across de Grandin's features, swift as the passing of a thought. Ever, ever in thy gracious keeping, Lord, he murmured and signed the cross before his face, so quickly one might have thought him stroking his moustache. "'There's Philoylet now!' Wilcox exclaimed. "'I say, Mr. Philoylet, here!' A tall young man in shovel hat and Inverness coat strode quickly across the patch of lawns separating the church from the brick and sandstone rectory. If he heard the mayor's greeting above the wind, he gave no sign, as he thrust the nail-studded door of the vestry aside and entered the sacred edifice. 
He's a sacerdotal fool, our companion exclaimed half angrily. You might as well try to get a number on a broken telephone as attract his attention when he's about his parish duties. Hm? de Grandin murmured. The one tracked mind, as you call him in America, eh? Huh? And this St. Michael of whom you spoke, where is he, if you please? There, Wilcox answered, pointing his blackthorn stick to a sculptured group set in the wall above the Pentis. The group, cut in high relief upon a plinth of stone, represented the archangel, accoutred in cuirass and greaves, erect above the fallen demon, one foot upon his adversary's throat, his lance poised for a thrust in his right hand, the left holding a chain which was made fast to manacles latched around the fiend's wrists. The whole thing, rather crudely carved, had an appearance of immense age, and even from our point of view, some forty feet away, we could see that several links of the chain, as well as the bracelets binding the devil's hands, had weathered and chipped away. And Monsieur l'Abbé insists this has connection with these so strange deaths? The Frenchman asked musingly. He affects to believe so, yes, Wilcox answered, impatience in his voice. Eh bien, in former times men have believed in stranger things, de Grandin returned. Come, let us go in. I would observe him more closely, if you please. Like too many churches, St. Michael and all angels did not boast impressive congregations at ordinary services. A verger in a black serge robe, three or four elderly and patently virgin ladies in expensive but frumpish costumes, and a young and slender girl almost nun-like in her subdued grey coat and hat, were the sole attendants besides ourselves. The organ prelude finished as we found seats in a forward pew, and the Reverend Mr. Faloilat entered from the vestry, genuflected to the altar, and began to intone the service. Rather to my surprise, he chose the long, or Nicene Creed, in preference to the shorter one usually recited at the evening service, and at the words, and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost, his genuflection was so profound that it was almost a prostration. Immediately following the collect for peace, he descended from the chancel to the body of the church, and began the office of general supplication. It was chilly to the point of frostiness in the church, but perspiration streaked the cleric's face, as in a voice vibrant with intense emotion, he cantilated the entreaty. O oh, holy, blessed and glorious Trinity, three persons and one God, have mercy upon us, miserable sinners. From our seats in the transept, we were almost abreast of the priest as he knelt at the litany desk, and I caught de Grandin studying him covertly while the interminable office was recited. Mr. Falolat's face was cameo-sharp in profile, pale but not with poor health, lean rather than thin, with a high narrow brow, deep-set, almost piercingly clear eyes of grey high-bridged prominent nose and long-pointed chin. The mouth was large but thin-lipped, and the hair which grew well forward at the temples intensely black. A rather strong, intelligent face, I thought, but one marked by asceticism, the face of one who might be either unflinching martyr or relentless inquisitor, as occasion might direct. No use trying to see him now. Wilcox told us when benediction was pronounced, and the congregation rose from their knees after a respectful interval. He'll be about his private devotions for the next half hour, and— uh, Ah, by George, I have it. I'm having another friend for dinner tonight. What do you say we have Faloilat and Janet in as well? You'll have all the chance you want to talk with him. Excellent, de Grandin acquiesced. And who is Janet, may one ask? Madame Fol— the reverend gentleman's wife? "'Lord, no,' the mayor responded. "'Faloilat's a dedicated celibate. Janet's his ward.' "'Huh?' the Frenchman answered with a barely perceptible rising inflection. I drove my elbow in his ribs, lest he say more. The frank expressions of de Grandin's thoughts were not always acceptable to American ears, as I well knew from certain contretemps in which he had involved me in the past. Three. Eight of us gathered at the Jacobean oak table in Mr. Wilcox's dining-room that evening. 
the mayor and his wife, a slender, dark young man of scholarly appearance with refined Semitic features, George Wilcox's son, recently admitted to the bar and his father's partner in practice, the Reverend Basil Faloilet and his ward, Janet Payne, de Grandin, and I. The meal was good, though simple, clear soup, fried sole, a saddle of Canada hare, salad and a nice, white wine with the fish, claret with the roast. De Grandin studied each of the guests with his quick stock-taking glance, but Janet excited my curiosity most of all. She was slight and unmistakably attractive, but despite her smooth and fresh-colored complexion, she somehow conveyed an impression of colorlessness. Her long, fair hair was simply arranged in a figure-eight knot at the nape of her neck. Her large, blue, heavy-lidded eyes seemed to convey nothing but disinterested weariness. Her lips were a thought too full for beauty, but she had a sweet, rather pathetic smile, and she smiled often but talked rarely. Hmm, I wondered professionally. Is she anemic, or recovering from an illness? The sound of Wilcox's voice broke through my reverie. I saw Withers's executors today, Mr. Silverstein, he told the young Jewish gentleman, and I don't think there's much doubt that they'll renew the loan. To us he added in explanation, Mr. Silverstein is rabbi of the congregation Beth Israel. Withers held a mortgage on their temple and was pressing them for payment in full when he was... Uh, when he died, the executors seemed more leniently inclined. A sharp kick on my shin made me wince with pain, but before I could cry out, de Grandin's hand was pressing mine, and his eyes beckoning my attention to the clergyman across the table. The reverend gentleman's face had gone an almost sickly grey, and an expression of something like consternation was on his features. I was about to ask if I could be of service when our hostess rose— and with her Janet went into the drawing-room. Evidently the custom of leaving the gentlemen at table with their cigars still obtained in Wilcox's house. For just an instant as she passed, the girl's glance rested on young Wilcox, and in it was tenderness and such yearning that I almost cried aloud, for it was like the look of a pauper's child before a toy-shop window at Christmas time. De Grandin noted the look, too. Tiens, Monsieur l'abbé, he said genially as he lighted his cigar. Unless I greatly miss my guess, you shall soon celebrate a most joyous ceremony. The clergyman looked puzzled. How do you mean? he asked. Why, when Mademoiselle Jeannette marries with Monsieur Georges, to be sure you will most certainly perform the cere— The other cut him off. Janet has no place for earthly love in her life, he answered. Hers is one of those devoted souls which long for sweet communion with the heavenly bridegroom. As soon as she has come of age, she will become a postulate in the order of the resurrection. All plans are made. It is her life's vocation. She has been trained to look for nothing else since she was a little girl. De Grandin shot a doubtful, questioning glance at me, and I nodded confirmation. St. Chrysostom's, where I had served as vestryman for nearly thirty years, was moderate, being neither methodistically low nor ritualistically high, but in a vague way I knew the ritualistic branch of the Episcopal Church supported monastic and conventual orders with discipline and rules as strict as any sponsored by the Greek and Latin churches, especially women's orders, where the members took their vows for life and lived as closely cloistered as medieval nuns. An awkward pause ensued. De Grandin tweaked the points of his moustache and seemed meditating a reply, and knowing him as I did, my teeth were on edge with apprehension. But Wilcox saved the situation. I was telling Dr. de Grandin your theory of the strange deaths, how the breaking of the fetter in St. Michael's hand might be responsible, he told the clergyman. Young Rabbi Silverstein looked puzzled. "'Surely you're not serious, Mr. Faloilet?' he asked. "'You can't mean you believe there's some connection between a graven image and these murders. Why, it's—' Faloilet rose, his face drawn and working with half-suppressed emotion. "'To one of your religions, sir,' he answered cuttingly. "'The statue of the Archangel Michael may be a graven image. To us it is a holy thing, endued with heavenly powers. As for these murders, as you call them—' 
I am convinced no earthly agency has anything to do with them. No human hand struck the blows which rid the world of those moral lepers. They are unquestionably the visitations of an outraged heaven upon contemners of divine authority. The call to repentance has gone forth, even as it did in the days of the patriarch Noah. Heaven is outraged at the iniquity of man, and the dark angel of death is abroad. You may almost hear the beating of his dreadful sable wings. There is no one, as when the firstborn was slain of old, to sprinkle blood upon the lintels of our doors that he may spare us and pass on. Repentance is the only way to safety. No mortal man can stay his flight. No mortal date impede him in his awful errand. Tiens, there you do make the great mistake, monsieur, de Grandin answered with one of his quick elfin grins. I dare do so. The law forbids such killings, and be he angel or devil, he who has committed them must answer to the law. Furthermore, which is of more immediate importance, he must answer to Jules de Grandin, certainly, of course. You? The tall cleric looked down at the little Frenchman incredulously. Even as you say, Monsieur l'Abbé. For a moment they faced each other across the table. Loyalette's piercing gaze, seeking to beat down de Grandin's level stare, and failing as the wind may fail to move a firmly planted rock. At length, "'You take grave risks lightly, sir,' the clergyman admonished. "'It is a habit of long standing, monsieur,' de Grandin answered in a toneless, level voice, his little round blue eyes set in a fixed, unwinking stare against the other's burning gaze. The clergyman excused himself a short while afterward, and we were left alone before the fire. "'I think your rector needs a rest,' I told the mayor. "'His nerves are all unstrung from overwork, I'd say. Once or twice I fancied he was on the verge of a breakdown this evening.' "'He did look rather seedy,' Wilcox admitted. "'Guess we'll have to send him off to Switzerland again this summer. He's a great mountain climber, you know. Quite a hunter, too.' Some years ago he went exploring in the Andes and brought back some rare specimens. They say he's one of the few men who ever succeeded in bringing down a condor in full flight. De Grandin glanced up sharply. A condor, did you say, monsieur? One of those great Andean vultures, he demanded. Yes, Wilcox answered. He risked his life to do it, but he shot one down from an eminence of several thousand feet. Got two of them, in fact. But one was lost. The others stuffed and mounted in the museum at Harrisonville. A condor, murmured Jules de Grandin musingly. He shot a condor, this one, and— Furious knocking at the door, followed by the tread of heavy boots in the tiled passage, cut him short. Dr. de Grandin, sir! Chief O'Toole burst into the dining room, amazement and something strangely like terror in his florid face. There's been another one kilt. We just got the word. Miltonnerre, another. Beneath our very noses. The Frenchman leaped from his seat as a bounced ball rises in the air, and fairly rushed toward the coat closet where his outdoor wraps were hung. Come, friend Trowbridge, rush. Hasten, fly, he bade me. To O'Toole. Lead on, mon chef. We follow close behind. Tis Mr. Bostwick this time, sir the chief confided as we walked along the frosty street. Not five minutes ago I took a call at headquarters and— Is this the chief of police? a lady asks, all scared and trembly like. It is, says I, and what can I be doing for you, miss? Come over to Mr. Bostwick's if yous please, she tells me. Something terrible has happened. So over to Mr. Bostwick's house I goes, and she weren't exaggerating none, sir. I'll say that for her. The place is a holy wreck, and poor Bostwick's are sitting there in his living room with the back mashed out of his head, and the mark of the devil on his brow. De Grandin took a few steps in thoughtful silence, then, And what was Monsieur Bostwick's besetting sin, mon chef? he asked. Eh? What was it this one did which might offend a straight-laced moralist? O'Toole returned a short, hard laugh. How do you guess at it, sir? he asked. Name of an old and thoroughly decaying cheese. I ask you, not you me, the Frenchman almost shouted. Well, sir, Norfolk Downs ain't like some places. 
we don't go poking too much into the private life of the citizens as pays our salaries, and— uh, Bar the explanations and apologies. What was it this one did, I ask to know? Well, sir, if you must know, they do say as how he was uncommon fond of the ladies. Time after time I see the pretty ladies stepping out to their cars before his door, and later nights the light was going in his house. Yet he were a bachelor, sir, and his bootlegger's bill must have been tremendous, judging be the empty bottles that was carted from his place. "'I've heard tell as how some of his little playmates had husbands of their own, too. "'But as twas all done quiet and orderly-like, I never interfered. "'And no matter, one understands,' de Grandin cut him short. "'Are we arrived?' Four. "'We were. "'Ablazed with lights, the big brick house in which Theodore Bostwick had lived his gay and not particularly righteous life, stood before us, a uniformed policeman at the door, another waiting in the hall. Crouched on a settle by the fire, shaking with sobs and plainly in an agony of fear, a very pretty little lady in a very pretty pajama ensemble raised a tear-stained face to us. "'Oh, don't! Please don't let them give my name to the papers!' she besought as de Grandin paused before her. "'Softly, mademoiselle,' he soothed, tactfully ignoring the platinum and diamond band encircling the third finger of her left hand. "'We do but seek the facts. Where were you when it happened, if you please?' "'I, uh, I'd come downstairs to get some ice,' the little woman answered, dabbing at her eyes with a wisp of rose-colored cambric. "'Ted, Mr. Bostwick, wanted some ice for the cocktails.' and I said I'd come down and get it from the Frigidaire, and— She paused and shivered as though a chill had laid its icy finger on her, despite the superheated room. Yes, mademoiselle, and? De Grandin prompted softly. I heard Ted call out once. I couldn't understand him and called back, what? And then there was a dreadful clatter in the big room upstairs, as if everything were being smashed, and I was frightened. I waited for a moment then went upstairs, and, oh, it was dreadful. Precisément, one understands as much, but what was it you saw? You'll see it for yourself when you go up. Ted was sitting there, looking straight at me, and everything around him was all broken. I took one look at him and turned to run, but on the steps I must have fainted, for I fell, and when I came to I was lying at the bottom of the stairs, and— What did you do next? he asked as she paused again. I... I fainted. Morbleu, again? Yes, again. Something half stubborn, half hysterical was in her answer. I was going to the telephone to call the officers when I chanced to glance up, and there... Once more her voice trailed off to nothingness, and the color drained from her pink cheeks, leaving them ghastly white beneath the rouge. The little Frenchman looked at her, compassion in his gaze. What was it that you saw, ma pauvre? he asked gently. A, a face, sir. It looked at me through the window for just an instant, but I'll not forget it if I live to be a hundred. There was nothing above it, nothing below it. It seemed to hang there, like the head of a decapitated man suspended in the air, and it glared at me. It was long, twice as big as any face I've ever seen, and a sort of awful greyish colour, like the underside of a toad, and great tusks protruded from its mouth. The eyes were green and glowing with some dreadful light, and there were horns growing from the forehead. I tell you, there were! She paused a moment while she fought for breath, then, very softly, It was the devil. Eh bien, mademoiselle, this is of interest, certainly. And then, if you please... Then I fainted again. I don't know how long I lay on the floor, but as soon as I came to, I called police headquarters. De Grandin turned to Chief O'Toole. You came at once? he asked. Yes, sir. Who came with you? Kelly and Shay, sir. Très bien. You searched the place inside and out. What of the doors and windows? Locked, sir. Locked tight as wax. The little lady here let us in, after asking who he was, and we heard her through the lock and draw the inside bolt and chain fastener. The back door was tight locked, and every windy in the place but one was closed and latched. 
The big windy in the living room upstairs was shut but not latched, sir. Very good. And that window there, the one through which Mademoiselle declares she saw the face, what of it? It's more than ten foot from the ground, sir, and fixed. The frames sit fast in the jam, so it can't be opened at all. Very good. Let us ascend and see what we shall see above. The upstairs living room of Bostwick's house was a blaze of light, for Chief O'Toole and his aides had turned on every available bulb when they made their preliminary search. Huh? De Grandin murmured softly as we paused upon the threshold. Huh? Facing us through the doorway which gave upon the upper hall, his chin sunk on his breast, hands clenched into rigid fists upon the arms of his chair, a man sat staring endlessly at nothing with sightless, film-glazed eyes. He had been in early middle life, forty-five perhaps, possibly fifty years old, with profuse hair and a Van Dyke beard in which the brown was thickly flecked with gray. In life his face must have been florid, but now it shone under the glowing electric bulbs with the ash-gray pallor which belongs only to death, his parted lips almost as blanched as his cheeks, little gouts of perspiration, glistening like beads of oil, dewing his high white forehead. The room behind him was a welter of confusion. Chairs were overturned, even broken, the contents of the center table— bits of expensive bric-a-brac and objects of vertu, were strewn upon the rich turkey carpet. The pieces of an almost priceless kang vase lay scattered in one corner. De Grondin advanced and slowly surveyed the corpse, walking round it, observing it from every side. A little to the left and above the right ear, a deep wedge-shaped depression showed in the skull. Blood, a little ruptured brain substance and serous cerebrospinal fluid escaping from the wound. The Frenchman looked at me with elevated brows and nodded questioningly. I nodded back. Death must have been instantaneous. Do you see it, sir? O'Toole demanded in an awed whisper, pointing to the dead man's forehead. There was no denying it. Impressed upon the flesh, as though stamped there with almost crushing force, was the bifurcated imprint of a giant goat's hoof. They must have had the devil of a fight, O'Toole opined as he surveyed the devastated room. De Grandin looked about him carefully. It seems so, he agreed. But why should the evil one vent his wrath upon the poor man's chattels when he had killed the owner gives one to wonder, n'est-ce pas? And do you notice the smell, sir? O'Toole added diffidently. De Grandin's narrow nostrils contracted and expanded nervously as he sniffed the air. I, too, inhaled, and down the back of my neck and through my cheeks ran tiny ripples of horror chills. There was no mistaking it. Trust one who'd served a term as city health officer to know. Faint but clearly perceptible, there was the pungent, acrid scent of burning sulfur in the room. De Grandin's small blue eyes were very round and almost totally expressionless as he looked from O'Toole to me and back again. At length, Oui, da, he agreed. C'est le souffre, vraiment. No matter, we have other things to do than inhale silly scents. But, sir, O'Toole began. But be grilled upon the grates of hell, mon vieux. What make you of this? He pointed to a splash of blood, roughly circular in shape, and some four or five inches in diameter, which disfigured the carpet almost underneath the window. Huh? Why, that's where he bled, sir, the Irishman replied, after a moment's study of the ruddy spot. Exactement, my friend, where he bled. Now consider this. Wheeling, he led us back to the seated body, and pointed in turn to the dead man's collar and the back of the chair. Scarcely a bloodstain showed on them. I don't think I quite get you, sir, the chief admitted after a long scrutiny. Aha, my friend, are you then blind? The Frenchman asked him almost angrily. Consider, one window was open, or unlatched at least, and by that window we find blood. It is almost the only blood we find. But Monsieur Bostwick is seated in his chair— almost as though awaiting visitors. Is that the way a man would be if he had died in a fight? Well, sir, 
O'Toole put up a hand to scratch his head. He might have staggered to that chair and died there after he'd been struck. Name of a blue rat, my friend, how can you say so? De Grandin interrupted. The blow which killed this poor one caused instant death. Dr. Trowbridge will bear me out in that. No human man could live three seconds following such a blow. Besides, if the man had staggered across the room, there would be blood upon the floor if he leant forward as he crawled toward the chair, or blood upon his collar if he stood upright. Yet we see none save in this single spot. That is the spot where he bled, my friend. He was undoubtlessly struck dead close by the window, then carried to that chair and placed there with both feet flat upon the floor and hands composed upon the arms, and then the one who killed him smashed the furniture to bits. The testimony of the room can be interpreted no other way. The Irishman glanced round the room, then at the dead man. Holy mother, he exclaimed at length. I'm damned if I don't think the Dominie is right, sir. It were the devil has done this thing. No mortal man could fly up to that windy and kill the poor felly in that way. He paused to bless himself. Then, let's be going, sir. There's no good coming from our stay in here. De Grandin nodded in agreement. Then, as we reached the lower hall, We shall not need the pretty lady's testimony, chief. I believe her story absolutely. She was too frightened to be lying, and nothing she can tell us will throw light upon the case. Meantime, if you will have a strict watch kept, and see that no one comes or goes, except the undertaker's men when they come for the body, I shall be greatly in your debt. To the trembling, half-hysterical girl, he announced, "'You are free to go at will, petite, and were I you, I should not long remain here. One never knows who may come, and having come, depart and retail gossip.' "'You mean I may go? Now?' she asked in incredulous delight. "'Perfectly, my little cabbage, to go and sin, with more discretion in the future.' Five. Pale daylight had scarcely dawned when de Grandin nudged and kicked me into wakefulness. "'Have you forgotten that we inspect Monsieur Bostwick's house today?' he asked reproachfully. "'Come, my friend, rush, hasten, make the hurry. We have much to do, and I would be about it while there are not too many to observe our actions.' Our hasty toilets made, and a call put through to ask O'Toole to meet us, we hurried to the house of death, and while we waited for the chief, de Grandin made a careful circuit of the place. This is undoubtedly the window where the little lady with the fragile morals saw the evil face look through, he mused, pausing under the big chimney which reared itself along the southern wall. Yes, I agreed, and it's directly underneath the window of the room where Bostwick's body was found, too. The window Chief O'Toole said was closed but unlocked. Excellent! He clapped his hands as though applauding at a play. I shall make something of you yet, friend Trowbridge. You have right now. Huh? Que diable? He broke off sharply, crouched suddenly upon the frozen lawn, and crept forward quickly, as though intent upon taking something by surprise. You see? he asked in a tense whisper. A tiny coppice of dwarf spruce was planted in the angle of the chimney and the house wall, and as he pointed... I saw that one or two small branches were freshly broken, the tender wood showing white and pallid through the ruptured bark. Following him, I saw him part the lower boughs, examine the frosty ground with his nose almost thrust into it, then saw him straighten like a coiled spring suddenly released from tension. Behold! he bade me, seizing my wrist and dragging me forward. Upon the hard earth showed a tiny stain, a dull brown-colored stain no larger than a split bean, but unmistakable. Blood. How, I began, but, and look at this, ten thousand small blue devils, look at this, my friend, and tell me what it is you see, he ordered sharply. Nearer the house, where the chimney's warmth had kept the frost from hardening the earth to any great extent, there showed two prints, footprints, but such footprints. One was obviously human, a long and slimly aristocratic foot, shod with a moccasin or some sort of soft shoe, for there was no well-defined impression of a built-up heel. But close beside it, so placed it must have been left by the same person, was the clear-cut, unmistakable impression of a hoof, 
a cloven hoof, as though an ox or giant goat had stamped there. Well, I exclaimed, then paused for very want of words in which to frame my reeling thoughts. No, he denied emphatically. It is most unwell, friend Trowbridge. It is diabolical, no less. To la mim, he raised his narrow shoulders in a shrug. I shall not be dissuaded. Though Satan's self has done these things, I'll not desist until I have him clapped in jail, my friend. Consider, has not the mayor of Norfolk Downs retained me for that purpose? Come, let us go. I see the good O'Toole approaching, and he will surely be made ill if he should see this thing. Once more we searched the house as carefully as a jeweler might search a gem for hidden flaws, but nowhere was there any clue to help us. At length, we must look at the roof, de Grandin said. It may be we shall find some little, so small thing to aid us there. The good God knows we have not found it here. Arra, Dr. de Grandin, sir, tain't Christmas time for nigh another year, O'Toole objected. Eh? What is it that you tell me? Noel? the Frenchman answered sharply. Why, sir, you must be after thinking it was Santa Claus, as did in Mr. Bostwick, instead of... instead of Satan. He looked quickly round, as though he feared some hidden listener, then signed himself furtively with the cross. De Grandin grinned acknowledgment of the sally, but led the way uncompromisingly to the attic, from which a trap-door let upon the steep-tiled roof. Pausing for a moment to survey the serrated rows of semi-cylindrical tiles with which the housetop was covered, he threw a leg over the ridge-pole and began slowly working his way toward the chimney. Early as it was, several small boys loitering in the street, the policeman on guard outside the house, and a dog of highly doubtful ancestry were on hand to witness his aerial performance. And as he reached the chimney and clung to it, both arms encircling the tall terracotta pot with which the flue was capped, we caught a flash of black, and saw the Reverend Basil Faloilet pause in a rapid walk and gaze up wonderingly. De Grandin hugged the chimney some three minutes, crooked his knee across the angle of the roof, and leant as far downward as was possible, examining the glazed round tiles, then slowly hitched himself back to the trap-door where O'Toole and I were waiting. "'Find anything, sir!' the chief inquired good-humouredly. "'Enough to justify the risk of breaking the most valuable neck which I possess,' the Frenchman answered with a smile. "'Parbleu, enough to give one food for speculation, too, I am inclined to think. "'What was it?' "'The Frenchman opened his hand, "'and in the palm of his grey glove we saw a slim, dark object resting, "'a little wisp of horsehair, I supposed. "'What?' O'Toole began, but— "'No what's, my friend. No whys. Not even any wherefores, if you please.' "'The other cut him short. "'Me I shall cogitate on this matter.' This and some others. Anon I may announce the goal to which my thoughts have led. Meantime I am too well aware that it is villainously cold up here, and I am most tremendously in need of food. Breakfast was laid in the pleasant room adjoining Wilcox's kitchen when we returned, and de Grandin did full justice to the meal. He was commencing his fifth cup of well-creamed coffee when a maid announced the Reverend Basil Faloilot. Despite the coldness of the day, the clergyman's pale face was even paler than its usual wont as he came into the breakfast-room, still a little short of breath from rapid walking. "'Dreadful news of Mr. Bostwick,' he announced as he greeted us reservedly. "'The poor unfortunate, cut off in deadly sin. If only he'd seen the light in time. Who says he was cut off in sin, monsieur?' de Grandin broke in suddenly. "'I do.' The clergyman's pale lips snapped shut upon the words. I know he was. Time after time, night after night, I saw his paramours arriving at his door, as I watched from my study window, and I went to him with messages of peace, redemption, and release through hearty and unfeigned repentance. But he— Eh bien, monsieur, one can guess without great difficulty what he said to you, the Frenchman answered with a laugh. One can— the cleric answered hotly. He told me to go to the devil. Me, the messenger of holiness. There was no hope for such as he. 
he led a life of sin. In sin he died, and God can find no pity for a wretch like him. The Lord himself... It seems I have read somewhere of a lady whose behavior was not all a lady's conduct ought to be, yet who was counted of some worth in later days, de Grandin interrupted softly. An ugly sneer gathered at the corners of Philoilet's mouth. Indeed, he asked sarcastically. She was a countrywoman of yours, no doubt, Monsieur de Grandin. No, the Frenchman answered slowly, while a malicious twinkle flickered in his eyes. She was from Magdala, the scriptures call her Mary Magdalene, and somewhere I have heard the blessed master did not bar her out of paradise, although her life had been at least as bad as that of Monsieur Bostwick. I say to Gronda, you seem to take delight in getting a rise out of Philoilet, Wilcox accused when the clergyman had taken a hasty and offended leave. The almost boorish manner of the preacher puzzled me. Perhaps the man's a pious hypocrite, I hazarded, but— Mais non, denied the Frenchman. Pious he is, I freely grant, but a hypocrite? No, it is not so. He is in deadly earnest, that one. How much his deadliness exceeds his earnestness, I should not care to guess, but— He lapsed into a moody silence. What do you mean? I urged. Are you implying that— Ah, bah, I did but let my wits go wool-gathering. There is a black dog running through my brain, friend Trowbridge, he apologized. Forget what I have said. I was conversing through the hat, as you so drolly say. 6. De Grandin was busy all that day, making a hasty trip to the city, returning for luncheon, then dashing off to consult Chief O'Toole till nearly dinner-time. He kept the table in an uproar with his witty sallies throughout the meal, and when dessert was served, young George Wilcox pulled a long face. "'I'd rather sit right here and talk with you than go out tonight, Dr. de Grandin,' he declared. "'But—' "'Ah-ha! ha ah, ha I see him!' laughed de Grandin. "'I too was young upon a time, my friend. I know the ecstasy of the little hand's soft pressure—' the holy magic which can be found within the loved one's glance. Go to her with speed, mon vieux. You were not half a man if you delayed your tryst to talk with such a silly one as Jules de Gondin. Hold her hand gently, mon brave. It is a fragile thing, I make no doubt. The boy retreated with a sheepish grin and heightened color. I wish George wouldn't see her, Mrs. Wilcox sighed plaintively. They're terribly in love, of course, but Mr. Philoilet won't hear of it. He's mapped the poor girl's life for her, you know, and next May she starts on her novitiate at Carlinville. I suppose he knows best. He's such a thoroughly good man, but— She broke off with another sigh, as though she felt herself a heretic for questioning the rector's wisdom. We played bridge after dinner, but de Grandin's mind was not upon the game. He lost consistently and shortly after ten o'clock excused himself on the plea he had a busy day before him, paid his losses, and furtively beckoned me to join him in our room. "'Friend Trowbridge,' he informed me earnestly, "'we must do something for those children. It is an outrage two young hearts should thus be pried apart. You saw the look she gave him yesterday night at table, a look in which her very heart beat for release against the fetters of her eyes.' You saw the look on young monsieur's face this evening. Our business is to help them to each other. Our business is to find out who's perpetrating these murders. If it's not the devil himself, as O'Toole and Philoilet seem to think, I broke in roughly. This boy and girl's affair is just puppy love. They may think their hearts are broken, but zut who says it, he cried sharply. I tell you, friend Trowbridge, a man's heart breaks but once and then it is forever. Misère de Dieu, do I not know it? As for these killings, my friend, I am the wiser, though not sadder man, tonight. Attend me. At Harrisonville, I had the tiny flecks of hard-dried liquid which we found outside Monsieur Bostwick's window analyzed. They were, as I suspected, blood, human blood. Also, while he was absent on some parish duty— I did feloniously and most unlawfully insert myself into the reverend gentleman's study 
and made a careful search. Behold what I have found. From the pocket of his dinner coat he took several small twisted things, grayish curved objects, which looked for all the world like sections of a hard gray doughnut. What the deuce? I began, but he stopped me with a grin. Chains, my friend, chains of the devil, no less. The mystery of the holy Michael's tether for the devil is explained. I would not go so far as to declare that the good cleric broke that carven chain, then spread the story of impending doom about. But unquestionably he had possession of the missing links, even while he helped search for them in places where he knew that they were not. What do you make of that? Why, I looked at him in open-mouthed amazement, why, exactly, precisely quite so. It is our task to find out why. And unless I am more mistaken than I think I am, we shall know something ere we see another morning. Yawning, he stripped off his jacket and waistcoat, pulled his pajama coat on above his shirt, and proceeded to snap on every available bulb in the room. Once more he yawned prodigiously, went to the window and unbarred it, flinging wide the casement and spreading wide his arms in a tremendous stretch. I yawned in sympathy as he stood there with jaws agape, the personification of a man who can withstand the urge to sleep no longer. A moment he stood thus, then, snapping off the light, leaped quickly in the bed and pulled the comforter about his neck. Good Lord, you're not going to sleep that way, are you? I asked, amazed. Pardieu. I shall not sleep at all, my friend, he answered in a whisper. And you will please have the goodness not to shout. Climb into bed if you desire and pull the blankets over you, but do not sleep. We shall have need of wakefulness before the night is done, I damn think. Despite his admonition, I dropped off. The respite from the cares of my practice and the dull evening at cards combined to wear down my will to stay awake. How long I slept I do not know, but something, that odd sixth sense which rouses sleeping cats, dogs, and physicians, brought me full conscious from the fairyland of dreams. No time was needed to orient myself. My eyes turned unbidden to the window which de Grandin had left open. The steady southwest wind had chased the clouds before it, and the moonlight fell as bright almost as midday on the planted lawn outside. Bars of the silvery luminance struck through the open casement and lay along the floor, as bright and unobscured as— Stay. There was a shadow blotting out the moonlight. Something was moving very slowly, soundlessly, outside the window. I strained my eyes to pierce the intervening gloom, then sat bolt upright, horror gripping at my throat, chill, grisly fear dragging at my scalp. Across the eighteen-inch-wide sill it came, as quiet as a creeping snake, a great black thing, the moonlight glinting evilly on the polished scales which overlaid its form. From its shoulders, right and left, spread great black wings, gleaming with a sort of horrid, half-dulled luster, and as they grasped the window-sill I caught a glimpse of long-curved talons, pitiless as those of any vulture, but larger and more cruel by far than those of any bird. But awful as the dread form was, the countenance was more so. A ghastly sort of white it was, not white as snow or polished bone is white, not white as death's pale visage may be white, but a leprous, unclean white, the sort of pallor which cannot be dissociated from disease, corruption, and decay. Through the pale mask of horror looked two brilliant, glaring eyes, like corpse lights shining through the sockets of a fleshless skull, and from the forehead reared a pair of curving, pointed horns. A dreadful memory rushed across the years, a memory of childish fear which had lain dormant but undead for nearly half a century. With my own eyes... I saw in living form the figure of Apollyon out of Pilgrim's Progress. I tried to cry aloud, to warn de Grandin of the visitant's approach, but only a dull croaking sound, scarce louder than a sigh, escaped my palsied lips. Low as the utterance was, it seemed to carry to the creeping horror. 
With a wild, demoniac laugh, it launched itself upon the bed where my little friend lay sleeping, and in an instant I heard the sickening impact of a blow, another blow, and then a high-cracked voice crying, Accursed of God, go now and tell your master who keeps watch and ward upon the earth. Weapon I had none, but at the bedside stood a table with a chromium carafe of chilled spring water, and this I hurled with all my might straight at the awful face. A second marrow-freezing cry went up, and then a flash of blinding light, bright as a summer storm's forked lightning on a dark night, flared in my eyes, and I choked and gasped as strangling fumes of burning sulfur filled my mouth and nostrils. De Grandin! Oh, de Grandin! I wailed, leaping from the bed and blundering against furniture as I sought the light. Too well I knew that Jules de Grandin could not hear my voice. Already I had seen the effects of such flailing blows as I had heard. The little Frenchman lay upon his bed, his head crushed in, his gallant spirit gone forever from his slender, gallant body. Tia, my friend, you battled him right manfully. I dare assert his belly is most villainously sore where you hit it with the bottle. De Grandin's voice came to me from the farther end of the room and as my light-burned eyes regained their sight, I saw him crawl forth from behind an overstuffed armchair. My first impulse was to rush upon him and clasp him in my arms. Then sudden hot resentment rose within me. You were there all the time, I accused. Suppose it had struck me instead of— Of the pillow which I so artistically arranged within the bed to simulate myself? He interrupted with an impish grin. In such a case, I should have brought this into play. He waved the heavy French army revolver which he held in his right hand. I could have dropped him at any time, but I desired to see what he was about. It was a gallant show, n'est-ce pas? But, but was it really human? I demanded, shuddering at the dreadful memory of the thing. Do you suppose a bullet could have reached it? I could have sworn— Assuredly you could— he acquiesced and chuckled. So can the good O'Toole, and so can our most reverend friend, the abbé with the funny name, but— A thunderous knocking at the door broke through his words. Dr. de Grandin, is everything all right? Mayor Wilcox called anxiously. I thought I heard a noise in your room, and nothing's happened, has it? Not yet, the Frenchman answered coolly. Nothing of any consequence, Monsieur le Maire. But something of importance happens shortly, or Jules de Grandin will eat turnips for next Christmas dinner. That's good, Mayor Wilcox answered. At first I thought it might be George stumbling over something as he came in, but— Huh? But he, Monsieur Georges, he is still out, the Frenchman interrupted shrilly. Yes, but— Grand Dieu des Porcs, Grand Dieu des Coques, Grand Dieu des Artichauts, come, friend Trowbridge, for your life, for his life. For their lives, we must hasten, rush, fly to warn them of the horror which stalks by night. Oh, make haste, my friend, make haste, I beg of you. Wondering, I got into my hat and overcoat, while de Grandin thrust the heavy pistol in his outer pocket and beat his hands together as he urged me feverishly to hurry. Tell me, monsieur, he asked the mayor, where does monsieur Georges make the assignation with his sweetheart? Not at the rectory, I hope. That's the worst of it, Wilcox answered. Faloilet's forbidden him the house, so Janet slips out and meets him somewhere, and they drive around. I shouldn't be surprised if they were parked along the roadside somewhere, but only heaven knows where. With all this reckless driving and bootlegging and hijacking going on, I'm in a perfect jitter every night till he gets home, and— Name of a mannerless small blue pig, our task is ten times harder, the Frenchman interrupted. Come, friend Trowbridge— we must search the secret paths, seek out the cars secluded by the roadside, and warn them of their peril. Pardieu, I should have warned him of it ere he left the house. 7. There was something vaguely sinister in the night as we set out. A chill, not wholly due to the shrewd wind which blew in from the meadows, was biting at my nerves as we walked quickly down the winding, darkened road. Some half a dozen blocks beyond the house we came to a parked car, but when de Grandin flashed his searchlight toward it, the angry question of a strange young man informed us we had failed to find the pair we sought. Nevertheless, 
The thing responsible for the deaths which have terrorized the town is out tonight, my friends, the little Frenchman warned. We ourselves have seen it but a moment since, and— Then you stay here and see it by yourself, old chap, the young man bade, as he disengaged himself from the clinging arms of his companion, shot his self-starter, and set his car in motion. Three other amorous couples took to flight as we gave warning, and de Gronda was close upon hysteria when the darting shaft of luminance from his flashlight at last picked out the dark blue body of young Wilcox's modish roadster. As we crept softly forward, we heard a woman's voice, rich, deep contralto, husky with emotion. My darling, more to me than this world and the next it must, it has to be goodbye. There's no way I can avoid it. No other way, my dear. It's fate, the will of God. Whatever we may choose to call it, dear, but it has to be. If it were anyone else, it might be different. But you know him. You know how much he hates the world and how much such things mean to him. And if it were only that he wanted me to do it, I might defy him, though I never did before. Love might make me brave enough to do it. But it's more than that. I'm vowed and dedicated, dear. Long, long ago I took an oath upon my naked knees to do this thing, and I cannot, I dare not break it. Oh, my dearest one, why, why did I have to meet you before they had me safely in the sisterhood? I might have been happy, for you can't miss the sunshine if you've always been blind, but now— She paused and in a faint glow of the dashboard light we saw her take his face between her hands, draw his head to her, and kiss him on the lips. "'Monsieur! Mademoiselle!' the Frenchman started, but never finished speaking. Out of the blackness of surrounding night, its body but a bare shade lighter than the gloom, dreadful fleshless head and horrid eyes agleam, emerged the phantom thing we'd seen a half-hour earlier in our bedroom. The night wind whistled with a kind of hellish glee between the sable pinions of the thing's extended wings, and the gleam of phosphorescence in its hollow, orbless eye-holes was like the staring of a basilisk. I stood immobile, rooted in my tracks, and watched destruction bearing down upon the hapless lovers. Not so, de Grandin. Ça ha, monsieur l'assistant du diable. It seems we meet again. Unhappily for you he announced in a deadly, quiet voice, and as he spoke the detonation of his pistol split the quiet night, as summer thunder rends a lowering rain-cloud. Crash! Crash! the pistol roared again. The phantom thing paused, irresolute as though a will of hidden steel had suddenly been reared in its path, and as it halted momentarily the Frenchman fired again, coolly, deliberately, taking careful aim before he squeezed the trigger of his heavy weapon. A sort of crackling, like the scuttering of dry dead leaves along the autumn roads, sounded as the fearsome thing bent slowly back, tottered uncertainly a moment, then fell to earth with a sharp metallic rattle and lay there motionless, its wide black wings outspread, its scale-clad arms outflung, its legs grotesquely twisted under it. Yeah. I did not shoot too soon, it seems, de Grandin told young Wilcox cheerfully, as he neared the roadster and smiled upon the startled lovers. Had I delayed a second longer, I damn think that the papers would have told the story of another murder in the morning. I walked up to the supine monster, a sort of grisly terror tugging at my nerves, even though my reason reassured me it was dead. The eye-holes in the skull-like face still glared malevolently, but a closer look convinced me that nothing more uncanny than luminous paint was responsible for their sullen gleam. Half timidly, half curiously, I bent and touched the thing. The face was but a mask of some plaster-like substance, and this was cracked and broken just above the eyes, and through the fissure where de Grandin's ball had gone there came a little stream of blood dyeing the grey-white surface of the plaster mask a sickening rusty red. About the body and the limbs was drawn a tightly fitting suit of tough black-knitted fabric, similar to the costume of an acrobat, and to the cloth was sewn row after row of overlapping metal scales. 
One foot was clothed in what looked like a heavy stocking of the same material as the suit, while to the other was affixed two plinths of solid rubber, evidently the halves of a split rubber heel. Here was the explanation of the cloven footprint we had seen impressed upon the earth by Bostwick's house. Still grasped within the thing's right hand, there lay the handle of the oddest-looking hammer I had ever seen, heavy as a blacksmith's sledge, but fashioned like an anvil, one end a sharpened pointed cone, the other flat, but fitted with a sort of die shaped like the hoof of a gigantic goat. That's it, I murmured, as if I would convince myself. That's what was used to stamp the devil's mark upon the victim's faces. First smash the skull with the pointed end, and then reverse the weapon and stamp the victim with the devil's brand. Again I bent to touch the ghastly head, and at my touch the mask rolled sidewise, then, shattered as it had been by de Grandin's bullet, split in two parts, laying bare the face beneath. T de Grandin! I croaked hoarsely. It's... it's... Of course it is, he supplied as my lips refused to frame the name. I have known for some time it was the reverend gentleman. Who else could it have been? He turned his shoulder toward me and called across it. Leave him as he lies, my friend. He will make interesting material for the coroner. But uh, but don't you even want to look? I expostulated, horrified by his indifference. For why? he answered. I saw him when he tried to batter out my brains. That look was quite enough, my friend. Let the others gaze on him and marvel. Let us return to Monsieur Wilcox's house with these ones. There is something I would say to them, Anon. 8. De Grandin called O'Toole and told him briefly what had happened, then, having notified him where the body lay, hung up the telephone and turned a level stare upon young Wilcox and the girl. My friends, he told them sternly, you are two fools, two mutton-headed, senseless fools. How dare you trifle with the love the good God gives you? Would you despise his priceless gift? Ah, bah, I had thought better of you. But, Dr. de Grandin, Janet Payne's reply was like a wail. I can't do otherwise. I'm vowed and dedicated to a life of penance and renunciation. He made me take an oath and— Ah! The Frenchman's voice cut through her explanation. He made you, eh? Very good, tell us of it if you will be so kind. I was a little girl when he first took me, she answered, her voice growing calmer as she spoke. My parents and I were traveling in Ecuador when we came down with fever. We were miles from any city, and medical help could not be had. Mr. Faloilet came along while we were lying at the point of death in a native's hut, and nursed us tenderly. He risked his death from fever every moment he was with us, but showed no sign of fear. Mother died the day he came, and father realized he had not long to live. So when the kind clergyman offered to take me as his ward, he gladly consented and signed a document Mr. Fololet prepared. Then he died. It was a long, long time before I was strong enough to travel, but finally my strength came back and we got through to the coast. Mr. Fololet had the paper my father signed validated at the consul's office, then brought me back to this country. I never knew if I had any relatives or not. I know my guardian never looked for them. For a long time, till I was nearly twelve years old, he never let me leave the house alone. I never had a playmate, and Mr. Faloilet acted as my tutor. I spoke French and Spanish fluently, and could read the hardest Greek and Latin texts at sight before I was eleven, and had gone through calculus when I was twelve. The Book of Common Prayer and the Hymnal were my textbooks, and I could repeat every hymn from New Every Morning is the Love, to There is a Blessed Home Beyond This Land of Woe, by heart. Mon Dieu! exclaimed de Grandin pityingly. When I had reached thirteen, he sent me to a sister's school, the girl continued. I boarded there and didn't leave during vacation, so I was much more advanced than any of the other pupils, and when I was fifteen they sent me home, back to Mr. Faloilat, I mean. Of course, coming back to the lonely rectory with no company but my guardian was hard after school, and I was homesick for the convent, 
He noticed it, and one day asked me if I shouldn't like to go back to Carlinville to stay. I told him that I would, and— She paused a moment, and a thoughtful pucker gathered between her brows, as though an idea had struck her for the first time. Why, she exclaimed, why, it was no better than a trick, and— Eh bien, we do digress, mademoiselle, the Frenchman interrupted with a smile. The evidence first, if you please, the verdict afterward. You told the reverend gentleman you should like to return to the good sisters, and— And then he took me to the church, she answered, and led me to the chancel, where he made me stop and turn my stockings down, so that I knelt on my bare knees, while he held a Bible out to me, and made me put my hands on it and swear that I would dedicate myself to holy poverty, chastity, and obedience— and as soon as I had reached eighteen, would go to Carlinville and enter as a postulant, progressing to the novitiate, and finally making my profession as a nun. It was shortly after that Mr. Philoylet received the call to Norfolk Downs, and I met George, and— Her voice trailed off, and once again sobs choked her words. De Grandin tweaked the ends of his mustache and smiled a trifle grimly. I wish I had not shot him dead so quickly, he muttered to himself, then to the girl. A promise such as that is no promise at all, mademoiselle. As you yourself have said, it was a trick, and a most despicable one at that. Now listen to my testimony, mademoiselle. When Monsieur Wilcox called me to this place to look into these so strange murders, I was most greatly puzzled. The evidence of Chief O'Toole all pointed to some super-physical agency at work, and as I'd had much practice as a phantom fighter, it was for me to say what tactics I should use, for what may rout a ghostly enemy is often useless when opposed to human foes, while what will kill a human being dead is useless as a pointed finger when directed at a spirit. You apprehend? Very good. So when I learnt that Monsieur your guardian, with the funny name I cannot say, had laid the onus of these killings on a piece of broken sculpture, I was most greatly interested. Stranger things had happened in the past. Things quite as strange will doubtless happen in the future. The theory that the devil was unloosed seemed tenable, but for one little single thing. Everyone this devil killed was someone of an evil life. This is the very devil of a devil, Jules de Grandin, I tell me. Most times the evil one attacks the good. This time the evil one has singled out the evil for attack. It does not hang together. It has the smell of fish on it. We die, but of course. Accordingly, I made the careful study of your guardian. He is a very pious man. That much one sees while both his eyes are closed. Ha! <laughs> but piety and goodness are not of necessity the same. By no means. Gilles de Retz, the greatest monster ever clothed in flesh, he was a pious man, but far from being good. Cotton Mather, who hanged poor inoffensive women on the gallows tree, he was a pious man. So was Torquemada, who fouled the pure air of heaven with the burnings of the luckless Jews in Spain. They all were pious, too pious to be truly good, Pablo. The evening when I met your guardian at dinner, I studied him some more. I hear Monsieur Wilcox tell the young rabbi that the debt upon his temple is extended. How does Monsieur your guardian take that statement? It makes him ill by blue. Furthermore, he has upon his face the look of one who finds too late that he had made a great and terrible mistake— the loan would have been cold had not the money-lender died. Now, for the first time, the clergyman finds the hated Jews have profited by the Shylock's death, and he looks as if he were about to die. Jules de Grandin, this are strange, I tell me. You must keep the eye on this one, Jules de Grandin. And, Jules de Grandin, I shall do so, I reply to me. Meanwhile, he has been at great pains to tell us all once more— that these killings are the work of righteous heaven. Is it more superstition, or something else which makes him tell me this? One wonders. When he had gone, I learned that he has been a hunter and a mountain climber, that he has shot a condor down in flight. Aha, I say to me, what does this mean, if anything? The police chief has shown to me a feather clipped by his bullet from the dreadful being which commits these murders. 
I have looked at it and recognized it. Although it has been metallized by a process of electroplating, I have recognized it instantly. It is the feather of a condor. Hmm. Once more, one wonders, mademoiselle. And while we sit and talk before the fire, there come the tidings of another killing. Monsieur Bostwick has been slain. We go at once and find him in his chair, dead like a mutton, and very peaceful in his pose. Yet all his goods and chattels have been smashed to bits. The blow which killed him had done so instantly, and there is blood to mark the spot where he fell. Yet he sits in his chair. I look around and come to a conclusion. The smashing of the furniture is but a piece of window dressing to cover up the manner of the killing. But who can enter in a house where all the windows, save a single one upon the second floor, are latched, strike down a man, then vanish in thin air? I ask to know. Moreover, what was it that was seen to look into a window ten feet from the ground? I cannot answer, but the next day I find that which helps me toward conclusions. There is blood upon the ground by Monsieur Bostwick's house. A little tiny drop it is, but I take it that it fell from off the murderer's weapon. There are also footprints, most extraordinary footprints, in the soft earth by the house. The murderer have stood here, I inform me. Quite so, I agree with me. But where was he before he stood there? So upon the roof I go, and there I find a strand of horsehair. I think Monsieur your guardian is a skilled mountain climber. He had been to South America. In that land the vaqueros, or herdsmen, use lariats of plaited horsehair in their work. They find them lighter and stronger than hemp. That I remember. I remember something else. A skilled mountaineer might have lassoed the chimney of that house, have drawn himself up to the roof, then lowered himself to the open window of the second-story room. He might have struck down Monsieur Bostwick from the window, then smashed the furniture to make it seem a struggle had been had. That done, he might have closed the window after him, lowered himself to the ground by his lariat, and made off while no one was the wiser. To disengage the lasso from the chimney would have been an easy task, I know, for I have seen it done when jutting rocks instead of chimneys held the mountain climber's ropes. As he slid down his rope, he looked into the window of the hall, and when his evil mask was seen, they said it was the devil. Yes, it were entirely possible. Now, while I stood upon the roof, seeking that little strand of horsehair upon which hung my theory, who passed but your good guardian? He sees me there, and realizes I am hot upon the explanation of the crime. Anon he comes to Monsieur Wilcox's house, perhaps to talk with me and find out what I know, and I exert myself to be most disagreeable. I wish to sting him into overt action. Parbleu, I have not long to wait. This very night he comes into my room, and would have served me as he did the others, but I am not beneath his hammer when it falls, and good friend Trowbridge knocks the wind from him with a carafe. And then, too late, I learn that you and Monsieur Georges have the assignation. All well, I know, how that one will attack you if he finds you. To such a one the greatest insult is the thwarting of his will. And so I rush to warn you. The rest you know. The man was mad, I exclaimed. Of course, replied the Frenchman. He was fanatically ascetic, and you cannot make the long nose at Dame Nature with impunity, my friend. As your Monsieur Jean Hay has said, He who nature scorns and mocks, By nature is mocked and scorned. He brought his madness on himself, and— But that sulphurous blinding fire we saw! O'Toole saw it too! What was that? Have you never attended a banquet, my friend? He asked with a grin. A banquet? Whatever are you talking about? About a banquet, Pablo. "'and about the photographs they take of such festivities. "'Do you not recall the magnesium flares "'the photographers set off to take their indoor pictures? "'You, you mean it was only flashlight powder?' I stammered. "'Only that, my friend. "'Nothing more fantastic, I assure you. "'Blazing in the dark, it blinded those who saw it. "'They smelled the acrid, pungent smoke, "'and imagination did the rest. "'Voila, we have the fires of hell "'of which the good O'Toole did tell us.' Young Wilcox turned to Janet. You see, dear, he urged, that promise was extracted from you by a trick. It can't be binding. 
and I love you so much, de Grandin interrupted. There is another vow that you must take, my child, he told the girl solemnly. A, a vow, she faltered. Why, I thought, I was beginning to think. Then think of this. Can you repeat, I, Janet, take thee, Georges, to my wedded husband? A blush suffused her face, but I'll take that vow, if George still wants me, she replied. "'Wants you! Par la barbe d'un cochon vert of a surety he wants you!' the Frenchman almost shouted. "'And me? Pardieu! I greatly want a drink of brandy!' The Heart of Siva "'Is there a doctor in the house?' Sharp-toned, almost breathless, the query cut through the susurration of comment following the second divertissement offered by the Isataco Ballet Russe. The gay, chattering buzz of conversation, which characterizes every audience during the entr'acte, was hushed to a barely audible, curious murmur which rippled from lip to lip. What is it? What's happened? Is it a— Here, monsieur le directeur, Jules de Grandin announced, rising in his chair and seizing me by the shoulder. Here are two of us. We come at once. Your pardon, madame, monsieur he added to our neighbors, as, regardless of the toes he trampled and the shins he kicked, he forced his way to the aisle, dragging me behind him, and made swiftly for the passageway leading backstage from the rear of the lower tier of boxes. "'And now, monsieur, what is it, if you please?' he asked, as the iron-sheathed fire door clanged shut behind us, and we found ourselves in the dim-lit, mysterious space behind the wings. One of our girls, Mademoiselle Nicky, the perspiring manager half gulped, half gasped, mopping a dew of glistening, oily moisture from the top of his pink and hairless head with a crumpled white silk handkerchief. She was due to go on in the next number. Flora, who shares her room, had already come down and was waiting, but Nicky didn't answer the bell, and when we sent for her we found she hadn't even begun to change. She's had a seizure of some sort, I'm afraid. "'If you'll come with me, please, gentlemen.' He turned toward a winding spiral of iron stairs, his bald head gleaming in the subdued rays of a cage-protected electric light, the breath wheezing with oily sibilance between fat lips. De Grandin and I followed as best we could, picking our path between masses of scenery, across coiling, serpent-like electric cables, winding our way up the twisting stairs and finally coming to pause before a narrow metal door on which our guide knocked sharply. No answer being received, he thrust the portal open and stood aside to let us enter. The cubicle into which we stepped was reminiscent in shape, size, and general appearance of a cell in one of our more modern jails. Cement walls dressed with rough cast plaster bore penciled sketches of girls' heads, with occasional more intimate details of anatomy, accompanied here and there by snatches of decidedly un-Tennisonian verse. A cluster of electric lights set in the ceiling gave brilliant illumination to a narrow, unpainted table with two make-up boxes on it. Crumpled on the floor before the second make-up box lay a girl. As nearly as I could determine at first glance, she was clothed in a sleazy rayon kimono, figured with atrocious caricatures of green flamingos feeding from a purple pool. For the rest, bracelets, bell-hung anklets, and breast-boxes of imitation silver set with glass jewels and ear- and nose-rings of pinchbeck seemed to complete her costume. Her slim, bare body was smeared with umber grease paint in simulation of a Hindu woman's sunburnt skin and a small red cast mark set between her eyes completed the illusion. But where the coarse-haired wig of black had slipped from her forehead, there showed a thin line of pallid scalp and a straying tendril of fine light hair, proclaiming her a natural blonde. Flaccid as a cast-off rag doll she lay, one arm grotesquely doubled underneath her, the other, laden with its loops of imitation jewelry, extended toward us. Slender, dark-stained fingers with strawberry-tinted nails clutched into a little rounded fist, on which the cheap rings glittered fulgently. 
De Grandin crossed the little room in two quick strides, dropped to one knee, and took the girl's thin wrist between a practiced thumb and finger. A moment he knelt thus, then, putting out his hand, raised her left eyelid. Aha! The nasal, non-committal ejaculation, which held no hint of laughter, yet somehow conveyed an implication of grim humor that told me he had found something, something wholly unexpected. He bent again to look at her clenched hand, gently prizing the stiff fingers open, and from his waistcoat pocket produced a small lens, fitted with a collapsible tube like a jeweler's loop, set it in his eye and raised the little brown-stained hand, regarding it intently. His elbows moved, but since his back was to me, I could not tell what he was doing as he bent still closer to the inert form. At length, Monsieur, this poor one doubtless has a doublure, an understudy, he asked the manager. Why, yes, but, très bon, you would be advised to call her to the stage. Mademoiselle will not be able to appear again tonight, or ever. Elle est morte. You, you, you don't mean she's... Perfectly, monsieur. She is dead. But what are we to do? This will ruin us. Tears of terror and self-pity welled up in the manager's rather prominent blue eyes. This mustn't reach the papers, sir. That threat? That note? Ah! Uh -huh. Again that nasal, enigmatic sound, half query, half challenge. There was a note, eh? Huh? What did it say? A look of panic swept across the manager's broad face. Note? he repeated. Oh, no, doctor, you misunderstood. I was referring to a promissory note which falls due on the first. If this death becomes public, we shan't be able to meet it. Hm? Poor Nicky. The manager hurried on, obviously intent on changing the subject as quickly as might be. She seemed so well just a few minutes ago. She must have had a seizure of some sort. Seizure is the word, monsieur. De Grandin agreed grimly, fixing the other with a level stare. Then, Allez, get on, begin your show. Me, I have work to do. He fairly pushed the other from the room. Then to me, Phone for the coroner, friend Trowbridge, he commanded. Bid him come quickly for this poor one's body, if you please. Do you await him here and ask him to withhold the autopsy until he hears from me? I shall be in the rear of the auditorium, awaiting you when you have done with him. Couldn't you determine the cause of death? I asked curiously as he turned to leave. Truly, my friend, only too well. Why then can't you sign the death certificate and save Mr. Martin the bother? Mais non, the law forbids it. This so unfortunate young woman was murdered. Murdered? Précisément, most foully done to death, or I misread the signs. I found him lounging at the rear of the theatre with the studied boredom of a seasoned boulevardier, when, the girl's body entrusted to Coroner Martin's custody, I quit my lonely vigil with the dead. The third presentment of the Isataco Ballet was in progress, depicting one of those never-ending conflicts between gods and men with which the elder religions teem. Seated beneath the outstretched branches of a tree was a young ascetic, thighs doubled under him, feet soles up, resting on his crossed calves. His head sunk low upon his breast, hands lying flat, palms up upon his knees. He sat stone still in silent contemplation, whereby he sought to acquire mastery of the secrets of the universe and share the power of the gods. Far away, faint as the whisper of a lilting summer zephyr, a wind arose, stirring the foliage of the tree under which the youthful yogi sat, scattering a gay cascade of ruby-tinted blossoms over him. The crouching figure sat immobile. Now the wind lifted and the great trees bowed their heads in terror as the storm king drove his chariot across the sky. Black clouds piled menacingly, bank on bank, obscuring every shaft of light which shot down through the forest, and spears of vivid lightning stabbed the darkness, while the thunder roared a fierce, continuous cannonade. Still the yogi sat in moveless contemplation. Then suddenly a blaze of light effaced the gathering shadows, and upon a dais we saw the seated form of Siva the Destroyer, 
Cross-legged sat the god, feet doubled under him, the lithe body gleaming like burnished bronze, bare from soles to brow, save where great bands of golden circled ankles, waist and wrists, and where a heavy collar of dull gold, thick set with carven coral, rested round the neck. Upon the head was reared a coronet of seven leaping flames, and between the eyes was set the cast mark of the followers of Siva. Plainly it was a girl who impersonated the dread third person of the Indian Trimurti, but by ingenious use of lights and draperies, perspective was so altered that a second girl behind the first was totally invisible, save where her arms were thrust to right and left beneath the others, giving a perfect illusion of a human form with four pectoral limbs. Each hand of the four arms was held identically, thumbs and forefingers pressed daintily together, as though about to lift a pinch of snuff. For a moment the six-limbed form sat motionless. Then, as the orchestra began a soft andante, the arms began to move, rippling bonelessly from shoulder down to wrist, supple as twining serpents, fascinating as the movements of a reptile when it would put a spell upon its prey. Some moments this endured. Then, as though summoned by the eerie beckoning of those reptilian hands, a bevy of girls drew near, the light reflected from the brooding deity's throne shining on their rings and belts and tinkling silver anklets. These, I knew, were the Apsaras, or Huris, from the Hindu paradise, and as they neared the throne of Siva and groveled to the earth before the squatting god, their mission was made clear. For with a final gesture of its fourfold hands, the deity commanded that they exercise their wiles upon the brooding yogi, who took no note of storm or hurricane or the threatening bolts of lightning sent to drive him from his meditation. The figure of the god dissolved in darkness, and with subdued gurgles of laughter the Huris formed themselves into a ring and danced about the seated mystic, entreating him with every artifice of eastern love to look upon their charm and forget his contemplation in the pleasures of the flesh. Still no response from the brooding, seated figure. Now, covered with chagrin at failing to arouse the young man's passion, the Apsaras drew off their arms across their faces to hide the tears of shame which started to their eyes, and suddenly the music changed. No longer was it light and gay and frolicsome, a fitting tune for little silver-bangled feet to dance to. It was a sort of sensuous largo, a creeping, reptant, slowly moving thing, instinct with subtle menace as the sinuous turnings of a snake. Redolent with the sort of awful blasphemy which might attend the unclean secret worship of some band of obscene ophiolatrists. By a clever bit of stage mechanics a shadow spot was thrown upon the scene. That is, as a shaft of light might strike upon a darkened stage, picking out the figure of the actor upon which it rested, there was now centered a spot of shadow in the midst of light, and in this slowly with a sinuousness which raised the hair upon my head, with the age-old atavistic fear of all warm-blooded creatures for the snake, there danced, or rather writhed, a figure. She was not nude. Had she been so, the lewd obscenity of her would have been less repulsive. Instead she wore a skin-tight costume of fine net, transparent as air across the front, save where patches of black, green or yellow-blue sequins were sewn upon it at breast and waist and thigh. Across the back, from waist to heels, the net was set with gleaming snake scales, and a trailing train of the material swept upon the floor behind her. Upon each great and little toe of her feet there gleamed an emerald-studded ring, so that each step she took was like the forward darting of a green-eyed snake while on her arms were flesh-tight sleeves of shining scales, and on her hands were mittens, fashioned like the wedge-shaped heads of cobras de capello. Upon her head, obscuring hair and face, save for her vivid scarlet-painted mouth, was drawn a hood of flashing emerald scales. She was the daughter of Kadru, the snake goddess, sent from the realm of Takshaka, the serpent king, to do the work at which the Apsaras failed. And well she did it. Each movement was enticement and repulsion rolled into one, 
The fascinating glinting of her scales was beauty wed to horrifying menace. The slow, mesmeric movement of her hands beckoned with inducement, which combined the promise of God-forbidden joys with the pledge of sure destruction. I understood, as I watched breathlessly, how it was that mankind held the serpent in a detestation bordering on loathing, yet in the days before the old gods lost their right to worship, reared altars to the snake, and paid him honor with blood sacrifice. The young ascetic raised his eyes as the serpent daughter circled round and round his seat of meditation. At first stark horror shone upon his face. Then, slowly, came a look of wondering curiosity, at length a fascinated ecstasy of longing and desire. Her scale-clad hands danced forth to touch his cheeks, her hooded head bent toward him, and straight into his eyes she looked, red mouth provocatively parted, low laughter which was half a hiss inviting him to... what? The strain was past endurance. With a wild cry of renunciation the youth sprang up, all thought of contemplation cast aside. He had looked into the eyes of the snake-woman, and looking, cast off his hope of nirvana in favor of the promise she held out to him. Her laughter... Hard and clear as any note of silver clapper striking on a silver bell, sank lower, softened to a sibilating hiss. Her scale-sheathed arms went round his quivering shoulders. Her gleaming supple body seemed to melt and merge with his. Her hooded head sank forward. Her flaming blood-red mouth found his and sucked his soul away. He stiffened like a nerveless body shocked with electricity held taut as a violin string stretched until the breaking point is reached. Then suddenly, as though the breath she drew forth from his lips were all that held him upright, he wilted, like a candle in a superheated room, like a doll from which the sawdust has been let, like a toy balloon when punctured with a pin he wilted, dropping flaccid and lifeless in the serpent witch's cruel embrace. And as she let his limp form sink down to the moss beneath the tree, the daughter of the snake king bent above him and laughed a low and hissing laugh, a laugh of sated cruelty and triumph blended into one, but a laugh which split and broke upon a sob as she gazed down on what had been a man. Then the purple curtains clashed together and the lights went up. The final act of Isatako's ballet russe was done. For a long moment, silence reigned with the auditorium. A program dropped, and its rustle sounded like the scuttering of frost-dried leaves across a country churchyard in midwinter. A woman tittered half hysterically and checked herself abruptly, as though she'd been at vespers or at a funeral service. Then, wave on crashing wave, like breakers surging on a boulder-studded shore, applause broke forth and for fully five minutes the theatre rang with the impact of wildly clapping hands. De Grandin struck his hands together gently, but there was no enthusiasm in his gaze as the curtains swung apart, revealing the entire Isatako troupe lined up in acknowledgment of the ovation. Rather, it seemed to me, his eyes roved questingly about the auditorium, seeking something other than a farewell glimpse of the performers whom the audience applauded to the echo. At length, do you observe them too, my friend? He asked, nudging me in the side with the sharp angle of a bent elbow as he nodded toward the center aisle. I followed the direction of his nod with my glance. A party of three dark men, immaculate in faultless evening dress, correct in every detail, even to the waxen-leaved gardenias in their lapels, was walking toward the exit. The foremost man was rather under middle height and surprisingly broad across the shoulders. His arms were long, hanging nearly to his knees, and there was something simian in his rolling gait. Although his face was dark as any negro's, there was nothing negroid in his features or the straight black hair plastered smoothly to his head. Behind him walked a slightly taller man, lighter in skin, slenderer in build, and as he turned his face toward me a moment, I caught a fleeting glimpse of his eyes. Odd, opaque-looking eyes, devoid of either luster or expression. The third man of the party was younger, thin to the point of emaciation, hairless as a mummy, 
despite his youth. Without quite knowing why, I was unpleasantly impressed by them. Now, by the nightcaps of the seven Ephesian sleepers, one wonders, de Grandam muttered to himself. Wonders what? I asked. Where the fourth one went, Pablo, he answered. Five minutes, maybe six ago, another one, almost the counterpart of that sacre singe who leads, left his seat and the theatre. I should greatly like to know. They seem men of refinement, I cut in. Possibly they're from New York's Negro colony, and, and perhaps they come from hell, with the taint of brimstone on their breath, which is more likely, he retorted. Those are no Negro men, my friend. No, they are Asiatics, and Hindus in the bargain. Well, I countered, hardly knowing whether to be more exasperated than amused. What of it? Exactement. What? he answered. Come, let us go and see. Instead of leaving by the front, he led me down the farther aisle, fumbled for a moment at the leaves of a fire door, finally let us out into the alley leading to the stage entrance. Hastening down this narrow, tunnel-like passage, he came to an angle of the wall, halted momentarily, then, Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh, he exclaimed sharply. Behold, observe, my friend, I feared as much. Lying in a heap, her clothing disarranged, her straw-braid hat some distance from her, was a girl, motionless as an artist's lay figure cast aside when its usefulness is done. De Grandin dropped beside her, pressed an ear against her breast, then rising quickly stripped off his dinner coat and folded it into a pad over which he laid the girl face down, the folded garment forming a pillow under the lower part of her chest. Kneeling across her, he presented his hands firmly on each side of her back beneath the scapulae, bearing steadily while he counted slowly. Un, deux, trois. Swinging back, releasing the pressure, then leaning forward, applying it again. Whatever are you doing? I demanded. That he was applying the Schaefer method of resuscitation was obvious, but why he did it was a mystery to me. In nearly half a century of practice I had yet to see such treatment for a case of fainting. Pablo, I build a house. I go to take a ride on horseback. I attend a dinner at the foreign office. What else? He answered with elaborate sarcasm, continuing to exert alternating pressures on the prone girl's costal region. A low moan and a gasp told us that the patient was responding to his treatment, and he leaped up nimbly, raised her to a sitting posture with her back against the wall, then bent down smiling. "'You are here outside the theatre, mademoiselle,' he told her, anticipating the question with which nine fainting patients out of ten announce return to consciousness. "'Will you tell us, if you please, exactly what occurred to you before you swooned?' The girl raised both hands to her neck, caressing her throat gently with her fingertips. "'I... I scarcely know what happened, she replied. I had to get home early, so I went out before the finale, and was dressed and ready when the curtain was rung down. Just as I left the theatre, something seemed to... to fall on me. It seemed as though a great soft hand had closed around my throat, and two big fingers pressed beneath my ears. Then I fainted, and... Précisément, mademoiselle, and can you tell us if you cried for help? Why, no... You see, it took me so by surprise that I just sort of gasped and— Thank you, that explains it, he broke in. I wondered how you had survived. Now I understand. When you gasped in sudden terror, you filled your lungs with air. Thereafter, right away, immediately, you fainted, and the muscles of your neck were utterly relaxed. Squeeze as he would, he could not quite succeed in strangling you for your flaccid flesh offered no resistance to the pressure of his rumal, and the air you had inspired was enough to aerate your blood and support life until we came upon you. But it was a near thing, oh dear, one little minute longer and you would have been poof. He put his gathered thumb and fingers to his lips and wafted a kiss upward toward the summer sky. But I don't understand. No need you, mademoiselle. You were set upon— you were almost done to death, but by the mercy of a kindly heaven and the prompt advent of Jules de Grandin, you were saved. May we not have the pleasure of securing a conveyance for you? 
he bowed to her with courtly continental grace, assisting her to rise. And may one ask your name? he added as we reached the avenue, and I held up my stick to hail a cruising taxicab. She took a long appraising look on us, taking careful stock of my bald pate fringed with whitening hair, my professional beard and conservatively cut dinner clothes, then with brightening eyes took in de Grandin's English tailored suit, his trimly waxed wheat blonde moustache and sleek blonde hair. With a smile which answered that which the little Frenchman turned toward her, she answered, Certainly. I'm billed as Mademoiselle Tony on the program, but my real name's Helen Fisk. Now what? I asked as the taxi drove away. First of all, to see Monsieur le Directeur, perhaps to pull his nose, at any rate to talk to him like an uncle freshly come from Holland, he returned, leading the way back to the theatre. Monsieur Serge Orloff, managing director of Isatako's Ballet Russe, whose real name must have been quite different from the one he bore in public, sat in sweaty and uncomfortable loneliness in the little cubicle which served him for an office. "'Ah, gentlemen,' he greeted as we entered, "'I'm sure I'm very much obliged to you for what you did this evening. I suppose there'll be some charge for your uh, professional assistance?' He drew a Russia leather wallet from the inside pocket of his evening coat and fingered it suggestively. Monsieur, de Grandin told him bluntly, I think you are a liar. What? What? the other stammered. What's that? Precisely, exactly, quite so, the Frenchman answered. That note of which you spoke when first we met. It was no note of promise, and you know it very well. You also know we know it. It was a threat, a warning of some kind, and you must let us see it, right away at once. But, my dear sir, to blazing hell with your dear sirs, the note, monsieur. He thrust his hand out truculently. Orloff looked at him consideringly a moment, then, with a racial shrug, opened his wallet and gave the Frenchman a slip of folded paper. Hm? De Grandin scanned the missive rapidly while I looked across his shoulder. Manager, Isataco Ballet. Impious man. Be warned that your spectacle, La Mort d'un Yogain, is an insult to the gods it parodies. If you would save the sacrilegious women who take part in it, and yourself, from the vengeance of the great destroyer, you will discontinue it at once. Death, sure and inescapable, shall be the lot of all who further this vile insult to divinity. Be warned in time, and do not further brave the vengeance of the gods of India. Signed, The Slaves of Siva. What does it mean, the great destroyer? I asked. Siva, he replied almost petulantly. He is the third person of the Hindu triad. Brahma, the creator, is the first, Vishnu, the preserver, second, and Siva, the destroyer, the last and greatest of them all. Then to the manager, This thing, when did you get it, if you please, monsieur? About a month ago, sir. We opened in Bridgeport, Connecticut, you know, and this note was slipped under my office door the morning following the first tryout performance. Hm? And has any effort been made to enforce the threat? Before tonight? Tonight? You don't mean Nicky was a victim of— Nicky and Tony too, monsieur. The first was killed outright by a very clever piece of villainy. The second would have died by the strangling handkerchief, the rumal of the thags— had I not smelt the fish and hastened to her aid, before I surely knew that she had been attacked. Ah, oh, this is terrible, Orloff fairly wailed. I dare not let this news leak out. Oh, what shall I do? First, monsieur, you would be advised to secure police protection for your troop. Have them, and yourself as well, well guarded while entering, leaving, or within the theater. But I can't do that. That would involve publicity, and very well. The Frenchman bowed with frigid politeness. Do as you please, monsieur. I leave to hold a session at the city mortuary, and— There was no humor in the smile he turned upon the manager. Unless you act on my advice, I greatly fear that I shall see you there ere long. Colored men, 
Why, yes, sir, there's been one of them buying tickets to every performance since we opened. The ticket seller, who boasted the proud title of assistant treasurer of the Isataco Ballet, told de Grandin as we stopped before his wicket in the lobby. Funny thing, too. One of them, not always the same feller, stops here every afternoon and buys four tickets for the evening show. I don't know who he gets them for, but he's here each afternoon as regular as clockwork. Always gets the best seats in the house, too. Nodding courteous acknowledgment of the information, de Grandin sought the ticket-taker. It appeared, from what the latter had to say, that four dinges come every evening and one of them always runs out sort of early, with the other three leaving when the show lets out. Eh bien, my friend, de Grandin told me as we set out for the city morgue. It would seem there is a definite connection between the advent of those dark-skinned gentlemen, the note of warning which so disturbed Monsieur Orloff, and the death of that unfortunate young woman in her dressing-room to-night, n'est-ce pas? Coroner Martin greeted us cordially as we entered his funeral home, which also housed the city's autopsy room. No, there's been no post-mortem yet, he answered de Grandin's anxious question. Fact is, Dr. Parnell, the coroner's physician, is out of town on six weeks' vacation and as he has no official substitute, I— Ah, parbleu! Our problem then is solved, the Frenchman broke in delightedly. Appoint me in his place, monsieur, and I shall perform the autopsy at once, immediately. Yes, of course. The coroner regarded him thoughtfully. They were firm friends, the tall, grey-haired mortician and the dapper little Frenchman, and each held the other's professional attainments in high regard. By George, I'll do it. Mr. Martin agreed. It's a bit irregular, for I suppose you're not strictly a physician and surgeon regularly resident in the county, but I think my authority permits me to make such interim appointments as I choose. Have you any theory of the death? Decidedly, monsieur. This so unfortunate young woman was murdered. Murdered? Why, there's no trace of violence, or— That is where you do mistake. Observe, if you please. Crossing the brightly lighted, white-tiled room, de Grandin moved the sheet shrouding the still form upon the operating table and pointed to the inner corner of the left eye. "'You see?' he asked. Bending forward, we described the tiniest spot of black. It might have been a bead of mascara displaced from her elaborately made-up lashes, perhaps an accumulation of dust. "'Blood,' de Grandin told us solemnly. I noticed it when first I viewed the body, and I said to me, Jules de Grandin, why is it that this poor one bleeds from the eye? Has she fallen, sustained a fracture of the skull, with consequent concussion of the brain? It are not likely, I replied to me, for had she done so, she would have bled also from the nose, perhaps from the ear as well. Then I remember of a body which I once examined in France— a very cunning murder had been done that time, but physicians of the Ministry of Justice discovered him. Yes, of course, this is how it had been done. Above the eye there is a little cul-de-sac, a pouch, roofed off by the so thin bone of the supraorbital plate upon which rests the brain. A long, thin instrument of steel, like by example the pins with which the pretty ladies used to fasten on their hats, could be thrust in there, curved above the eye, and easily pierce the thin bone of the supraorbital plate. Voila, the instrument punctures the frontal lobe, a hemorrhage results, and a synthetic apoplexy takes place. Death follows, you see? Mais c'est très simple. And, my friends, he turned his level, unwinking cat stare on each of us in turn. The murderer in that other case was an Asiatic, a Hindu. The technique in that case was like that in the case before us. I damn suspect the nationality of the murderers is similar, too. Come, let us see if Jules de Grandin is mistaken. With the uncanny speed and certainty which characterized all his surgery, he set to work with bistery and saw and chisel, laid the scalp, and lifted off the skull vault. Observe him, gentlemen, he ordered, pointing with his knife blade to the dissected frontal lobe. Here is the blood clot which caused death. And here, he directed our attention to the neatly sawed skull, you will observe the small hole in the roof of the orbit, the hole by which the instrument of death penetrated the brain. Is it not all plain? 
I had to look a second time before I could discern the hole. But at length I saw it. There was no doubt of it. The roof of the supraorbital plate had been pierced, and death had followed the resultant brain hemorrhage. Good heavens! This is fiendish! exclaimed the coroner. Perfectly, agreed de Grandin placidly. And you suspect the murderer? I am certain that he is one of four whom I did see to-night, but which one I cannot surely say. Moreover, alas, knowing and proving are two very different things. Our next task is to match our knowledge with our evidence, and— The buzzer of the operating-room telephone broke through his words, and with a murmured apology Mr. Martin crossed the room and took up the receiver. What? At the Hotel Winfield? he demanded sharply. Yes, I have it. O-R-L-O-F-F, -F. right. Send Jack and Tommy over with the ambulance. What is it, Monsieur Martin? de Grandin asked, and as the coroner turned from the phone I felt my pulses beating faster. Oh, answered Mr. Martin wearily. It's another case for us. Mr. Orloff, the manager of the Isataco Ballet, has just been found dead in his room at the Hotel Winfield. Non, da non, da non, da non, so soon! cried Jules de Grandin. I warned the silly avaricious fool of his danger, but he valued gold above life and would not have police protection, and— Quick, monsieur, he besought Martin. Bid them hold the ambulance. Friend Trowbridge and I must accompany them. We must see that body. Observe the way it lies and all surrounding circumstances before it has been moved. Stripping off rubber gloves and apron, he thrust his arms into his dinner jacket— seized me by the elbow and fairly dragged me up the stairs to the garage, where the ambulance was waiting, engine purring. "'You're sure one of those men we saw in the theatre tonight killed that girl?' I asked, as we dashed through the midnight street, our howling siren sounding strident warning. "'But certainly,' he answered. "'We have the similarity of technique in the stabbing through the eye. We have the threatening note to Monsieur Orloff.' We have the circumstance of attempted garroting of Mademoiselle Hélène. Last of all, this. From an envelope he produced a strand of crisp black hair. I found it bedded under the fingernail of the dead girl when I examined her remains in the theatre, he explained. She put up some resistance, but her assailant was too powerful. But this is curly hair, I objected. Those men all had perfectly straight hair, and— On their heads, yes, he conceded. But this is hair from a beard, my friend. What then? The fourth man, the one who left the theatre before the others, wore a beard. That it was he who attempted to garrote Mademoiselle Hélène in the alley, I am certain. That he also killed poor Mademoiselle Nicky in her dressing-room, I am convinced. But how can you prove it? Ha! Ah, there is the pinch of the too tight shoe, he agreed ruefully. To la même, if it can be proved, Jules de Grandin is the man to do it. He is one devilish clever fellow, that de Grandin. Sprawled supinely across his bed, eyes staring sightlessly at the ceiling, mouth slightly agape, tongue protruding, lay the little fat manager of the Isataco Ballet. It needed no second glance to tell that he was dead, and it required only a second look to tell the manner of his dying. Around his throat, just above the line of his stiffly starched dress collar, was a livid, anemic depression no wider than a lead pencil, but so deep it almost pierced the skin. Habituated to viewing both the processes and results of violent death, de Grandin crossed the room with a rapid stride, took the dead man's hand between his palms and slowly raised it. It was as though the head were joined to the body by a cord rather than a column of bone and muscle for there was no resistance to the little Frenchman's slender hands as the dead chin nodded upward. Pableau, again? de Grandin muttered. What? I asked. It is the strangler's mark, my friend, he answered, fingering the dead man's broken neck with delicately probing fingers. Nothing but a thug's garrote leaves a mark like this and breaks the neck in this manner. One trained in the murder school of Calica has done this thing, and— huh? Ah, huh? que diable! Bending forward, suddenly he raised the manager's clenched hand. 
Protruding from between the first and second finger was a wisp of black curling hair. Pablo, he sheds his hair as an old hen drops feathers at the molting season, that one, the Frenchman muttered grimly. And son du diable, I shall drag him to his death by those self-same hairs, or may I eat fried turnips for my Christmas dinner. Whatever are you vaporing about? I demanded. This, mon dieu, he answered sharply. Even as the poor young Mademoiselle Niki, this unfortunate man grappled unavailingly with his assailant. In his case, as in hers, the murderer leant close to do his work, and in each instance his victim grasped him by the beard, yet could not hold him. But they managed to pluck away a hair and hold it in their hands as death came to them. The inference is clear, unmistakable. The same man did both murders. Well? By damn it, no, it is not well at all, my friend. It is quite entirely otherwise. Attend me. This sacre killer, this strangler, this stabber in the eye, he is emboldened by success. He thinks, because he has been able to do these things, that he can continue on his road of wickedness. These crimes I make are unexplained, he says to him. These western fools are frightened, but they know not what it is they fear. Voila, I continue in the future as in the past, killing when and where I please, and no one shall suspect me or call me to account. Say you so, Monsieur l'Assassin. Be happy while you may. Jules de Grandin has his nose upon your trail. But no, Monsieur, not by no means. There it is you make the grand mistake. De Grandin assured Mr. Masakowski, the new manager of the Isataco Ballet next morning. Your decision to abandon this enterprise will prove financially disastrous. It will stamp you as a weakling. It will also greatly inconvenience me. Masakowski, a lean, hawk-nosed man with the earmarks of southeastern Europe written large upon him, regarded the little Frenchman with a look in which fear and cupidity were almost evenly blended. I'd like to carry on the show, he admitted. The house is a sellout, and we're turning him away for the next three nights, but, well, you know what happened last night. Orloff's dead, murdered, I've heard it said, and Nicky died mighty strangely in her dressing room, too. Now Julia and Ricarda are reported absent. I called their house when they were half an hour late, and the landlady said they didn't even come home last night. Something darn funny about that. He broke off, drumming on the cigarette-burned edge of his desk with long, nervous fingers. De Grandin tweaked the needle ends of his tiny blonde mustache. You tell me two young ladies of the chorus are missing? he asked. Not from the chorus. They were principals, Masakowski returned. You remember the last episode, The Death of a Yogi, where, after thunder and lightning and tempest fail to rouse the ascetic from his contemplation, Siva appears and summons the snake queen to put her spell on him? Julia and Ricarda take the part of Siva. It's no cinch for two people to be as perfectly synchronized in movement as those girls are. The illusion they give of a single body with four arms is perfect, and took a lot of rehearsing. With them out of the show, we'll have a tough time getting on. And we can't cut out that number. It's the hit of the piece. And have you no understudies for them? Masakowski ran a thin, artistically long hand through thick, artistically long hair. That's just the trouble, he almost wailed. Tony's understudied Julia, and we've another girl who can fill in with the second pair of arms, but they won't act. They say there's a jinx on the part, and absolutely refuse to go on, and I can't rehearse another pair of girls in time for the evening show, so... Mademoiselle Tony, de Grandin interrupted. She is here, perhaps. Yes, she's here, all right, but... Très bon. Me, I shall see her, talk with her, persuade her. I have the influence with that young lady. Yeah? The manager was unimpressed. Get her to take that part tonight, and I'll give you and your friend season passes to any seats in the house. Agreed by Blue, the little Frenchman answered with a smile, and led the way backstage, where electricians, performers, and stagehands discussed the tragedy of the preceding night in the quaint jargon of their kind. Hola, mademoiselle. Comment allez-vous? de Grandin hailed Miss Fisk with a smile. Oh, good morning the girl returned. Awful about Monsieur Orloff, ain't it? 
deplorable, agreed the Frenchman. But if the so superb performance should cease on that account, the calamity would be complete. It rests entirely on your charming shoulders, mademoiselle. Huh? She eyed him with quick suspicion, then satisfied that he was serious. How do you mean? He motioned her away from her companions before replying, then whispered, Monsieur, the manager tells me you will not consent to do the dance of Siva. I'll tell the cockeyed world I won't, she broke in vehemently. Someone's hung the Indian sign on that job, and I ain't asking for nothing, believe you me. First Felicie and Daphne take a powder on us, then this morning, right after Monsieur Orloff dies, Ricarda and Julia turn up missing. Now they want me to take it on. Not much. Mille pardons, mademoiselle, de Granda answered in bewilderment. What is it that you say concerning Mademoiselle Daphne and Felicie? They took a remedy? No, I do not comprehend. A little gurgling laugh forced itself between the girl's pretty, brightly painted lips. Then, with sudden seriousness, she explained. A month ago, when the show was having its tryout up in Bridgeport, old Orloff got some sort of note that scared him speechless. None of us knew just what it was, but he was like a feller with the finger on him tore his hair, or went through the motions, rather, seeing he was bald as a skinned onion, and swore some enemy was out to wreck the show. Well, anyhow, he was more scared than a cat at a dog show for the next four days. Then when nothing happened, he kind of cooled down. But you should have seen him when Daphne and Felicie quit us without notice. You'd have thought, quit how? He cut in. How? Just quit, that's all. They left the theater Saturday night and never showed up again. None of us have heard a word from either of them, unless... She halted, and a shiver, as though from sudden chill, ran through her scantily clad, exquisite form. Unless that statue... Again that odd, half-frightened halt in speech. Again a shudder of repulsion. The statue, mademoiselle? De Grandin prompted as she made no move to finish. Sure. That's another damn funny thing about this business, Doctor. We'd just struck this burg, city, I mean, when an express van backs up to the theater with that statue all crated up and addressed to Monsieur Orloff. There was an anonymous note with it, too. An anonymous? de Grandin began questioningly, then. Ah, may we, one apprehends. And this anonymous message, mademoiselle, it said what, if you remember? It sounded kind of nutty to me. Something about some sculptor having seen the show in Bridgeport and fallen ravishingly in love with the dance of Siva. Some such nonsense. And how he'd set up day and night chiseling out a representation of the divine pantomime or something. And wouldn't Monsieur Orloff please accept this token of an anonymous admirer and well-wisher? Or something like that. Old Orloff. Monsieur Orloff, I mean, was pleased as punch with it and had it set up in the lobby. It's out there now, I guess, but I don't know. The thing always gave me the creeps. It looks so much like Daphne, and every time I went past it, it seemed like she was somewhere trying to tell me something, and couldn't. So I just quit looking at it. Now Julia and Ricarda have vanished into thin air, as the fella says, just like Daphne and Felicie. And I should take Daphne's place? I guess not. My mother didn't raise any half-wit children. De Grandin gave his small mustache a soft, affectionate pat, then twisted its twin needle points with such sudden savagery that I feared he'd tear them loose from his face. Mademoiselle, he asked abruptly. You are Irish, are you not? Yes, of course, but what's that got to do with it? Much, everything, perhaps. Your people see much farther through the mysteries of life and death than most. Will you await us here? We would examine this statue which affects you so unpleasantly. The statue of Siva stood upon a three-foot onyx pedestal in the theater's main lobby, and represented a slender, graceful, four-armed female figure seated cross-legged, feet drawn up so far that they rested in step down upon the bent thighs, soles upward. A pair of arms which grew naturally from the shoulders were bent at obtuse angles, thumbs and fingers daintily joined, as though holding a pinch of powder. 
Immediately below these arms there sprang from the axillae a second pair of limbs, which extended outward to right and left, the right hand clasping what appeared to be a wand tipped by an acorn, the left hand cupped, a twisting flame of fire rising from its hollowed palm. Upon its head was set a seven-spindled crown. The head was slightly bent, eyes closed, a look of brooding calm upon the small, regular features. The whole thing was executed in some smooth, black, gleaming substance. Whether lacquered bronze, ebony, or stained and varnished plaster, I could not say. And the workmanship was exquisitely fine. Even the tiny lines in the palms of the hands and soles of the feet, and the scarcely perceptible serrations in the lips, being represented with a faithfulness exactly reproducing nature. Save for a gem-studded collar, armlets, bracelets, and anklets, the form was nude, but the gently swelling breasts were so slim and youth-like as almost to suggest a being of a neuter gender, a form endowed with grace, charm, and beauty, yet sexless as an angel of the apocalypse. De Grandin walked slowly round the sculptured figure, examining it critically. By blue, he murmured. He was no jerry workman, the one who made this thing. But no, his technique, it is... God, dear, my friend, I think it too perfect. Vaguely, I understood his criticism. No connoisseur of art, I was yet aware of some subtle difference between the life-sized effigy before us and other works of sculpture. Other statues I had seen suggested life, action, or emotion, expressing their themes through representation rather than through reproduction. This thing was no simulacrum of humanity. It was humanity's own self, complete to the tiniest, faintest anatomical detail and it differed from other statuary as a bald and literal photograph differs from a portrait done in oils. Something not to be defined, something which impressed no physical sense, yet which impressed me sharply, repulsed me as I looked upon the statue. Morbleu! The little Frenchman's sharp ejaculation brought me back from the thoughtful mood into which I'd lapsed. Les mouches, my friend, do you see them? Eh? I asked. Mouche? Flies? Where? There, Cordieu, he answered in a low, hard whisper. See, regard, observe them, if you will. His slender, well-manicured forefinger pointed dramatically to several tiny inert forms, lying on the polished plinth on which the statue sat. They were a half-dozen common houseflies, still and dead, some turned back down, some lying on their sides. Well? I asked wonderingly. "'Well be baked and roasted on the grates of hell,' he answered shortly. "'Your nose, my friend, can you use it? What is it that you smell?' Seizing me by the neck, he thrust my face forward so violently that I thought he'd bruise my nose against the statue's polished ebon surface. "'Smell, smell! Smell it, mon Dieu!' he commanded angrily. Obediently I contracted my nostrils in a sniff, then wrenched loose from his grip. Why, it smells like, like formalin, I muttered. Smells like formalin, he mimicked. Grand Dieu de Parc, it is formalin, great stupid head. What does it hear? Why, I began, but... Pable, yes, you have said it. Why, he interrupted. Why and double why, my friend. That is the problem we are set to solve. Drawing a letter from his jacket, he emptied the envelope, swept the defunct insects into it, and placed it tenderly in his waistcoat pocket. Now for Mademoiselle Hélène, he announced, leading the way backstage once more. Mademoiselle, he whispered, when the girl, obedient to his beckoning finger, joined us in a secluded corner. You must go on tonight. You and Mademoiselle Dorothée must impersonate the great god Siva at tonight's performance. I— Says you, the girl broke in. Listen, I'm not taking any chances with that part. Last night some darn fool was whistling in his dressing room, and you know how unlucky for the show that is. I know it. Didn't I like to get choked to death as I was leaving the theater? This morning on my way here I ran head-on into a cross-eyed man, and a black cat and two kittens crossed my path just as I turned into the alley to the stage door. Think I'm going to take on that hoodoo part with all them signs against me? Not much. Four girls who did that Siva dance before have disappeared. 
How do I know what's happened to him? Who knows? I do. De Grandin's interruption was sharp as cutting steel. I can say what their fate was. They were murdered. My God! Amazement, incredulity, but strangely little fear showed in the girl's startled face. Perfectly, mademoiselle. Mademoiselle Nicky and Monsieur Orloff, they were murdered too, if not by the same hand, undoubtlessly by the same gang. Attend me. His voice was low, scarcely above a whisper, but freighted with such authority that the girl forbore to interrupt. Though we saw curiosity pressing at her lips like water at a straining dam when the freshets swell the streams in springtime, I have every reason to believe these deaths and disappearances were due to a campaign of murder and intimidation, subtly planned and craftily carried out by a quartet of the shrewdest criminals which the world has ever seen, he continued. I tell you this because I think you can be trusted. Furthermore, mademoiselle, because I think you have the courage of your splendid Irish race, I ask that you will do this dance tonight, perhaps tomorrow night, and several nights thereafter. The miscreants who murdered Mademoiselle Nicky, Felicie, and Daphne, who killed Monsieur Orloff, and also doubtless did away with Julia and Ricarda, will unquestionably attempt your life if you perform this dance. For your protection you have only Jules de Grandin and Le Bon Dieu. Yet it is only by luring them to attack you that we may hope to apprehend them and make them pay the penalty for their misdeeds. I do not minimize the danger. Though heaven, especially when it has Jules de Grandin as ally, is mighty to protect the innocent. Will you accept the risk? Will you help us in our aim to fulfill justice? For a long moment Helen Fisk looked at him as though he were a total stranger. Then, gradually, a look of hard determination came into her face, a stiffening in her softly moulded chin, a hardening in her eyes of Irish blue. I'll do it, she agreed. God knows my teeth will be chattering so as I can't say my hail marries, but I'll take it on. If it's the only way to get the scum that did in Felicie and Daphne, I'm game to try. But I'll be so scared. Not you. I know your kind. You will laugh at danger, de Grandin told her. But, yeah, I'll laugh at it all right. From the teeth out, Miss Fisk cut in. N'importe, that you do laugh at all is all that matters he assured her. Mademoiselle, je vous salue. He bent his sleek, blonde head, and a quick flush mounted Helen Fisk's cheeks as, for the first time in her life, she felt a man's lips on her fingers. He was busy in the laboratory most of the afternoon, and when he finally emerged he wore a faintly puzzled look upon his face. It was formalin, beyond a doubt, he announced. But why? It are most puzzling. What is? I asked. The manner of those flies' demise. I have examined their so small corpses, and all are filled with formaldehyde. Something lured them to that sacre effigy of Siva, and there they met their death, died before one could pronounce the so droll name of that Monsieur Jacques Robinson, and died by formalin poisoning. The statue, too, as you can testify, gave off the perfume of formaldehyde, but why should it be so? Hanged if I know. I answered. It's really a most remarkable piece of work, that statue. Someone with an uncanny gift for sculpture must have seen that dance, and been so inspired by it that he made the thing and gave it to poor Orloff. But, quite yes, that is the story we have heard, he acquiesced. But has it not the smell of fish upon it? Artists, I know, are not wont to hide their light beneath a bushel basket. But no, rather they will seek for recognition till it wearies you. Why then should a man with talent such as this one had seek anonymity? Such modesty rings counterfeit, my friend. Well, I temporized. Vanity takes strange forms, you know, sometimes. Vanity, ah, tu parles, mon ami. With a sudden dramatic gesture, he struck both hands against his temples. Oh, Jules de Grandin, thou great stupid head! How near they came to giving you the little fish of April, even as they did to poor dead Orloff. But no, you are astute, shrewd, clever, mon brave. They shall not make the monkey out of you. Au revoir, my friend. He flung across his shoulder as he hurried from the room. 
I have important duties to perform. Be sure you're at the theatre on time. A spectacle not upon the programme will be shown tonight, unless I greatly miss my guess. Trying to look as unself-conscious as possible, and succeeding very poorly, Detective Sergeant Jeremiah Costello, star sleuth of the Harrisonville Police Force and bosom friend of Jules de Grandin, strolled back and forth across the theatre lobby, his obviously seldom-used dinner clothes occasioning him more than a little embarrassment. Here and there, amid the fashionable audience hurrying toward the ticket-taker's gate, I described other plainclothes men all equally uncomfortable in formal clothes, but all alert, keen-eyed, watchful of every face among the crowd. The effigy of Siva, I noted, had been taken from the lobby. Backstage, uniformed men mounted guard at every vantage point. It would have been impossible for anyone not known to have gone ten feet toward dressing rooms or wings without being challenged. Outside in the alley, by the stage door, a patrolman supplemented the guardianship of the regular watchman, and a limousine was parked across the alleyway, a uniformed policeman in the tonneau, another perched alertly in the cab beside the chauffeur. The show began as usual. Spectacle followed spectacle, each in turn being hailed with tumultuous applause. When the death of a yogi was presented, we watched breathless, as Helen Fisk and her partner did the sitting dance of Siva, and the daughter of Kadru lured the young ascetic's soul from out his body with her venomed Judas kiss. Well, so far everything's all right, I congratulated as the purple curtains drew together before the stage, but de Grandin cut my optimistic statement short. Will you observe them, my friend? he whispered jubilantly, driving his sharp elbow into my ribs. How bleu do they not look as sad as the stones in the road? Up the center aisle, with anger, something like chagrin upon their swarthy faces, came the same trio we had noted on the previous occasion. With them, whispering excitedly to the slender, light-hued man, was a short, thick-set, bearded ruffian, impeccable in evening dress, but plainly out of place in Occidental clothes. He was black as any negro out of Africa, but his straight black hair and curling beard parted in the center, and the wild fanatic rolling of his bloodshot eyes labeled him an Asiatic, and one habituated to the use of opium or hashish, I guessed. A little while ago he rose and left the others, de Grandin whispered with a chuckle. When he went out he looked for all the world like Madame Puss intent on dining on canary bird. When he returned, parbleu, he made me think of a small dog who creeps back to his master with his tail between his legs. The gendarmes we had set on watch had spoiled his fun completely. Convoyed by policemen, the members of the Isataco troop left the theatre, their guardians staying with them till their doors were safely locked. Now I'm after thinking we can go to bed, sirs. Costello asked, as he reported all the actors had been safely taken home. "'There is a guard at Mademoiselle Hélène's house?' de Grandin asked. "'There is that, sir,' the sergeant answered. "'I've got a filly on patrol in the street, and another in the alley at the back. I'm thinking it'll be a damn smart man as gets into that young lady's house tonight without her invitation.' The little Frenchman nodded thoughtfully, then— Suppose we go and see that all is well before we take a good-night drink, he suggested. It was I who urged her to perform that dance tonight. I would not have my conscience tell me I had failed to give protection to her in case she suffered injury. The street in which Helen Fisk lodged was flanked by double rows of narrow, tall brick houses, flat-fronted, monotonous, uniform as a company of grenadiers. As I drew my car to a halt beneath the lamp-post which stood before the lodging-house, a uniformed policeman suddenly materialized from the darkness, glanced inquiringly at de Grandin and me, then saluted smartly as he recognized Costello. "'Everything okay, O'Donnell?' the sergeant asked. "'Yes, sir, quiet as a graveyard at midnight so far,' the officer replied. "'I ain't even seen a—' A sudden burst of light, dazzling as a very flare— followed by the sharp staccato rat-tat-tat of machine-gun fire, cut short his words. "'Glory be to God!' Costello cried. "'What the hell?' 
Dragging at the pistol in his shoulder holster, he hastened down the street toward the intersecting roadway whence the disturbance came, followed full tilt by Officer O'Donnell. A moment later another form emerged from the shadow of the house, and the street lamp glittered momentarily on brass buttons and silver shield, as the patrolman who had mounted guard at the rear hurried past to join Costello and O'Donnell in the chase. Par la barbe d'un poisson vert, began de Grandin, then. Up, my friend, up, quickly. I fear it is a ruse to draw away the guards. We must act quickly. Fairly dragging me by a reluctant elbow, he rushed up the short flight of brownstone steps leading to the rooming-house door, pressed upon the panels with an impatient hand, and stepped quickly into the dimly lighted hall. You see? he asked in a fierce whisper. The door is unlocked, open. How comes it? For a brief instant he bent to examine the fastenings, then— "'Observe him, my friend,' he commanded. "'Looking where he pointed, I descried a thin wedge of wood, "'like a matchstick sharpened to a point, thrust into the Yale lock, "'making it impossible for the latch to fly into position "'when the catch had been released. "'Diablerie,' he muttered. "'Costello and the others, they have gone in chase of the wild goose. "'Come, we must find Mademoiselle Hélène right away, at once.' "'I heard her say she lived on the third floor,' I whispered. But whether front or back, I don't... No matter, he cut in. We shall find her. Prie Dieu, we find her first. Up, my friend, mount the front stairs while I go up the back. We shall meet at the top floor. And should you see another coming down, detain him at all costs. We cannot take the chances now. He scuttled down the hall and led himself through the swing door which communicated with the kitchen, waving encouragement and haste to me as he disappeared. Walking as softly as I could, I crept up the stairs leading to the second floor, began ascending the narrow spiral flight which gave access to the top story. At last, rather out of breath, paused at the entrance to the long and narrow hallway which bisected the third floor of the house. Although there were two fixtures set into the wall, only a single electric bulb was burning, and by its rather feeble glow I discerned narrow, white-enameled doors opening to right and left upon the corridor, like staterooms on the passage in a steamship cabin. The place was utterly untenanted, not even a mouse disputing my possession. A moment I paused, waiting for de Grandin. Then, as no sign of him appeared, I took a tentative step or two toward the rear of the house, ears attuned for his step upon the stairs. A faint, light click, like the slipping of a well-oiled lock, sounded at my back, and as I turned something whistled past my face, a sharp pop sounded, and the electric bulb burst with a little spurt of fire. Next moment the hallway was drowned in devastating, smothering darkness. Half terrified, I paused a moment in my tracks. Then, fumbling for my match case, I struck a light and held the little torch above my head. Oh! I exclaimed involuntarily, shrinking back a step. Creeping stealthily on hands and knees, like an obscene and monstrously overgrown spider, was a man, a small, scrawny, dark-visaged man, silent as a snake in his sinister progress. As the matchlight shone momentarily on him, it glinted eerily on the blade of a short, curved dagger clenched between his teeth. Brief as my inspection was, I recognized him as one of the quartet of Hindus we had seen in the theater. For a moment I stood frozen, aghast. Then, marshalling my courage, I challenged sharply. A halt! Stand where you are, or I'll shoot! Reaching in my waistcoat pocket, I clicked the cover of my glasses case, hoping desperately that it simulated the sound of a revolver being cocked. A low, soft laugh, sinister as the hissing of a serpent, answered me and the fellow rose to his feet, raising his hands level with his ears and grinning at me maliciously. "'Will the sahib shoot me, then?' he asked, letting the knife fall from between his teeth. "'Is there no mercy in your head for me, Bazour? The words were humble, abject, but the tone was gravid with biting irony. "'Turn around,' I ordered gruffly. "'Now march, and no tricks or—' So near my ears I heard its whistling descent, 
So close to my face I felt its rough, hairy strands brush my nose tip. Something whirled snake-like through the darkness, looped about my neck and jerked sharply back, squeezing the life-breath from my throat, forcing my tongue and eyes forward with the sudden ferocity of its strangling grip. The throttling knot drew tight and tighter round my trachea. Bone-hard, merciless knuckles kneaded swiftly, savagely at my spine where it joined the skull, seeking to break my neck. I tried to cry for help, but nothing but a stifled gurgle sounded from my swelling lips. Burned out, the match fell from my numbing fingers, and darkness blotted out the sneering face in front of me. Tiny sparks danced and flashed before my eyes. A roaring like the downpour of a dozen Niagara's pounded in my ears. This is how poor Orloff died, I thought, fighting vainly to escape the strangling coil about my neck. A sudden shaft of sharp white light stabbed through the darkness, illuminating the Hindu's face before me for a fleeting moment. In the flash I saw the grinning mouth square open like an old Greek horror mask, saw the swift shadow of a slim white hand, and something else, pass like a darting ray of light across the dusky throat an inch or so below the chin, saw the welling spate of blood which gushed across the writhing tongue and gleaming teeth. Then came a horrid, choking gurgle as of something drowning, and the light blinked out. But, spawn of this sewer, species of a stinking camel, take that to hell and say I gave it to you. De Grandin's whisper sounded in my ear, and the strangling cord loosed its biting grip as the man behind me gave a grunt of surprised pain and fell forward, almost oversetting me. I turned about, clutching at the wall for support, and beheld my late assailant rolling on the floor, mouthing and slobbering horribly as he hugged both hands to his abdomen. I... His scream of mortal agony no thicker than the squeaking of a frightened mouse, and even that died in an anguished wheeze. From crotch to sternum he was slit as cleanly as a butcher slits a slaughtered hog for gutting. I leaned against the wall, weak with retching nausea at the spectacle de Grandin's pocket torch disclosed. It is a good cut, that, the little Frenchman announced softly as he tiptoed across the hall, fumbled a moment and switched on the electric light. Me, I rather favor it for autopsy work, although the general preference is for the vertical incision beginning at the— Oh, don't, I pleaded, near to swooning at the sight the lighted hall lamp brought to view. Face downward on the floor lay the fellow I had apprehended, the ever-widening pool of blood which soaked into the carpet telling of his severed throat. Only the tremulous, spasmodic twitching of his clawing fingers told me that he still retained some little spark of life. Hunched on one shoulder, the cord with which he sought to strangle me still gripped in his hand, lay the other Hindu, blood gushing from the foot-long incision which ran vertically up his abdomen. Jules de Grandin stood at ease, regarding his handiwork with every evidence of scientific satisfaction, a long, curved, bladed kukri knife, wetted to a razor edge, dangling by a thong from his right hand. Eh bien, mon vieux, you look as triste as hell upon a rainy Sunday afternoon, he told me. Is it that you have never seen the cover stripped from off the human entrails? You a medical practitioner, a surgeon, an anatomist. A bar for shame, my friend. You stand there quaking like a student making his first trip to the dissecting room. But... I gasped, still faint with stomach sickness. This is too wrong again, my old one, he corrected with a grin. Not two, but three. When I left you down below, I crept all softly up the stairs until I readied the turn between this story and the one beneath. Ah, and what did I see there? What but a sacre son of Mother India going on all fours like a sly boots up the stairs ahead of me? Oh, very silently he went. So silently he made no sound at all. He had to be seen to be believed, that one. What to do? I had my pistol, and I had my very useful knife as well. Should I shoot, I could not miss him. But what if there were others? The noise would surely put them on their guard, and I desired to surprise them. Accordingly, I chose the knife. I crept a little faster and reached my silent friend before he guessed that I was there at all. Then, very gently... I inserted my knife tip between his second and third cervical vertebrae. Voila. 
He died with exemplary expedition, and with no unnecessary noise. Very good, I tell me, so far so perfect. Then, still silently, I continued on my upward way. I came into the hall, and what did I behold? I asked to know. You, Cordieu, standing at the stairhead, as innocent as any unborn lamb, while crouched behind an angle of the wall, immediately in front of me, a thief-faced rascal was watching you. But, ah, even as I saw this, I saw another thing. A door opened very softly in the hall behind you, a bearded ruffian, the same one we had seen in the theatre, peered forth, raised up a little stick of wood, and flung it quickly at the light. He broke the bulb, and you were left in darkness. I heard you stumble in the dark. I saw you light a match, and by its light I saw you parley with the miscreant with the knife. Tiens, I also saw the other one advance upon you from the rear drop his strangling cord about your throat, and begin the pleasant process of choking you to death. This thing has ceased to be a joke, I tell me. It's our time that Jules de Grandin put a stop to it. You saved my life. No doubt of it, I told him. I'm very grateful. Shit, it was a pleasure, he cut in, looking complacently at the stiffening bodies on the floor before us. Come he commanded. We must find Mademoiselle Hélène. She was not in the room from which the bearded man attacked you, for that door had not been forced, and I particularly warned her to bar her door tonight. These other doors have not been opened, for the two who came before me up the stairs had no chance to get in mischief ere I found them. Therefore it follows that... Ah, que diable! He broke off, pointing to the lower margin of the door beside which we stood. Where the door and sill came together, a tiny hole, scarcely large enough to let a man insert his finger, had been gouged, and a little pile of fresh sawdust lay about the hole. Well, I began, but not at all by no means. It is very damn unwell, I suspect, he interrupted. One does not surely know, of course, but... He rose and beat upon the panels. Mademoiselle! Mademoiselle Hélène! he called softly. Are you there? Answer if you are, but on no account get off the bed. Who is it? Helen Fisk's voice responded. Dr. de Grandin? Is anything wrong? We hope not, but we fear the worst, he answered. Stay where you are for your life, mademoiselle, and do not be alarmed when we break in the door. I'll let you in, the girl replied, and we heard a rustling of the bed linen, and... No! Pour la mort de Dieu, do not set foot to the floor, I beg! he shouted, We come! Retreating to the far side of the hall, he charged full tilt against the bedroom door, driving his shoulder against the white enameled panels, bursting the flimsy lock, and half running, half stumbling into the pitch-dark room. Stand back, friend Trowbridge. Remain upon your bed, mademoiselle, he warned, pausing at the threshold and darting his flashlight quickly about the apartment. Death lies in wait upon the floor, and— Ah? Huh? So— like a pouncing cat, he leaped across the cheap rag rug with which the room was carpeted, his searchlight playing steadily upon a tiny, cord-like black coil beneath a chintz-upholstered chair. With a slanting, chopping motion, he brought his big curved knife-blade down once, twice, and yet again, dividing the tiny snake into half a dozen fragments with the slicing blows. Ah, little brother to the devil, you are quick, but I am quicker. You are venomous, but so am I, pardieu he cried. Go back to hell from whence you came, and tell those other snakes I sent you there to keep them company. They too have felt this knife tonight. What is it? cried Miss Fisk and I in chorus. He danced across the room, turned on the light, then, with the air of a gallant assisting a fine lady from her coach, put out his hand and helped the girl down from the bed. Do not approach too near, my beautiful, he warned. Those tiny tender feet of yours might take a wound from him, dead though he be. What is it? Straight and slim as a boy in her close-cropped hair and shantung silk pajamas, Helen Fisk looked with more curiosity than fear at the dismembered little serpent underneath the chair. A krait, Pablo, he answered. Bungarus querulens, the zoologists call him, and he is not a customer to trifle with by any means. No, Cordieu, 
Had you stepped from off your bed, and had he sunk those little so small fangs into your foot or ankle? Dirige domine in conspectu tuo via meum, the good priests would have sung for you, ma chère. For death follows his bite in from six to eight minutes. Little cousin to the cobra that he is, his bite is far more deadly than that of his disreputable big kinsman. God, you took a chance with it, the girl exclaimed admiringly. Not very much, he admitted, stroking his moustache complacently. He can strike only his own length, and my knife was a good two inches longer than his body. But how'd he come to get in my room? she asked, bewildered. Dispose there's any more of them here? No, to your second question, mademoiselle. Through a hole bored in your door to your first, he answered, smiling. Those sons of sin cut a little, so small opening in the door, sent their silent messenger of death into your room, and were about to decamp when... We detained them, friend Trowbridge and I. To me, he added, That accounts for that fellow's knife, mon ami. It was with that he bored the hole in Mademoiselle Hélène's door, and he was doubtless about to take departure when your step upon the stair arrested him, and he remained to assist his partner of the strangling cord in finishing you, if help were needed. What's that? the girl demanded. You mean the guy who almost killed me at the theater was here, and attacked Dr. Trowbridge? Was here is correct, mademoiselle. Where's he at now? Eh bien, who can say? I do not think the life he led was very good. His chances of salvation, I should say, were of the slimmest. You, you mean you killed him? Perfectly, mademoiselle. Both him and his two assistants. Gee, but you're wonderful. Before we realized what she was about, Helen Fisk had laid a hand upon each of his cheeks, drawn his face close to hers, and kissed him on the mouth. Pardieu, my lovely one, de Grandin chuckled. You do greatly tempt me to make murder my vocation, for a reward such as that. The thumping thunder of heavy boots upon the stairs cut short his speech. Dr. de Grandin, Dr. de Grandin, are you there, sir? demanded Sergeant Jeremiah Costello, as one of the policemen in his wake he dashed headlong up the stairs. Yes, morbleu, here am I, de Grandin answered tartly. "'And never was I less entranced at sight of your so ugly tête de roue, thou breaker-up of romance. "'What is it now?' "'Someone's been giving us the run-around,' the sergeant panted. "'Some son of a gun. "'Holy mither! Are they dead, sir?' "'He broke off as he saw the corpses on the floor. "'Like a herring,' de Grandin returned nonchalantly. "'You were saying?' "'Well, sir, it looks like someone stood us up.' When we seen that there now flash a light and heard the shots a-poppin', we made sure it was a gang war broke out again. So down to the corner we hot-footed it like three damn fools, and what do you think we found? The little Frenchman grinned, a thought maliciously. Pita, how do you call him? Firecrackers? he replied. Good Lord, how do you guess it, sir? Ha-ha, the trick is ancient, mon vieux. So old and threadbare that even you should be immune to it. However, it worked, and if I and Dr. Trowbridge had not been on hand to circumvent their wickedness, our poor young lady here would now have been a lovely corpse, and what is more, I should have missed an evening's pleasure. As it is. What's going on here, I'd like to know? An irate landlady, mountainous in righteous wrath and a canton flannel nightrobe, mounted the third-floor stairs. What's the meaning of this breaking in a decent woman's house at midnight and— Arrow, woman, hold your waist, Costello interrupted. Tis meself and Dr. de Gronda and Dr. Trowbridge yonder as kilt them three murderin' heathens that come into your place to stab you all whilst you was sleeping. And you've got the brass-bound nerve to ask us what we're doing here. You mean you killed somebody in my house? In my house, giving the place a bad name and ruining me business. The landlady demanded shrilly. I'll have the law on you for this, so help me. You'll be feeling me take me hand off on the side of your face if you don't shut up and quit interfering with the officer of the law in the performance of his duty, Costello told her sharply. Go on, go lay down somewheres and give your tongue a rest till we've finished with this business. We need no women to tell us how to do our work so we don't. 
the majesty of the law vindicated and the landlady effectually squelched, the sergeant turned once more to de Grandin. We seen a felly running down the street when we got to the corner, sir, he reported, and whilst we didn't have nothing agin him exactly, I thought it best to run him in on general principles. Fellies running loose at midnight when someone's made a monkey out of the police force will bear investigating I'm after thinking, sir. Exactement, the Frenchman nodded in agreement. What sort of person is your prisoner? Why, I should say he's kin to them, to these poor fellies that you killed, Costello answered. Dark like them he is, and kind of slim, and snooty as a sparry full of worms, talking about his rights, and how he'll have me broke, and being sarcastical as the very devil and all. Come on, I know his kind. What answer did you give to his abuse? The anticipatory gleam kindling in the little Frenchman's small blue eyes burst into sudden flame of merriment as Costello answered simply, Bedad, I sloughed him in the jaw, sir. Neither of us was much surprised to recognize Costello's prisoner as the slender, patrician Hindu we had seen in the theater in company with the men de Gronda had disposed of. With a badly swelling eye, dress clothes sadly disarranged, and a pair of handcuffs on his wrists, the fellow was put to it to maintain his air of lofty hauteur. But sustain it he did, glancing now and again at Costello with venomous hatred mingled with fear, and at de Grandin and me with unaffected scorn. "'Where are you taking me?' he asked in faultless Oxonian English. "'I refuse to answer questions or to go with you until I see my lawyer.' "'Easy on, laddie buck,' Costello cautioned. "'You'll go where we bid ye, and no questions asked, or I'll know the reason why. "'As for answering what we ask, I'm after thinking you'll talk a-plenty, and be glad to. "'Come on.' The light burned brightly in Coroner Martin's operating room, casting back reflections from the white-tiled walls, the terrazzo floor, and the gleaming porcelain of the embalming tables. Shrouded with a sheet, a bulky object occupied the center of the room, and toward it de Grandin walked like a demonstrator of anatomy about to address his class. Monsieur, he began, I have here exhibité, as they say in the courtroom. The statue of the great god Siva, taken from the lobby of the Isataco Theatre this afternoon. Trowbridge, mon vieux, you will recall the deceased flies we found upon the statue's pedestal. Bon, me, I have analysed their corpses and found them dead from formaldehyde poisoning. Very good. Dr. Trowbridge, again he turned to me, for all the world like counsel examining a witness. Can you recall an odour which we descried about that statue when we looked at it? Why, yes, I answered. It was formalin. I thought it odd, but we have no great concern with butts, he cut in quickly. Behold! With a sweep of his hand he tore the sheet from the statue and pointed dramatically to the glistening, dark-hued composition of which the thing was made. A month or so ago, two young women of the Isataco Ballet Russe disappeared he told us. They impersonated the god Siva in the spectacle of the yogi's death. No one has seen them since. No one knows where they are gone or where they are at present. Ah, is it so? No, tête bleue, it is not. They are here, my friends. Behold them. Snatching up a heavy wooden maul, he dealt the statue a sudden vicious blow, repeated it, rained stroke on stroke upon it, "'Look out! You'll break it, man!' I cried, shocked by his act of vandalism. "'Bon Dieu! But I intend to!' he panted, striking savagely again at the image's arm. A black, shining flake, four inches long by two in width, detached itself from the bent arm of Siva, fell to the hard-tiled floor with a tinkling metallic sound, and in the opening thus made there showed dull, livid, but glistening strangely in the strong light of the operating room, an arm of human flesh. The gruesome work went on. Flake after flake of shining black veneer was chipped away, and slowly, horribly, there came to view the naked body of a woman. Behold, my friends, de Grandin ordered, his voice a sibilant, knife-sharp whisper, Behold the core, the heart of Siva. 
As disclosure followed on disclosure, I felt a tightening in my throat, an odd, cold, prickling sensation in my scalp and at the back of my neck. A four-inch-long incision had been made in the girl's thigh, thus opening the great femoral artery. The hemorrhage must have been terrific, death following almost instantly. Thereafter the body was seated with folded legs in the attitude assumed by Siva in the ballet. Fine steel wires were wound about the limbs to hold them in position where necessary, and the body pumped full of dilute formaldehyde, thus preserving it and imparting a lasting rigidity. A second pair of arms, severed from their owner's body close to the trunk, had been similarly embalmed and sewn into the armpits of the seated girl, thus supplying the four pectoral limbs required for the sitting dance. And— the monstrous effigy finally molded out of human flesh, the whole was coated with a shell of quick-hardening varnish composed of silicate and gypsum, colored black with bitumen. Had not the varnish cracked a little and some of the formalin which was lodged between it and the flesh leaked out, we never should have known, de Grandin told us as he finished peeling off the coating from the statue's heart of human flesh. But so intent on lasting preservation was the miscreant that he oversaturated the tissues with the formalin. Alors, a little of it found its way through the little, so small crack in the plaster coating. The busybody little flies must come exploring, must stick their noses into it, must die. I see them lying dead. Have they not chosen a most queer place to die? I ask me. Other flies buzz at will about this theatre lobby. Other little flies walk with impunity upon the statue's head, its hands, its feet. But those who settle here upon its base, Pablo, they die all suddenly. And then I smell the odour of formaldehyde. Que diable? I ask me. Formaldehyde? What is it doing here? In the medical dissecting room, yes. In the preparation room of embalmers, again, yes. In the lobby of a theatre, in the statue of the great god Siva. Mille non, it is not right or proper. I look upon this statue. It are too perfect. It are not a work of art. It are rather an exact copy. No, a counterfeit of life. Business of the monkey has been made by someone, I damn think, I tell me. But yet I am not sure. And so I take those most unfortunate flies' small corpses and subject them to analysis. All are dead of formalin. Now I am nearly almost certain. And so I go to make examination of that statue once again. I take with me a little hammer and a chisel. While no one looks, I chip a bit of it away. Ah, what is it that I see? Flesh, Cordier, woman's flesh. Dead woman's flesh. Ah, 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 I apprehend it all now. I know where those two missing girls have gone. One is the body, one is the missing arms of Siva. I lay my trap tonight. Once more the dance of Siva is performed, but now the police are on guard. The dancers cannot be molested. Nevertheless, I know in my own head that an attempt will be made to do them harm, and so I go to watch. It are even as I think. This man here draws the red herring across the trail. He fools Costello and the others to run down to the corner while his powder squibs go pop, pop, pop. While they are there, his helpers find an entrance to Mademoiselle Helene's house, and would have slain her with a snake if Dr. Trowbridge and I had not been there. Ha! <laughs> but we are there, and I kill them all. I kill their snake, I kick their so carefully laid plans upside down, as the cow knocks over the filled milk bucket. Yes, certainly. Their plans are nicely made, but in them they have overlooked one thing. That thing is Jules de Grandin. You lie! the prisoner cried, almost in a scream. You didn't kill them, you're lying. You say so? de Grandin asked sarcastically. Monsieur Martin, will you have your young men bring what waits without to us? Coroner Martin stepped to the door and beckoned silently. Without a word, three of his assistants came single file through the door, each trundling a wheeled beer freighted with a sheeted form. As they passed him, de Grandin snatched the sheets away, disclosing the bodies of the Hindus he had killed in the rooming-house. "'And now, monsieur?' he asked in a gentle voice, bowing with mock courtesy to the prisoner. "'Do you still have doubts of my veracity?' 
The fellow stared at the three corpses in horror. His eyes seemed starting from his head as, in a choking voice, he croaked, Yes. Yes, I did it. I killed them, as you said, the wantons, defilers of the gods. I executed them for blasphemy, and I'd have killed that other pate-faced harlot, too, if you'd not been here, you— He glared insanely at de Grandin for a moment, then raised his manacled hands to his face. Son de Dieu, but I say you shall not— the little Frenchman shouted, leaping on the man as a cat might pounce upon a mouse, wrestling with him violently a moment, then springing back triumphantly, a little jet-black pill displayed between his thumb and fingertip. Could he have swallowed this, he would have died at once, he told us. As it is, we shall have the pleasure of seeing him decently and legally put to death for the vile, unconscionable murderer of women that he is. Meantime, his little round blue eyes swept us one by one, finally came to rest upon Costello. Monsieur Jean, I am most vilely and unsupportably dry, he complained. You are well acquainted with the best speakeasies which the city boasts. Will not you, of your charity, take me where I can relieve this torment of a thirst?' 